five minutes late, therefore I wouldn't wish to waste uh, time. Uh, the morning session will be chaired by Christopher Mohoz. And uh, Mr. Christopher Mohoz, you are welcome to take seat here. And uh, you'll be chairing a session of three people. Dr. Dominic Makwa from the Department of per uh, Performing Arts and Film. Dr. Eddie Gataira from the Department of History, Archaeology, and Heritage Studies. You're welcome to have a seat here. And lastly, Dr. Saran Nachijoba from the Department of uh, Linguistics. So, Chair, I hand over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Um, and it's my understanding that this is a blended event or hybrid event. Uh, so, we should be having an online community uh, or a virtual community. Um, please signal to our technicians there's someone uh, who will see you signal to our technicians if you can hear me well if you're online signal to us that you can hear us well otherwise i would like to welcome you all to this session which i'm chairing um and the session um is focusing on the work produced by Ari Career Scholars. Can I have confirmation from our technicians that uh, the online community can hear us well before we, produce, we proceed? Okay. Um, so we have three excellent um, talks this morning. Um, from Dr. Makwa Dominic, from who? Okay. Okay. Um. So you can hear me well, the online community. Um, so I was saying that we have three presentations this morning. And um, this is the work of uh, some of our area, ARI career scholars. And on my immediate left is uh, Dr. Dominic Makwa. Um, next to him is Edgar Taylor, Dr. Edgar Taylor, and then Dr. Sarah Nachijowa, um, the extreme, very extreme left. Now, each of our presenters, you'll have 10 minutes uh, to talk about your work. And in that work, be sure um, also to highlight, um, understand you received funding. So do highlight um, how uh, the funding helped you to further um, your research, do also tell us uh, the challenges, some of the challenges that you faced, um, and also remember to highlight um, some of the major contributions that your research uh, would have made to humanities and humanistic social science research in the global south. So our first presenter is, uh, like I said, is Dominic, Dr. Dominic Makwa, 
is uh, a lecturer in the Department um, of Performing Arts and Film here at Makere. He's a lecturer in music. And his talk today is on musicians as community archives, musicians as community archives, historicizing Bududa landslide disasters. Dominic, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I like, I would like to take the chance to thank the organizers of this uh, occasion for giving me the chance to come and present my research. I am called Dominic Makwa, as he said, from the Department of Performing Arts and Film which was formerly MDD, and I am a fellow under the building capacity in research and graduate training. My mentor uh, has been Professor Nanyonga Tamsuza. Uh, she is not here physically, but I believe she is one of the participants online. Yeah. So as he said, the topic of my presentation is musicians as a community archive, historicizing Bududa landslide disasters since mid-1960s. And I want to begin by saying that in this study, I have investigated how musicians participate in the collection, documentation, and the transmission of information about landslides in Bududa district, Eastern Uganda. As someone born and raised in Bududa, I have witnessed landslides for many years, and I have also seen different organizations, including the government of Uganda, coming up to mitigate the effects of the landslides. Such mitigation efforts can be seen in the supply of food, medical care, water, and clothing. There is also resettlement of survivors outside Bududa, including in places like Chiriandongo. Chiriandongo is in northwestern Uganda, and Bunambutie settlement in Bulambuli district, which is in the Bugisu sub-region. Much has been done, but there is very little success. For example, people who were resettled in other places have all come back, some even leaving behind the houses which were constructed for them. So the question is, is there no historical information to inform such interventions? That is the main question which has informed my study. As people who interact with their environment, my research investigated how musicians have composed songs about landslides in Bududa, and I was dealing with three objectives. The first one was to trace the historical background or the historical nature of landslides in Bududa. And the second objective was to, uh, uh, to identify the community musicians and the nature of music composed about landslides since mid-1960s. And lastly, I examined how community musicians have used songs to archive the landslide disaster in Bududa. I argue that by looking at musicians as archives for collecting, storing, and transmitting information, 
we can access a lot of historical information about landslides, which information can inform interventions by the government and those organizations that engage in mitigating the effects of this disaster. So I want, because of time, I want to go direct to my findings. There are many issues, but I'm just highlight, highlighting. The first one is that much as some of the musicians started their music careers around mid-1960s, the earliest song about this landslide is Ingrurwe Yanangumba. Ingrurwe means the, a landslide. So this song is the landslide of Nangumba, which was composed by someone called Wabutambi Wabunahu in 1970. The other finding I have is that musicians document the places people killed by the landslide and interventions by authorities. The other one is landslides that result into death of people are more pronounced by these musicians than those which merely destroy property. Then there is the question of resettlement, which perverts most of the songs composed and performed by these musicians. They talk a lot about uh, resettlement. And I want also to talk about the gender element in the songs. I, my research revealed that women groups are also at the forefront of singing about landslides in Bududa. They sing about their life experiences in, in settlements like Chiriandongo and Bunambutie. Their songs are a tool of encouragement to one another. Their songs also document livelihood programs, especially appreciating what, has, uh, what was given to them and suggesting what should be done. Then also, um, as I said, I'm just highlighting because of time factor, only 10 minutes. So um, I just wanted also to talk a little bit about the output from this research. Uh, the first one, I had a paper presentation during the 2021 CHOOSE Symposium. Then I also presented a paper during the University of Sussex webinar series on environmental disasters around the Indian Ocean. And this research group is covering scholars from India, Bangladesh, Somalia, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Mozambique. And I'm working on two papers. One of them is Women Landslide Songs uh, historicizing gendered disaster mitigation in Bududa district, Uganda, and it is going to be published by the Journal of Indian Ocean Region. Then I'm working on one which I have, uh, because I had a lot of gaps, and I had to go back to Bududa <coughs> to carry out more if, uh, research to fill in the gaps. Uh, this is the main paper, Musicians as, as Community Archives, uh, historicizing Bududa landslide disaster since mid-1960s, and the editor of the other journal is helping me to publish it with bulletin of the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, the challenges, thank you, I'm almost uh, there. Uh, one of the challenges I faced in executing this study was COVID-19 pandemic, which affected the implementation of the project because we had two lockdowns when I tried to, 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 to handle the effects of the first lockdown, the second one came up. So it affected me a lot. And I think the second one relates to my identity as a Mugisu from Bududa. The musicians there became 
too elusive. And in the effect, in, uh, at the end of it, it became very hard to access them. This made me to go to Bududa for more than 10 times in an effort to collect data. And it became somehow expensive. Uh, then also collecting data, a lot of data. I have come up with a lot of data which has made my analysis a bit complex. Uh, the other challenge is carrying on the project. As someone said here yesterday, amidst other university assignments like teaching and supervision of students became a challenge. So, um, furthering my research career, I want to mention that this project has helped me to expound on my PhD, uh, PhD research, which I did in 2013, between 2013 and 2015. I was looking at archival practices for music and dance among the Wagisu, and I was looking at musicians also as objects, this community archives, it is music and dance. So when I got this opportunity, it came in handy because it has helped me to further that area. Uh, I'm now working on two publications, as I have said, then also networking with other scholars. The truth of the matter is I didn't know most of you, but because of this project, I am able now to interact with you. I have interacted with other scholars who are interested in the area of disaster management from South Africa, from uh, Sussex University, as I said, and the USA. It has also inspired me to think of related research projects in the area of archiving music then engaged more with interdisciplinary approaches. As Dr. Eva Navulia said yesterday, uh, adopting, for example, for my case, uh, theories from ethnomusicology, gender studies, geography, environmental studies, history, and migration studies. Thank you so much. Um, God bless you. Well, um, I have to thank you so much, uh, Dominic, uh, for your excellent presentation, but also excellent timekeeping. <laughs> the timekeeping is spot on, and so um, you've done my, you've made my job um, very, very easy because you've already set the bar, and I'll not take any more time. Um, I'll invite our next speaker. Please, if you have questions, hold on to the questions, um, including our online community. Hold on to the questions. Um, keep them at the end of the three presentations, then we will have your questions. Uh, you can also use the chat section, type your questions there for the online community, uh, and then we'll have those questions uh, answered during the Q&A session. For now, Allow me to welcome uh, our next presenter, uh, Dr. Edgar Taylor from the History Department, who is talking about expulsions, knowledge, memory, and materiality in Africa. Edgar, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, uh, I will try to keep your your job easy. If I have to stop in the middle of a sentence, I will, will do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so first, thank you to the organizers of today, uh, today's event and to CHUS uh, and uh, um, also to my department as well, to my mentor in this uh, project, Dr. Godfrey Asimwe, uh, and to the Andrew Mellon Foundation for the uh, funding of uh, of this project. It's a, a mentorship-oriented uh, research grant that I've been working on. Um, and I don't know if I'm able to share my uh, PowerPoint. Um, sure. Is, is this person?
So uh, um, uh, I want to be, uh, I'll, in the interest of time, uh, just I, I want, I really have time just to do two things, to introduce kind of the conceptual framework of the project uh, and then to describe the work that I was able uh, to accomplish, uh, the research that, it, that this uh, uh, funding enabled, um, and then briefly to mention what the um, outputs of that research are. Um, so the, uh, um, the project uh, examines the concept of expulsion in African history and in the field of African studies. Um, and it does so through the lens of delving into the prehistory of what's known as the Uganda-Asian Uganda expulsion of 1972. Um, and I felt it was important, uh, this event is important not only as a historical moment, but also that it, it, studying it can tell us something about the way that the concept of expulsion has um, been a, a powerful, if hidden, analytical tool in so much scholarship on post-colonial Africa. Um, so, let me see. Uh, the, um, uh, so as we can see from this chart, the um, expulsion is sort of the ultimate generator of binary pairs because it conceptually divides time, geography, um, and memory of belonging. And crucially, it recognizes that agency comes from whoever is expelling, doing the expelling. So if you can see, I don't know if people in the room can see, but it's basically, it, it says there's before the expulsion, then there's after. There's here, the place that people are expelled from, and there's there, the place they're expelled to. There are insiders, and the expulsion then creates outsiders. It expels them. So this is a classic binary division. Um, the problem, of course, is that binaries suppress understanding of in-between spaces, interstitial spaces, and the porousness. People are moving back and forth between these categories, both in their minds and, and in the world. Um, so for me, um, right, so, uh, the archival research that I've done for this project points really to three problems. Uh, first, the invisible category, uh, or sorry, the, um, the categories of colonial governance made some expulsions visible, but others invisible. And I think in the conference uh, last, the CHUSE conference last year, I presented uh, on the way that the colonial archive made Ugandan Asians, for example, archivable subjects, that is visible on paper and it made their, the, the expulsion of 1972 a visible historical event, and it also enabled claim making, people to claim Asian property through the um, Departed Asian Custodian Board, but also for expelled people to make claims back on the state. By contrast, the 1970 expulsion of Kenyans from Uganda did not leave the same volume of doc, uh, documentary trail. Uh, and so there's, a, there's an erasure of one expulsion and the heightening of another uh, in, in the archive. Uh, the second problem here is that uh, boundaries between these categories, that is between before and after, here and there, insider and outsider, are porous. Um, one way to think about this porousness is through material forms, and that was one of the central focuses of the research that I, I did. Um, and so the way that urban landscapes continue to reflect racial segregation uh, even after um, uh, an expulsion event. Um, or the way that uh, the organization of certain spaces uh, continued to reflect the presence of Asian life uh, af even after the former inhabitants were expelled. Uh, so we see there's, there's uh, um, traces and, and residues of the past that, that continue uh, across time uh, and across space. And this, um, uh, leads to the third, um, oh sorry, uh, I should say there's also porousness between before and after. No expulsion exists in a historical vacuum. Uh, I think an important point here is that, for, for example, Idi Amin declared that his reasons for, for enacting the expulsion came to him in a dream, uh, as if it was out, it enabled him to elevate the decision outside of the vagaries of history, to, to say that this is something that transcends um, the longer histories of activism and, and, and racial um, uh, thought 
uh, and negotiation in Uganda. Uh, and of course, analytically, we know that we ha uh, have to study those continuities. And this leads to the third problem with uh, reproducing the idea of expulsions as coherent events. Uh, expulsions really do not break time as much as they, they may sound like it. Focusing on uh, the expulsion of 1972 in isolation obscures in some ways the structural weaknesses that led to the action, uh, reflecting uh, post-colonial government's inability to sever themselves from the structures of colonial divide and rule. So this really were the, was the premise of my um, um, uh, project. And so I, I set about uh, research, I first archival research, uh, uh, a certain amount as, as much as possible of uh, oral interviewing um, and reading historical newspapers, particularly in Luganda. So it, in the Uganda National Archives, uh, there are actually quite a number of collections that have been opened for study in the last few years that I had not had a chance to read through. The Chief Secretary's Office files. Um, I also was able to, there are some cabinet minutes uh, from the 1960s and 1970s on this issue that were very illuminating. And particularly collections from the districts, uh, from Jinja District and Mbale, uh, somewhat controversially there, those uh, collections are now in Kampala, so it actually was quite uh, easy to read them uh, read through those files, and it gives a more fine-grained account of, of how a big national event, such as an, an expulsion, plays out in local politics and negotiations, everyday negotiations over licensing um, uh, uh, of trade, of buildings, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, Secondly, I, I surprisingly f uh, found the, the, there are some archives in the Uganda Society, the, the minutes of those, the Uganda Society's meetings. And there's another dimension of this project, as I said, that looks at um, the way that the idea of expulsion has been central to area studies. The way that um, the foundation of area studies requires us analytically to expel places and people who are outside of uh, a geographic and racial unit from our, our site of analysis. And so I found those minutes useful because it's a society, a multiracial society that was central to the foundation of the field of Uganda studies. Um, and um, so I, I, I'm still working on what to do with, with that material, but it was quite, t quite illuminating. I also spent quite a lot of time here at the main library reading uh, with, the, with the help of someone helping me with my uh, translation and Luganda, with not just with the, the I think, more uh, famous and prominent Luganda language newspapers such as Muno, Uganda Empia, uh, and Uganda Yogera, but also with uh, uh, other papers, uh, Akika Mbuga, Ebifamu Uganda, Mbabi Asaze, uh, Matalisi, and Uganda Post. And these were extremely useful because they showed the character of debate over time in using Luganda concepts in the press uh, from the 1950s. Uh, most of these papers were defunct by the time of 1972, but, but in some cases into the 1960s. And so it gave me a kind of uh, illuminated the kind of uh, spe the specific language that people on the ground were using to make sense of, of, of this work. So briefly, the final uh, challenge of this project was I had intended to use a, an oral history archive of oral histories of, Uganda, of East African Asians in Syracuse University. By the time that travel was possible from COVID, uh, that it was a s the summer uh, there and the archive was not accessible, but I was able to use uh, resources from the University of Michigan, uh, including the Gerald Ford uh, archive, which had some uh, archival material on uh, Ugandan Asian resettlement. I have an article um, for, or a chapter forthcoming in a volume, Changing Theory, Concepts from the Global South, that uses the Uganda concept of a Dembe as a way to understand um, urban uh, struggles uh, over um, trade and, and decolonization that often uh, targeted Asians as well. And I have another conceptual article coming for forthcoming in history and anthropology. So I am out of time, uh, but I, I thank you very much. It's been a real uh, pleasure and honor to be able to work on this project. Thank you.
Thank you, Edgar. Um, our last presenter um, is Dr. Sarah Natijova. Sarah is a lecturer in the Department of Linguistics, English Language Studies, and Communication Skills. Um, Sarah today is talking about a topic towards documenting traditional indigenous foods in central Uganda, linguistic contribution to food security. Sarah, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, the chairperson. Thank you, colleagues, for coming. Thank you, Andrew Mellon. Thank you, dear our mentors, and anyone who has been supportive as we are doing this uh, these projects. Uh, Sarah Natijova is my name. I'm from Dilek, and I'm here to converse about food. It's real conversation. The project that I've been working on has a title towards documenting traditional indigenous foods in central Uganda, a linguistic contribution to food security. I'll briefly start with the motivation. In 2018, we visited the village for, in 2018, we visited the village for Christmas. And as we were moving in some garden, we came across some wild berries. Those of you who know Enyonza, they are some wild fruits. So Enyonza is a fruit that my husband had eaten when he was a child. And he was excited to share this experience with a family. And guess what? My son who was in P6 then refused to eat because the father could not remember the name of the berry, said, what are you giving me? And the father could not remember. Those are the disadvantages of memory. So we thought it was a joke and he insisted. Some of us who did care, we ate. And when we got home, I heard him, you know, laugh at the siblings who ate what they didn't know. So he said, if someone asked you what you are eating, what would you say? And of course they said, but we trust daddy and all that. As a linguist, I was struck. I said, okay, this is serious. We are talking about issues of food security. We are talking about issues of food being available and not being consumed because these foods are not known, you know? So a name is such an important thing that without it, someone can say no to food which is available. And I said, linguistics can have a contribution towards food security campaign. What did I do? I said, let me go and describe the foods that are used in, in central Uganda for a start get to know what is there, what are the names, how are these names pronounced, what is the English version, are there pictures that the future generation can refer to in case they found in Yonza and any other fruit that they are not familiar with. So the main objective was to describe and come up with a food inventory that could be used in reference to these foods. The second objective was to analyze the pragmatics of the linguistic expressions that are used in reference to food. Some foods are named plainly, I mean, with a semantic, you know, tags, and others are named with extra um, linguistic, uh, you know, emotional, pragmatic uh, senses. I was also interested in investigating the role of language in creating emotional awareness and how this awareness converts into someone is urged to preserve food or to lessen the dangers of uh, extinction. I went to the field, I interviewed the participants, we discussed, and the theme was food. What do you take to be food? What are the foods that you experience as a child? Which foods are available? Which foods are not available? And you know, the discussion went on and on. We visited homes, we visited gardens, we visited uh, markets and participants were there to avail us with this, with this information. And of course we served the food just to see how people relate and interact practically when they are eating food. What are the major findings? Uh, we discovered that food is highly personified, at least in Uganda. 
What does that mean? Food is given emotional, you know, personal attributes. You can anger food, you can appease food, and once food is happy, it will, you know, the production will be high. That's according to the beliefs and the norms of, of the Baganda. Once you offend food by doing things which are against food, for example, peeling it when you are seated anyhow, or going to the garden and you don't do certain things the way they are supposed to be done, you may not get yields as you expect them. So those attitudes and emotions are embedded in the language that people use when they are describing food, including the name tags. While some foods were luvutu, for example, matoke, other foods were mizinyambwa, that's sweet potato. So someone talks about buliti for timber, that is cassava. So these attitudes matter, and we think that these, you know, affect the way someone takes care of the garden or someone takes care of the food in question. Another finding was on issues of uh, contention uh, concerning conceptualization. We never got to understand the notion of food. And if I ask this uh, uh, audience what food is, you'd find different answers. So food is so many things and it seems like it's, it's idiosyncratically interpreted. What is food to me may not be food to others. And of course we had variations in the generations. The young people found other foods foods and the older generation or the middle generation did not. We also discovered that uh, there were issues with f how food is categorized. Some foods were difficult to categorize. You know, after collecting the names, we had to group them. Say, these are staple foods, you know, these are traditional foods, these are sauces, these are vegetables, but some foods could not be categorized. For example, sugar cane. So to some, sugar cane was uh, a fruit. I don't know what sugar cane is to you. To others, you know. So those debates were there. What is sugar cane? I leave it to you. We also saw aspects of food and gender where a woman especially was depicted as edible. So you had expressions like in susuti, you know, mbona, mbosela, uh, expressions like tungulu, you know, mata, in reference to women. Chijujulu, you know, in reference to women. And we never found similar tags for, for men. This is something that is quite interesting and I'm planning to write a paper. And of course, regions have food peculiarities. You, what you found in Ibulemezi was not in Masakabudu, and of course, we had issues moving forth and back. And uh, this is one of the challenges, and this relates also to the fact that foods are seasoned. So you could go to find in Yonza, and the season is off. So you come back and you wait for the season. So the farmer will tell you at this time, you come back. And of course, the fans are there to, to, to explain, okay? Um, what are some of the benefits that will further my research? For my master's and my PhD, I was basically focusing on the theoretical and the formal linguistics. And it was my first experience to anchor into the applied bit. And trust me, I may stay for some time because it's interesting. Um, I also uh, was able to get closer to other fields of linguistics. Uh, particularly lexicography and lexicology, because the inventory that I'm going to generate is dictionary-like and it follows the, you know, the, 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 the conventions of writing a dictionary, the softwares and everything. Um, this study, of course, is interdisciplinary. I mean, I was able to work with a team from food science. I have one person from botany. I have one from medicine. And of course, a, lingui a, a, a lexicographer who is helping me design this, this, this uh, food semi-dictionary, well, mini-dictionary. I now have a bigger corpus. After engaging with the conversations, I got a, a lot. It's transcribed, not yet annotated, but with bigger fundings. Definitely, I was able to get networks uh, concerning publications. Uh, there is one book chapter which is likely to come out next year. Uh, I'm also writing another uh, article from the presentation that I had last month in, in South Africa on critical food studies. It was a conference and I presented a paper which they promised uh, to, uh, to, 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 to publish. 
The food inventory, of course, is the gist of, of the project, and I'm planning to make it unique. You see, any Muganda or any researcher can go and find these foods and compile them, but I'm planning to make my publication unique, and I'm anchoring it from the linguistic perspective. So I plan to add the phonologies, the phonetic phonological components, the grammatical components, you know, in addition to the general information that describes food. Um, challenges, we talked about COVID, of course it affected me. Um, my major challenge was contentions concerning conceptualization. You discover that we wasted a lot of time talking about what is food, what is a chijulo, what is supper, what is breakfast, how do you define it? You know, so the component analysis of the things were not easy. I talked about seasoned foods that made me return back and forth to the field. Then accessing participants, I was targeting mainly farmers in the villages, and you could find someone is, in the, is busy in the garden and you have your recorder. He's willing to give you data, but provided he's continuing with the digging. You wait for her to finish. When she finishes, she has to go to fetch water. So at one point, I had to participate in that domestic activity. And uh, yeah, someone was, you know, uh, uh, trying to, what is Kwanika? trying to dry his maize, and he had about 20 sacks. So he would pull one after another, you know, in the compounds. So I ended up, you know, physically spreading it and helping at the hand. My hair was, was white. So I said, this is an experience. Limited time, my career schedules are busy, we are all aware, so having time for the project and balancing it. The major contribution of this study to what is happening in the world definitely is food security as a concern. I have a, a, a belief and I'm optimistic that this study will create an awareness. People will get to know that these foods are available and will be able to utilize them, like my son. When he sees Nyonza written and drawn, perhaps he will remember what was offered and he will be able to eat it. Thank you very much. That ends my conversation. Thank you, Sarah, um, for your uh, excellent presentation. And it being about food, we've not yet had breakfast, so we might start thinking about food so much. Um, good thing, and maybe. Anyhow, um, so we are through with the three uh, presentations. So for the next, se next session, um, or next bit of our session, we will entertain questions. Yes, we entertain questions uh, in this conversation. And uh, feel free to ask your question, directing it to any of our three presenters. Each of you, the presenters, uh, you have a microphone. I'll keep here. Um, Dr. Sechito is also helping us with another mic for the audience. Um, so the presenters, you remain in your seats. You take the questions from where you are. I will, um, I guess I will voice over or announce the questions from online. Um, if it is possible, the technicians will let me know if it is possible for someone online to ask the question and we can hear that person then that will also be great. So um, I see a hand up. Naomi Namanya has a question. Um, Namanya, would you like to ask your question? You have to unmute. And after your question, kindly um, remove the hand. You have to unmute. Can you unmute Nama Namanya? And then Namanya, go ahead and ask your question. I'm going for the online community first. Namanya, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I have unmuted this much. Good morning to the audience. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Taylor so much for his interest in Ugandan history. 
And uh, I would like him to explain to us what he would call segregation to the Asians who were expelled, but also nationalism according to Ugandan setting or according to Ugandan context. Thank you. Thank you, Namanya. Um, please take down your hand um, online, I mean. Um, so I will allow like three questions to each of our speakers and then uh, we allow them to answer them, then we can take another round. Um, I see several hands in the audience. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Yves Navulia from the Department of Literature. My question is directed to Dr. Yes, my question is, is, uh, is, is about uh, uh, the Bududa of uh, archival songs. I would like to know from you whether there's a, d a relationship between the information in the songs and the interventionist pro policies that the government is undertaking. And then next, okay, I would like also to know what is the place of these landslide songs in the community? Are they performed? as warning, are they performed in specific seasons, you know, as people expect this, the, the landslides to come, or are they just a way of keeping the memory alive? Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Please go ahead. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Ajibola Shikun. Um, my first question goes to Dr. Dominic. I would like to ask whether those songs represented any form of criticisms against the intervention of the authorities. And I also like to know whether those songs reflected the resilience of the people in the community. Again, um, how did you collect your data? And I move to Dr. Taylor. You mentioned two classifications of uh, exclusion visible and invisible. Um, I didn't get uh, that quite clearly. I would like some more clarifications. Then Dr. Sarah, um, you talked about interviewing farmers, and I find that very interesting. So I would like to know whether some of the foods that bears foreign name, there were actually original local names for them. For example, you mentioned sugar cane. Is there an African name for that? Were there other findings you made regarding names of some of the foods we have that have been overshadowed by foreign names? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I allow, um, before that, um, let me read out this question from Helena. And the question is for you, Dr. Dominic. Uh, so Helena says, I need to know the gender component of songs for Bududa landslide. It is, because this, is it because the singer was a woman, or reflecting the gender perspective of landslide, whoever sang it. And um, I also allow a question from uh, Slivia Antonia Nanyonga. Please go ahead and ask your question. She's online. Unmute her, please, and let her ask her question, and then we'll come back to the physical audience. Um, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Dominic, and uh, Dr. Dominic, I am wondering uh, to what extent does music as a sound uh, articulate the relationship between the gender slides and what, uh, and the music? Thank you. Thank you so much. Two more questions, and then uh, Pamela, and then uh, the gentleman there, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Innocent Masengo from the Department of African Languages. And uh, my question goes to Dr. Nachi Jova. So it's a comment, but will lead into a question. So I concur with you when you talk about uh, the fear to don't know. Uh, two weeks ago, I visited a Francophone country in Africa. And on the menu for lunch, there was um, meat that I could not recognize. So I asked what it was. And because it's francophone, um, they tried to find the name of the animal. And uh, they could not find the name. But they were telling it more in French and I didn't know French. 
until someone said Pumba. Pumba from Lion King. And uh, that's the only uh, identification they could use. And I remembered Pumba that that was a watho. I think you know a watho. So the wild pig. And uh, it is then that I could go ahead and try, try it. I was uh, interested in trying it. But if I had not found out what it was, I was not going to eat it. Now, my question is, what accounts for that? I think that needs to be explained. Uh, you, do, you did say you have links with food science, botany, but have you also thought of the links with psychology? Uh, because I tend to think that there is a psychology of food uh, that uh, you know leads us to either eat or not eat. Thank you. We we'll have um, Pamela. Um, looks like we are running out of time, so I will allow the last question from Dr. Robert Suruku, and then so Pamela, then Dr. Suruku. Oh, Pamela, you are no longer asking a question. No, 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 no. I need you to ask your question, and then Dr. Suruku's question. So we will have one round of questions, and not a second round of, of questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, panelists. Uh, Dominic. I am curious why uh, your study stretches back to the mid-1960s, especially when you say that uh, the first song recorded was in 1970, so I thought I wanted some justification there. And uh, I was also curious, you, so you mentioned the women um, in terms of the people who, had, uh, who were relocated and resettled elsewhere. But then back in Bududa, or even back in the 70s, who are the people that actually compose these songs? Are these the survivors of the landslides? Are they just people that have had this and they are concerned? And I think the best way of talking about this is actually to compose songs. And I'm just asking that well knowing that uh, landslides do not really cut across. I think there are specific regions within Bududa where they are most uh, dominant. And then, uh, Edgar, I, I was curious to hear a little bit more about the expulsion of the Kenyans uh, in 1970 and why that is more silent, um, you know, compared to the Asian expulsion. Is it because of Amin? Is it because Asians are not Africans? Is it because of the numbers? Why was the other one uh, silenced? And Sarah, um, again, thank you very much for the paper. I was just curious, so um, people have feelings or emotions uh, about food, but then my question is that does food also have emotions? Does food have agency? Why would food get annoyed? Uh, if I peel matoke while standing, what happens to the plantation? Especially if I've just bought matoke in the market anyway, won't it get cooked or what? Thank you. Um, Dr. Robert, yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, the moderator. I would like to thank the presenters uh, for um, interesting papers presented. Uh, mine is only one question to Sarah. Um, the conversation around food is uh, very interesting. When we are looking at uh, food sovereignty, um, uh, there are many dimensions, but um, I would like to pick one, the cultural one. Um, uh, for example, among the, um, actually, when one is um, enjoying Malakwang, it is not only appeasement to the senses, but also you appease the ancestors. And uh, you also enjoy this in the sense that you are thinking about the present generation, you are thinking about at the past generation, and you're also thinking about the generations to come. So food is looked into uh, the way of sustainability. Does this resonate with your own study? Thank you so much, uh, Robert, um, and thank you all who asked questions. Well, um, let me also slot in mine. Um, so to Dominic, um, and this is in addition to what Dr. Kanakwa asked about the identity. Who are those people who are singing songs? 
But I was also looking at them. Uh, are these men? Are these women? Are they young? Are they old? Um, and there's a difference from uh, between those who sing and those who actually compose the songs. So I'm actually more interested in those who were composing, writing those songs, than those who were singing the songs. Um, to know who are they. Um, now to Dr. Taylor. Um, I hope I understood the conceptual framework uh, in the before and after. It's the one that I, I'm interested in now. And um, I'm reminded of this um, after a comment attributed to a former minister in Obote II's government regarding an inquiry from uh, one from a Banyarwanda community about their impending expulsion. And so he said, how about us who came earlier uh, in comparison with those who recently arrived. And so this man said, those who came earlier should actually be the first ones to leave. And uh, then, of course, those who came late, you can also leave later. But at the end of it all, all of you have to leave. So I was wondering, um, we have the Asian expansion. We have clamped them together as Asians. But some came much, much earlier. They had a long relationship with Uganda. And some were recent arrivals, some were British citizens, others were not. So I was wondering how that plays within your conceptual framework. And lastly, uh, to Sarah, uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. I was wondering um, what kind of history, um, sorry, from the, link, the names of the food, um, are you able to tell uh, the history of that food, specifically, for instance, the origin of the food, if it was indigenous to that area, if it was a food borrowed from another community, um, would your work or would your findings allow you to kind of, uh, to, for lack of a better word, speculate on that? Now, we are kind of out of time, so I will allow you no more than five minutes to answer all the questions you've been posed to. So each one of you, five minutes. So um, let's start with the lady, please. And then we'll go in that order. Ladies first. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll start from the last two questions from Christopher. Uh, something that has to do with the history, whether the name that is given to, to the food can um, lead you to its etymology. Some foods yes some food names yes some food names no you know the, the 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 science of naming we have those names which are semantically empty and you don't get anything out of the name it's just arbitrary and we have those which are descriptive the name that is given to them comes from where they come from um and this is some information that i also wish to provide in the food inventory for example the, the history of Matoke or Muogo. Th th there is that belief that, uh, you know, Muogo is a short form for Muogo Leko, like break it off. So when this food had been introduced, you know, it was this long tuber and someone did not know what to do about it, so they had to break it off. Where did it come from, the geography? Perhaps it's not clear, but we know it's not indigenous and we can have that simple trait and from there we, we, we can move on. But maybe another point. I wasn't historicizing, so I didn't focus so much on, on, on that. Uh, a question from Suruku, cultural sustainability. I take that to be some form of a comment because uh, food is highly you know, pa personalized. While you enjoy Marakwang and you have those feelings as you, your son or your young, someone who is 10 years or younger may not you know, have the similar you know, perceptions because Marakwang may not be, be that interesting, maybe a sausage or something, or something else. But of course, the cultural components are there, and they are carried by, you know, people who construct food and people who use it, who interact, who interact with food. Uh, to Pamela, why food gets offended? Uh, my general response is that uh, a belief is a belief. When people believe, they believe. When we move into academia, we begin to critique and say, what are these you know, underlying interpretations? What, are, what is embedded in this indigenous knowledge? How can we unearth it? We can go that level. But to the people who believe, 
for example, my mother would not find you peel food when you are seated anyhow. You don't even have to explain. She would slap you there and then, and she would not apologize. With or without an explanation, she believes you cannot eat offended food because once you do, I mean, you'll not, never get blessings. So beliefs are beliefs, but we demystify them. And of course, there are those beliefs which have interpretations, which of course even agriculture supports, like the belief in Nawandagala. I don't know whether we are familiar with Nawandagala. That small leaf that comes last before the bunch, you know, sprouts. That one is supposed to be hidden. No one is supposed to see it. And you hide it under the mulch. So in practice, that encouraged, you know, mulching. But then they are not talking about mulching. They are saying, Nawandagala is secretive. It's private. Never. Once someone sees it, he will go with your, your plantation. And no one wants to lose a plantation. Those are beliefs. Um, innocent, yes. It's, it's a good suggestion. We need to venture into psychology. Most of these things are, are, are psycholo psychological. Uh, what accounts for that fear? <laughs> Simply the fear of the unknown. You wouldn't want to venture into something that may be deadly or dangerous. And so you don't want to risk, <laughs> to risk your life. Uh, the first question, I'm sorry I didn't capture your name. Um, you talked about how I conducted interviews. Uh, I first of all met families individual families. Uh, of course, women are usually there by default. So I would meet them, we, we, we discuss food, uh, share their food experiences, what they take to be extinct or you know, available, what foods they enjoy, and how food is conceptualized. And then after moving to about 15 to 20 homes, we organized a, a group discussion. So all these people met, and the voices that we, got, we had gathered from individuals we were put together and we came up with solid, concrete, you know, arguments. And maybe to add on, those beliefs, all concepts, all points which were acknowledged by at least five people were considered viable. The rest we kind of, you know, uh, disregarded. Food names, the discussions were in Luganda. So no one was talking about sugar canes there. Everyone was talking about Chikajo, Nyonza, Fene, Kabalagala, ETC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Edgar? Uh, thank you for the, these uh, uh, questions, and uh, um, so in just a few minutes, I'll try to answer as many as I can. Uh, uh, I think the, you know, the, there were essentially three questions, one about segregation, history of segregation, and the role of nationalism. Uh, second question about, two questions about uh, uh, visible and invisible subjects, and a third about sort of differentiation among uh, uh, expelled populations. So I'd say in, in a general comment at the beginning, one of, one of the overarching motivations for this project is an observation that studies of expulsion can, uh, <coughs> not always, but they can, tend to erase the responsibility of colonialism uh, and particular forms of colonial governance. Um, so, for example, and I think this happens in ways that are not necessarily obvious. So in just the idea that an expulsion is a single event, isolated in time, erases the ways, the other ways that, uh, for example, that uh, Asians were expelled that had nothing to do with Idi Amin or uh, the post-colonial Ugandan government. The Commonwealth Immigrants Act of 1962 essentially expelled Asians from belonging in uh, Britain in the, or in, uh, a claim to which many had uh, through, both through imperial citizenship and practically as British citizens, but there was a racial segregation uh, implemented in Britain in 1962. Uh, that is never referred to as an expulsion. Uh, there's a large literature on the welcoming of Ugandan Asian refugees in Britain, but of course uh, people were produced as refugees by the racist actions of the British government, not recognizing them as citizens. Um, another w uh, example, this is the, the substance of the uh, uh, paper on the 1959 boycott that I've, I've submitted, uh, looks at the ways that expulsion was not necessarily a state process. It was embedded in 
ordinary people's understandings of urban morality and what was, what was a proper way to earn a living, uh, the, which are debates that have continued uh, for the duration of, uh, uh, of capitalism. Uh, and, and so I, uh, my effort here is to look at the multiple, that segregation and that, it w that expulsion is not simply an out uh, product of a of nationalism uh, from the 1960s onwards. That independence was not a did not inevitably mean that there would be a single expulsion event. That expulsion is something that was constantly being reinforced by multiple uh, from multiple sources, both uh, locally from uh, the metro colonial uh, government. Uh, and of course by the state. So that's, that's one of the key analytic points um, that I, I wanted to make. One this more re minute. Sorry, yeah, this relates to the visible and invisible subjects. It meant that uh, it's just simply that it, it not of it's not of course visible, invisible, or visible on the ground. It's in the archive. It's in, it's in the historical record. And one of the consequences why that's important is that some expulsions generate a proliferation of legal claims such as, and that's the 1972 expulsion. There are, uh, the fascinating thing about the district archives is that you can find a single property that has dozens of claims being made on that same property. And every one of them, you can argue, is a legitimate claim. Uh, people who, it's their ancestral land, it's somebody owns the, uh, the property, they rented it, it was a soldier who was allocated it, a businessman. Uh, this is not the case for the Kenyan expulsion because uh, Kenyans who were expelled did not, were not able to make, to insert themselves into uh, the uh, documentary state and make claims on the state. When they were expelled, they were not able to demand uh, or to successfully demand compensation in the ways that, that Asians were. Uh, that, that's, I think, a key, a key point there. Finally, differentiation, of course, I think it's just goes into a much more complicated uh, story than I can, can tell here, but just to say that uh, Godfrey Asimwe has published a really fascinating paper on that generational uh, difference among Ugandan Asians, as has Anith Kar Hundle, and uh, my work conceptually deals with that, but I'm much more interested in the sort of prehistory of, of uh, the expulsion event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dominic, in two minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy that you really understood what I was talking about because it shows me through the question is here that you were interested. Um, that is very good. I will ask about four questions because of time. Then I don't know how I'm going to connect to some of the people whose questions I may not answer. We are going into a break soon after, so you can actually interact. Okay. So, okay. yeah. S but some of them were online. I don't know the, how to get them. It's recorded. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will begin with Dr. Pamela's question about why 1960s, and even the chair here asked the same question. I'm uh, also reflecting seriously about it because much as most of the musicians I met are people whose career in music began in the 1960s, I really also find out that the songs are beginning from 1970s. So I may have to rethink and concentrate on 1970s onwards, especially now that I'm revising the paper and making some changes. That one, I have noted it very seriously. Um, then the, the second question you asked was about who were the musicians who composed these songs. These are both men, women, and the younger people. But the younger people are between around 18 and 30 years. I didn't see the younger ladies there. I'm talking about people who are playing the local instruments like tube fiddles, like flutes, who were singing during those peer parties. I didn't get young ladies. 
uh, they were coming in form of women groups. I got some of those young ladies of around 20 years who are uh, like young mothers. Um, the other question is about when are the, for, uh, the songs performed? It is normally after the occurrence of the landslide. And these songs form part of the mourning process. After a landslide happening somewhere and many people have been killed, so musicians compose these songs and begin performing them. Uh, some of them are performed during resettlement meetings, when people are talking about meetings, uh, during meetings talking about resettlement, then also during registration of people, they, they narrate some of those experiences after. And when leaders from the government visit music, the songs become a main tool of communication. It's like they cannot say some of those things directly to those powers. Then they package the message through songs and even begin suggesting, sometimes saying, you see, it is better to relocate us here within Bududa. So music here is presented as a tool which will be seen for like entertainment, but it is actually communicating a very serious message. Then Dr. Nabulia, you also talked about the relationship between what the songs say and what authorities do. I don't know whether I understood you well. Um, in most cases, those people are also very calculative in what they do. They will encourage people that you go when the government is proposing to resettle you somewhere so that you don't die. But when some of those people run away from those resettlement uh, places, they also sing some songs to condemn the government, blaming them. Why did you take them there? For us, we normally don't go, like, migrate going southwards. We need to, be re we, we, we need to migrate we, um, am, among, among ourselves. So there's that kind of... Uh, sometimes condemning, but actually in most cases, because when they are trying to encourage, they are also trying to encourage in a subtle, uh, in a metaphorical kind of way. Um. Then the last one is uh, the gender component in the songs. Someone asked that, is it because the songs are performed by women or it is because they are articulating gender issues. In most cases, this gender question is about articulating gender issues in society. They are talking about how women are left behind in some of these discussions. Then some of the songs are encouraging fellow women about being resilient. Um, and here you see that the songs are also, landslides are also offering an opportunity for the women to question the power or the status quo. Because uh, in most cases, like other patriarchal societies, the Bagisu expect men to provide for their families, to be the people in charge. But when landslides happen, Men, some men have actually run away from their families, leaving women alone. So in these songs, the women are encouraging one another, saying we can still look for ways of how to sort out this problem. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dominic. Thank you, all of you, um, our presenters. Uh, please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. And Thank you, our uh, online audience and our uh, physical audience. Um, I now come to the end of my session. Um, I'll hand you over to Dr. Sechito for further programming. Thank you so much. 
Hey, Sarah, wait a bit. Uh, thank you very much, uh, our presenters and uh, our chair. Thank you so much for sharing the session so well, although you offended the food. In Africa, when food is on the table, you don't proceed to give people many minutes to answer questions. So I'm penalizing you by instructing or requesting, let me request Sarah to lead you to the serving point, and you are going to be number first. Thank you very much. We are using 15 minutes for break, and we come back so that we can try to catch up with.
And finally, we shall have Dr. Innocent Masengo um, presenting, examining the emergence of Swahili speech communities in Uganda. Each of you will use 10 minutes for your presentation, and then we shall have questions at the end of the presentations. Uh, I now welcome uh, Dr. Alin Asimwe to give her presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Waiga. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Alena Simwe. Um, I would like to talk about my, my research. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, recognize my, my mentor, uh, Sister Professor Dipio. Thank you for coming. Um, the study I've been carrying on is on the uh, social, cultural, and linguistic aspects of uh, Ruchiga uh, personal names. Uh, what motivated this study is the, the observations that have uh, have made over time that um, cultures are changing. There is a shift. So, um, and in one of the ways I see is that. Uh, the traditional Ruchiga names, uh, they are no longer being used. And this is uh, especially because of the coming of, of uh, foreign religions um, that uh, happened around the 1930s. So we see a major shift from traditional names to what I might call contemporary names that are uh, used in, in mostly to refer to God. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to give a, a brief background, objectives of the study, uh, key findings, and how the study has furthered my research challenges, what remains to be done, and then if time allows, then I'll briefly give conclusions. Uh, as a way of giving a, a background, uh, personal names present interesting facets and then they deserve to be studied and they, they deserve to be documented. So I, I felt that the, the, there is a gap in this area because there is a shift as I have already mentioned and they are a major component of our social cultural lives. These names communicate values, customs, religious uh, beliefs, etc. And there is always a reason why a name is, is given. Uh, and um, my observation is there was not much done in this area, so I felt there is a, a big gap. Uh, the objectives of this study were, so first of all, the main goal was to document these names because they are, they are, they are fast disappearing. They are no longer uh, being used. Um, then the specific objectives were three. Uh, first of all, I wanted to analyze the grammatical structures of these names. These names from a uh, 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 formal linguist background, so I, I observed that there is an internal structure of these names that need to be studied. And then secondly, I wanted to explore the social cultural gender assumptions and then to examine how religion has impacted uh, on these names. Uh, I, I used ethnographic uh, research methods to collect the data. Um, I'm focusing on these names that were prevalent before the East African Revival Movement. So these are what I'm calling the traditional names. I collected data from Kavali and Kanung districts and uh, as the sources of data, the registers, tax, marriage, baptism, some names from electoral commission registers, and then I carried out interviews with uh, 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 persons aged 65 and above. So, so far I have a collection of about 7,000 uh, traditional names that I have documented. Um, regarding the, uh, the findings to do with uh, objective number one, uh, these names present, uh, they are lexical entities, but uh, they have an, and an underlying elaborate grammatical structure. So they are derived from the syntax, morphology, phonology of the language. And uh, 
there are different uh, derivational processes that are involved uh, to derive this, these names. So the study establishes, uh, if my colleagues are from linguistics, they, they can easily understand the language here, truncation, affixation, etc. Um, the social cultural context influences the semantics. For instance, if a name is Tindiche Itila, uh, I will not kill myself for it. Th so there is a cultural component in, in it that determines or that influences the structure of such names. Uh, in regard to objective number two, uh, this is to do with the gender. Uh, the, the objective was to explore the social cultural gender assumptions in these names. Indeed, uh, these names uh, communicate gender and there are some linguistic aspects, linguistic, linguistic elements that are used to, uh, to show that this name is a female name or a male name. For instance, the, the, there is a, a prefix ka. It's usually used uh, in the derivation of female names, and in most cases, you find that it, it, it marks the beauty or, uh, in, uh, of, the, of the female, and they are a marker of endearment or affection. Uh, another one I, I, I came across is the prefix ru, and this um, constructs men as being superior, powerful, uh, etc. Uh, what came up also from this study is the way boys are prized more than, than girls, also uh, in regard to gender. So if a woman failed to produce a boy, uh, they would expect, first of all, this woman to give birth to a boy as firstborn. So if the firstborn is a girl, and then secondborn is a girl, so there would be a name that they would give this girl. So first, uh, for example, in the church, right, it's a girl again, so I won't kill myself because I've not said a boy. Born Havana, after all, they're all children. So he, the man is trying to console himself, but inside he feels he really wanted a boy. And for these examples, the name giver is the father. And again, to Guinea, we still have hopes. We, they are patiently waiting for a boy. So this shows uh, how uh, the society attaches a lot of meaning to, to, the, to the male gender. So finally, if a boy comes, so now it's the, it's the turn of the woman to name this, this child to show how uh, he was mocked, he was scorned because of not. And you know, society, uh, f it's like it's the fault of the woman not to have a, a baby boy. So all the scorn and uh, abuses, they are directed to the woman. So uh, also on Karwemer, I put up with it all the mockery. So fine, a boy comes, but I'm not happy. So I have to communicate to them through this name that I went through a lot but finally I have a boy. So, uh, so society has it that if um, a woman fails to produce a boy, uh, in Rinyanko Uchiga we say we are children, so there won't be continuity, so that's why the woman was always on tension if there is no boy uh, that, that comes. So regarding objective number three, uh, there, is, there was um, a major shift. Uh, around 1935, because of Christianity, Christianity came, and uh, Africans had to denounce their ways, including names, because they were deemed demonic. So they have, after converting, you have to drop everything. So, and that's why I was saying, well, these names are no longer in use, so we need to document them. So, and um, uh, the consultants I worked with. They also believe that these names were pessimistic, they were negative in nature, and, and, and you know, they would tell me is in a religion is a scenario. So if a, na a name has a bad connotation, you are likely to feel the consequences because of such a name. So they had to change and start n naming their children um, in reference to God and generally feeling positive about life. So these are the names that you will find uh, currently. So uh, just to show examples. So how has this study uh, furthered my, my research? Um, before, before carrying out this study, I had never used ethnographic research method, so I can now say I can ably use this research um, uh, method. 
Also, I've had an opportunity to be mentored, and I hope to, to use the skills I have acquired to mentor, especially uh, those that are behind me. I've also had an opportunity to present at an international conference and a colloquium. I also have an MA student working within this field of onomastics, and she's looking at, at Uganda. So the challenges, first of all, one was the failure to access some uh, resourceful persons because of, of um, COVID-19. Uh, remember, I'm working with all the persons, so they felt they were not safe uh, with me. So some, they would say uh, no. And another challenge is to get the meaning of names. Uh, the actual meaning can only be understood within the right context. So if I've not had the opportunity to talk to the person, the name giver, I would at times just guess what this person had in mind or the circumstances that prevailed at the time. So what remains to be done? Um, as I carried out this study, especially when I'm, I'm conversing with the women, they would, they would mention their nicknames, which would, they were given these names after getting married. And I found them interesting because the kind of one gets a name uh, based on their attributes or what is expected of them when they get married. So I have uh, collected uh, these names. I want to also look at them. Remember, my, my aim was to collect names that were given at birth, but these names are given to women after getting married. So I will continue to update the data. And um, later along, my target is to come up with a dictionary of uh, traditional names among the Bachiga. So in conclusion, um, there is a close link between language and culture. So uh, to do with language and, uh, and the structure of names, I have written a paper, uh, reviews were done, I did the corrections, I expect the paper to come out uh, early next year. Currently I'm working on the gender perspective and I hope to submit the paper to Nomina Africana later in January. And later on, of course, I will continue to analyze these names with the purpose of coming up with a dictionary of proper names uh, in Richiga. Um, I should stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Simwe Allen. And next, let's listen to Dr. Medad Saint Anda. Thank you, colleagues. So when I first proposed to, uh, for funding, I had this title, Language Ideologies and Power, and I was focusing on particular explorer in the lang linguistic landscape of Kampala. But as I moved on, my focus changed a little bit, but I will show you how. So initially, I had thought that I would study the language ideologies and power relations between Ugandan indigenous languages and English with the focus on the linguistic landscape of Kampala. And by linguistic landscape, I mean language in public display in all forms. But, uh, uh, and I had hoped that by taking a corpus of pictures of the linguistic landscape 
and uh, interviewing the sign owners, this would lead me to understanding the reasons for language choices on the shop signs. But as I reviewed literature, uh, and having received a research collaboration, as I will show you, I, I had to reshape my focus. Uh, like I have just mentioned, there are, there are two reasons for which I had to change my focus. For example, uh, borrowing the words of Chinua Achebe, who stated that f in order for us to understand uh, the, the past and where we have come from, we need to what we need to do is to look back and try and find out where we went wrong, where the rain began to beat us. So uh, that really uh, struck me. And I must also mention that uh, the collaboration that I received, as I will speak to it shortly, uh, suggested an, a, a historical uh, overview of, of, of uh, language policy documents uh, because of a gap that we identified. And I also saw in literature that in order for us to understand issues of language, the school is an important site uh, 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 for investigating issues pertaining to language ideology and power, So, which is why I had to, to refocus and go deeper into history in order to understand the linguistic uh, landscape of, of Kampala. So then uh, I had to reshape the uh, the sequencing of the articles that come out of this project. First, the first article, and which we have already completed, we should be sending it out in a week or, or, or less, looks at the language ideologies in the promotion of English in Uganda's education system. And of course, it's an historical overview. And in this particular paper, we compare Edu uh, historical educational reports from the 1920s and 1960s because in literature we have found that the, there is a lack of classroom studies on how uh, languages were implemented, uh, particularly uh, between the 1920s up to around 1980s and especially that those are years even uh, after independence that we had um, political instabilities. So in this article, we provide a close reading of historical policy documents about language and education policy in Uganda. And through that, we trace the ideological reasons for the many difficulties that mother tongue education faces in Uganda. And in the second article, because we have identified a gap, particularly between the 1960s and the 80s, where there are no um, academic studies, particularly classroom or school-based studies, which we, we thought that one way of capturing these experiences is to go uh, into narratives. So we are interviewing uh, people who went to school between the 1930s up to the early 2000s uh, in order to get the, their, the lived experiences of the teaching and learning of the mother tongues and English in Uganda. And we want to see what implications these experiences have on the present day uh, language in education policy. And like I have just mentioned, we do that by interviewing and uh, we are doing that in two locations, the central region, and we are comparing that with northern Uganda, particularly about 20 interviews. And our main question in that regard is, uh, how did local languages maintain their vibrancy despite an official English language policy in Ugandan schools? And in the third, article, which should have come first. I am looking at the language ideologies and the linguistic landscape of Kampala, and I am particularly uh, taking a case of shop signs. And the focus here 
uh, on the, sorry, uh, something came up here. Okay. Uh, in this particular article, uh, where I look at these different shop signs, I am interested in looking at which languages appear on shop signs. In which order do these languages appear? Because that also has meaning. Which languages are used to represent primary text and secondary text? By primary text, for example, I mean the name of that shop sign. Is the shop sign, for example, in English only or in Luganda only or a combination of the two? For example, uh, uh, if you see uh, a shop sign like Insimbi Designer, if the, the one at the corner there, and then others do not have any shop name. They simply list uh, names of what they sell. For example, there is one interesting one, uh, one at the top there. The person says they, they are selling Obutunda, and then Omunanasi, Amazi, and then you also see boiled water. So I wonder whether you know the difference between Amazi and boiled water. And you also have soda and plastic soda. So we look at, I, I, I look at all these, in which languages are used to present primary and secondary text. But also I go further to look at the respondents' views on the choice of languages that appear on the shop signs. The other thing that I am doing in this project is a math, master's thesis. I have a student by, in the, by the names of Richard Serwanga who is looking at the linguistic landscape of Kampala, particularly looking at shop signs. How have my findings, for, uh, this funding furthered my research? Uh, I have about three points here. I have had an opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Ruth Wensiki, who uh, works at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And so far with her, we have published two articles, uh, as I have indicated them there. And I have had opportunity to present at conferences about five times, some of which were international. And in fact, the, ma the major findings of this study have already uh, been shared. I am also supervising a master's thesis. And I have also had an opportunity to be mentored by a senior colleague, uh, uh, the Associate Professor Susan Chiguli. Challenges, most of these have been shared by my colleagues, but I will end by uh, give sharing the major contribution of this study. So in sum, the main contribution of this project is that it gives an in-depth historical overview of how the current language in education policy was shaped by ideologies and how these, these policies, policies were implemented in practice especially that since there is such a scarcity of materials of how languages were used in classrooms, so this study uh, looking at the historical policy documents and also the uh, narratives of people who went to school between this time where we have a scarcity of literature, so we are able to contribute to the debates of, of, of uh, yeah, language policies, particularly in multilingual contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sentanda, for that presentation. And next we have Dr. Katshe Merere. I mean, 
Uh, good morning once again. Uh, <coughs> my name is Frida Katshemirerwe. The moderator could not pronounce, so I have to pronounce it once again. And even the chair was announcing, said I'm Katshemirerwe. In Alan's upcoming dictionaries, a uh, dictionary on names, Kat Shemerewe and Kat Shemerewe will have two entries. It's not one entry because those are two different names. And uh, <coughs> I used to miss, my checks used to bounce because of that long name. Uh, I interest Allen to come and I give him, I give her data. She can write a whole paper about my name. So <coughs> I'm in a conversation with you on vocabulary, um, examining vocabulary strategies of English language learners in selected secondary schools in Uganda. I have to state that I didn't go to secondary schools because uh, schools were closed. So later I had to change a little bit uh, in the title. Uh, uh, first is the motivation. In 2016, I gave my students a task. It was a simple task to write a simple letter, complaint letter, but politely. And some of them, this is what they could write. I just picked a sample. And when I diagnosed what this disease was, I actually found that this was a disease of vocabulary. So that's where I started from. From there, I had to go to literature. Yes, uh, I found it clearly that, of course, learning a second language or any other language is not easy, and vocabulary is fundamental. Therefore, any learner must have strategies to enable him or her to learn a language. And I found a gap that in Uganda here, we have been teaching English uh, since, um, even uh, since colonialism, but uh, there are not so many studies in this area. So that's where I started from. <coughs> Therefore, I, uh, the aim, I wanted to examine, first discover the strategies, and then examine the use of these strategies among second language learners of English. And since schools were closed, so I had to have a selection of learners, all level learners, and find them in their homes. Um, what did I find? Of course, I've been presenting some of these findings of the study. So here I have major, major findings. I find that, yes, indeed, learners at all levels, senior one up to senior four, learners of English, they use strategies, and these strategies can be categorized as social, memory, cognitive, and metacognitive, but they are low users of strategies. Maybe I didn't say that um, this study was largely quantitative, so I got the quantities, and then I had to work with frequencies. So on the scale of use, we have low users, medium users, and high users. So this particular group that I interacted with, they were low users. So they would use strategies, but infrequently, once in a while, was dominant. Now, the commonly used strategies were social, while the least used strategies were more metacognitive. Now, the social, co uh, the social strategies are maybe consultation. You consult the teacher when you meet a new word. You consult your colleagues. You know, you consult people at home if they know. And then the metacognitive is about organizing your learning. And I found that the metacognitive were really least used. And social, yes, they enhance your learning, but not deeply. You get to know this meaning of a word, yes, but you don't enter deeper. 
if you don't use other strategies. So um, the, 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 the next finding was that memory and metacognitive are the effective strategies if one is to learn vocabulary effectively. Yet, the study participants I had were using, uh, were not, we, they, they were not using these strategies uh, frequently. So now I could understand where this problem of vocabulary was coming from. Then the, the last major finding is that the strategies we have found these learners were using were really resulting into shallow learning and not deep learning. The psychologists will tell us that yes, you can go to class and learn, but you learn just on face, surface. You learn shallowly. You don't learn deeply. So I, f I now relate to what the chairperson of, the un of UNAIB, Uganda Examinations Board, is always announcing. That tasks that would require uh, students to explain, to think and explain on their own were really the difficult tasks to answer. And that's where their performance was always poor. So I now come to find out uh, where the problem is. That indeed, these learners are using strategies to learn vocabulary, but they are using those strategies which do not lead to deep learning. When you learn deeply, you get a transformation, and you live what you learn. So if these students were learning vocabulary and understanding it deeply, so they would use it in all situations, in real life situations, they wouldn't get any hurdles. <coughs> so um, in terms of output, yes, I've been able to write two papers, submitted one, and one is yet to be submitted into the Journal of English Language Teaching and Applied Linguistics. Um, <coughs> I am engaging the different stakeholders on this in order to write a policy brief. Why? Uh, of course, I don't have the time to go into the details of this study, but what do I find in the curriculum as far as, um, as, far as uh, vocabulary learning is concerned? You find that the curriculum gives a target. For example, at the end of, say, senior one, we expect you to have learned 500 words. But how is the teacher assessing this learner that the, at the end of this stage, this learner has acquired this number of words? There is nothing. In the materials, and yet with the language, you know it is the input that matters. So in the materials, the language materials, you look for what is stated in the curriculum in order to, uh, to locate it in the materials, and it's not there. So I think that at that point, we need to engage the stakeholders, and also interacted with the teachers. Some of these strategies that I had, actually I had a list of 56 strategies got from literature and theories, but a, a few teachers I interacted with, um, you find that even they don't know these strategies. So in that case, I think that if I engage the different stakeholders, then we can have some kind of policy brief, and then something is done about English language teaching, specifically vocabulary, which is a, f which is a foundation, which is a building block of all that uh, we are uh, uh, writing or speaking in English. Challenges, of course, for me it was worse because schools were locked and really I was, at one time I was stuck, so I can't even talk more about this. Um, how has this scholarship enhanced my research? I have two scholarly outputs. I'm proud of them. I didn't have them before, so that increased on my stock. So I've been nominated on this Kabute project. I think I hope the school and the uh, department thought, since I am in this area, since I am researching in this area, probably I'll have something to contribute to this project, which is focusing on teacher education. 
And then I have learned, I've come to learn a lot on the humanistic approach to scholarship. I am a multi, kind of multidisciplinary person. I don't, uh, I'm so much, I love numbers bit, uh, more than uh, talking, so, but I've got to learn a lot in this uh, humanistic approach. The, construct, the constructivism, the, you know, the interpretism. I, I, I only loved the hypothesis and then you just click and get the results. Uh, <coughs> but I've got, I have learned a lot. So I've learned a, a set of skills. You know, when you present, you don't remain the same. In this scholarship I've presented four times, giving four major presentations including an invited keynote. I was happy about, about it, and I'm happy about this fellowship. And writing skills, I, had, um, I have to mention that I have learned a lot from my mentor. Dr. William Wagaba is not here, but I hope he's online. He has such an excellent writing skill, which I am trying to copy on a daily basis, but I don't know whether coping is the best word to use, but I will learn from him. I promise to, to follow him wherever he is to get this skill from him. And then mentoring skills, yes, for me, I, uh, I never bothered anyway. Yes, you do supervise students, but I never bothered about this mentorship um, arrangement. But when I was given a mentor, and I see what we go through together. I've also started mentoring, and I have two mentees so far. And I think I'm doing well. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Katshemerere. I hope this time I have it right. <laughs> um, so finally, we, are, we want to listen to Dr. Innocent Masengo on the emergence of Swahili speech communities. Good morning, everybody. And um, if my voice is not very good, I've not been well, so, uh, but um, I'll do my best. So my study, uh, which is sponsored by um, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, is on the examining the emergence of uh, Kiswahili speech communities in Uganda. Throughout the presentation, I'll be using Swahili, not, not Kiswahili. And uh, basically, uh, my study uh, is um, addressing the question of who are the speakers of Swahili in Uganda. So Swahili being uh, the second official language in Uganda, but with no <laughs> known speakers, in fact, listed as a foreign language. So if you have uh, an official language, but with no known speakers, then who speaks the language? 
And so I set out to find out whether we actually have communities in Uganda that um, use Kiswahili as a language of, 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 of choice uh, in their everyday life. So this was what I set out uh, to, to find out. Um, so we start by what exactly is a speech community. And uh, uh, it's a group of people who share a set of linguistic norms and expectations uh, regarding the use of language. And um, usually geographically bounded, large and small urban communities, according to some scholars, others say they can be subgroups. And, um, and I say mostly these speech communities emerge as a result of uh, immigrant communities. And so in this study, I considered a speech community to be a group of people using the same language uh, in their daily activities. And um, it does not necessarily have to be a tribe. So it, it does not necessarily relate to ethnicity. Um, so the specific problem here, which I already talked about, uh, is that uh, Swahili is listed among the foreign languages in Uganda. And uh, however, uh, it also indicates that there are 300,000 first language speakers of Uganda, so in Uganda. And so this is listed in different uh, documents, official uh, documents, but nowhere uh, are the 300,000 uh, first language speakers of Swahili described anywhere, which leaves a big question. And so it means that the Ugandan Swahili language speakers are yet to be formally documented. Uh, this study did not set out to document uh, the, the, the language, the, 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 la the Swahili spoken in Uganda. So it set out to explore where are they so that it can lead into a, a larger scale study that can document uh, uh, the language itself and the people who speak it. So uh, I had three objectives. So to determine the social linguistic characteristics of Swahili speakers in Uganda. Who are they? Where are they? And then to examine the linguistic features of the Swahili spoken in Uganda. What kind of Swahili do they speak? Is it um, the standard Swahili as spoken, um, uh, for example, in most of the rest of East Africa? And then to account for the emergence of this new soil variety in Uganda. So if it is a new variety, where, um, how did it come up? Um, and as we'll see, I've so far um, completed research on the first two and the third is ongoing. So the study is premised uh, in, uh, in the linguistic acculturation hypothesis and also critical multiculturalism. And so this, um, uh, it tends to somehow relate to language contact, but um, it talks about when uh, people from different communities come together and then they start to use uh, one of the languages, which can be uh, a dominant language or otherwise. And uh, as time goes on, uh, this language uh, becomes a language of choice. Um, there are different known uh, s speakers of Swahili, uh, like the army or armed forces. So in Uganda, everybody knows that um, the armed forces, they use the Swahili. Uh, in the Nubian community, in my previous presentation uh, from the same study, I zeroed down on the contribution, on the significance of the Nubian community in uh, the emergence of Swahili in Uganda. Then the international community, especially um, uh, Kenyans and Tanzanians in Uganda, everybody knows that they, they speak Swahili. Border communities like Busia, Maraba, and um, Tukura, you know, those are known to, to speak Swahili. Also, we have Swahili scholars and teachers of Kiswahili, they are known to be speakers of Swahili. They are returnees, you know, people who have lived in Kenya, in Tanzania, and other speaking communities, so they are known to be speakers of Swahili. 
and uh, refugee communities. We, we have translated so many documents targeting you know, um, uh, refugees in Nakivare, in uh, Chanika, and then I individuals, usually they, they say the business community, but I wouldn't want to say, uh, when you say business community, it does not mean that everybody in business speaks wide. So usually these are a few individuals that have come to, to, to be exposed to Swahili and they speak it and use it in their business. Now, the major focus of this study is on the others. The others, now. There are others who speak Swahili, but who are these? And to me, this is the most important group. Um, who are these others that speak Swahili? Yes. So it means they are unknown. And for me, this is where the actual speech communities uh, lie. And so um, uh, I used an exploratory approach, and it was, uh, the study was majorly qualitative, of course, with a few descriptive statistics and there which don't actually uh, make it quantitative. Uh, I had four field sites. Uh, that is Bombo, Bombo Town, outside the Barats. Okay? And then uh, we had Kinyara in Masindi, and in, in Masindi, in Kinyara, is zeroed down to an area called Kavango. Then I had, uh, in Chiriandong, I had Bweare, and then uh, I had Kakoba in Mbarara. Um, there's a star on this because initially uh, this site was kept for later. I had a control group at first, which was Busia. So I was comparing a border community with other internal communities to see whether there was a difference. And then after that, I had to add Kakoba. Um, and then, so I had key informant interviews and also uh, focus group discussions and also observations. These observations, so it was uh, attending um, uh, functions, um, like community meetings, weddings, funerals, where in these communities you find that Kiswahili is used. Now, um, the first um, stage was actually to find out is Kiswahili used in these communities. And so I set out to, to find in each site who are the speakers, and what is their ethnicity. Because remember, uh, the, uh, the theory um, indicates that uh, the emergence of a speech community, people from different uh, you know, ethnic groups, they find themselves in the same place, and then they come up with one language of choice that they use. So I had to find out the speakers of Swahili, uh, are they from one ethnic group or they are from many? And so I found out uh, that um, uh, they were actually from different ethnic, uh, ethnic groups. Uh, 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 and so, and then um, I had to find out how they acquired the Kiswahili because if you find that they acquired the Kiswahili by living in other, they are returnees uh, or they come from border communities, then it still should not make a lot of sense now to go ahead and uh, uh, you know, to determine that uh, this uh, is a, is a Kiswahili uh, community that started uh, I have learned Kiswahili from within the interior and are using it as a language of choice. So I had to find out how they acquired the Kiswahili as well. And uh, um, I found out as the summary uh, will, will indicate that about 67.5% uh, uh, of the speakers learned Kiswahili from within their communities. It is only about 25% uh, that uh, learned Kiswahili through either immersion, through either immersion by living in Kiswahili in Kenya or in Tanzania. So it means that a, a bulk of them, about almost 68%, actually learned Kiswahili from within Uganda and are using it uh, within, within Uganda. Now, um, Now, the linguistic uh, features of the Kiswahili, um, uh, take one minute to wrap up. The linguistic features of the Kiswahili now spoken in Uganda. So after determining that actually these are people using Kiswahili within Uganda, I had to find out what kind of Kiswahili they use. So this is how the standard Kiswahili has these uh, features. And so I was measuring this against what uh, the speakers within Uganda uh, were speaking. And um, uh, this is just an uh, illustration of the different linguistic uh, categories of the Uganda, of, of standard Kiswahili. Now, this is a comparison of the features of the Kiswahili spoken in Uganda vis-a-vis -vis standard Swahili, and then you will realize that the Swahili
And then what are these uh, uh, learners reading? And then um, uh, I will another question to um, the last a, one. A, a question to um, Medad. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, this, sign, this post that we saw, and then uh, the language they are written in, and the code and so on. I wonder whether you have also considered the, the aspect of advertising, other than language. So, this bit of language, is it also related to the a very subtle way of advertising? Uh, Thank you very much. We shall give opportunity to just one person. Just one. Yes, thank Make you. My name is Tony, and my question goes to, to Innocent. So Innocent, you talked of Swahili language and the speakers, but the fact that now we are dealing with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, where that we should leave, no, we should not leave anybody behind. So do you, did you also look at the, the, the sign language in Swahili interpreters, or you all just only look at the speakers? Then to Dr. Allen, you talked of the languages, and you talked of about making a dictionary. Do you believe that really we, the Banyankuri Bachega can turn back and start naming their children those names? And then secondly, that the fact that the Christian uh, started in, in you Uganda, have, you and yet the Baganda... You have asked all your questions, please. Yes. Respect um, the rules. You've asked all your questions. Oh. You've asked so far too. Yeah, thank you very much. We shall end it there. If you have any more questions, please, in the interest of time, write them on a paper and pass them to the presenters. It's the issue of time that is really restricting us. Thank you very much. The presenters, you can respond to those few questions. I'm sorry? How much time? You use as little time as possible. Be precise. Um, let's start from Innocent. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, the first question about language attitudes. <laughs> you know, language attitudes, you know, that's uh, like a can of worms. Um, so I'd been born in Tanzania, raised in Kenya, you know, yeah, that's, uh, um, you know, uh, we've had that for <laughs> a very long time. Um, now, we know that in Uganda, uh, Swahili has always been referred to as the language of thugs, the language of torture and violence, right? Because of history. Uh, however, I'm yet to find a person who claims that they don't want to learn Swahili. I'm yet to meet that kind of person. Neither have I met a person who speaks Swahili and is not proud of it. And so there is a, um, it, it, there is a irony, you know, where uh, Swahili is condemned at the global level uh, and then embraced at the individual level. And so that's where language attitude you know, becomes a bit you know, interesting. That aside, uh, did Swahili die in Uganda? Why? is Kiswahili said to have died in Uganda. It is because everybody thinks that a speaker of Kiswahili might, must speak standard Kiswahili, right? Yes. Like we can uh, assume that a speaker of English should speak English as spoken at, Cam at Cambridge, which is not the case. It's not the case. And that is actually the motivation behind this study to determine the variety of Kiswahili that is unique to Uganda, and the way other varieties of Kiswahili have been determined anywhere, uh, elsewhere. I think uh, Dimendar and Nasistain uh, studied uh, Bunia Swahili, and uh, I think Govat studied Bukavu Swahili, and these are distinct varieties. There is Sheng in Kenya, and all these are accepted as Kiswahili varieties. In Tanzania itself, um, the, the, the typical Tanzanian does not speak standard Swahili. Yes. Tanga, when you go to Tanga, uh, you know, uh, I think the late Magufuli, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the variety of Kiswahili he was speaking uh, was totally different, you know, from, from standard Swahili, and it used to 
used as one of the examples. So um, Swahili did not necessarily die in, in Uganda. It was the misconception that for as long as you do not speak standard Swahili, then you're speaking wrong Swahili, so you're killing, you're killing Swahili. Thank the way you. would think that the Nigerians are killing English Thank with the you, Nigerian Dr. pigeon. Masengo. The last question mm -hmm. was about um, the SDGs and Swahili interpreters. So that would be the next stage, because first you have to determine that you actually have uh, native, uh, should I call them native speakers of Swahili in Uganda that are actually not catered for. Yes. And then after that, it is when then you can influence policy on how this should be taken, put into a consideration in government programs. Yes. So that would be the next stage. Uh, but right now we are still now studying their existence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Santanda. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor, for that question. Uh, language in the public space takes various forms and advertising billboards is one of that aspect. I must say that I am not look, looking at advertising billboards, but I am looking at, for this particular study, only shop signs. And I am only looking at signs at the premises of shops. So advertising an ad as an aspect might have many other issues coming in uh, which I am not considering for now. Because if we look at advertising, for example, you'll find that some signs, some forms of advertising are permanent and others are temporary. For example, those of, on moving vehicles, they're, they're not permanent in a way that it is stationed in one place. And uh, also there are many uh, intricate issues related to moving vehicles, advertising, and the sign is on it. So I am not yet going into that area. I, I wonder whether my explanation satisfies you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asimo. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugumia, for the question. Um, when I, I asked about whether there are names for boys when a uh, woman has produced only boys, uh, I do not seem to get clear answers. They, they don't seem to have them because you see society uh, placed a lot of importance, uh, sorry, of importance on, on boys. So they never cared whether you produced boys or not. So actually the family would be happy for the continuity of the clan. Uh, Professor Sister DePio, we still have hope. Yes, these names, co they are there in the current times. They are there, but in most cases now, uh, they are referring to God. We have hopes in God. Maybe there's something going on and they hope God will do something about the situation. But before the coming of Christianity, it was to do with uh, producing boys. We have hopes a boy will, will eventually come. Uh, what uh, has anything changed with the coming of Christianity? Yes. So the way the Bachiga, Banyankura Bachiga look at life changed. They have a um, positive uh, attitude towards life, which was not the case before. They looked at life negatively. That's why these names were mostly negative. So even when I have only girls, it, well, my religion says they are all, they, the, all children come from God. So I will not explicitly communicate it through uh, naming. Thank you very much. Uh, my question came from Professor Rutabajoka. Thank you very much. Uh, the document I, sp I displayed has so many issues, not only vocabulary. You are very right. There are so many issues in that document, but we look for the most significant. What was, the, what was on top of that document? And you mentioned that, um, uh, of course, you've identified issues of composition. Yes, composition was, is one of the issues in that document. But you see, composition is about thinking and then having the ability to translate your thoughts into words. 
And then these words are either written or spoken. And they are spoken in a certain medium, which is language. Now, your inability to master the words of this language at times hampers your ability to translate your thoughts into communicable words. Thank you. Thank you very much, our presenters, for the responses that you've been able to give. But I'll just pose this one important question. Since all um, the presenters here are from the languages, one important question that I keep asking myself from the presentations and, and what, what people write, what do we mean when we say, um, for example, Swahili speakers? Do we mean native speakers? Do we need first language speakers? Do we, need, do we mean people who speak the language by choice? What exactly do we mean when we say Luganda speakers or Swahili speakers or English speakers? Uh, you can just go and think about it because I've seen it many times and I keep wondering what do people mean by this uh, expression. Um, anyway, we've, we've, we've come to the end of this session Thank you very much, our audience, both physical and online. And thank you, presenters. And thank you, organizers, for letting me chair this session. And thank you, Andrew Mellon, for this opportunity of growing these scholars in the humanities. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, Dr. Fronze Svaiga. And uh, thank you very much, our dear presenters. Um, <coughs> we are a little behind the time. We have moved from Ruchiga to in uh, Luganda, from Luganda to English, from English to Swahili, not Kiswahili. And uh, at this moment, we are going to have a conversation between Ruchiga and Rururi Runyara. So I'd request Alan Asimwe to remain behind to have a conversation with the Dr. Sauda Namial to tell us why she ventured into that area. Perhaps was Luganda already sorted? Uh, so uh, Dr. Asimwe, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, the organizers. Thank you, uh, the audience. Uh, we are going to have a conversation on Rururi uh, Runyala. Okay. Uh, we are told we have 30 minutes to have this conversation. Um, uh, the main author of this book, uh, we are talking about is Dr. Namia Rosauda. Please, I'll call you Dr. Namia for, for respect. No, you are my dean. <laughs> okay, so we we straight away go into the conversation. Please um, tell us why did you choose. Rururi Runyala, as the, the moderator has wondered, is uh, Luganda sorted? Why Rururi Runyala? And yes, we, we are aware that Rururi Runyala is endangered, and there are other actually severely endangered languages in, Yan, in Uganda, but why did you choose? Um, you to, to, to pose the questions again, I was posing, uh, uh, sorting out the microphone. Oh, oh sorry. Um, I'm asking why Rururi Runyala, yet there are many other endangered languages in Uganda. Actually, there are some which are severely endangered. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alain, for that beautiful question. But perhaps before I answer that, what is Rururi Runyala? I've had this question being posed. Do we have a language called Rururi Runyala? And I would like to start from there so that I put the language into perspective and then why uh, I, I chose to, to work on that language. And already Zaid has asked 
was Uganda already sorted. Uh, Lululi Runyala, from a purely linguistic point of view, one may argue that is a same language. Data suggests, that the data we are working with, that Lululi Runyala share a mutual intelligibility of close to 98.9. We collected uh, about 12,000 lexical entry, uh, entries into the dictionaries, and the difference in terms of words which only belong to Lululi and those which belong to Runyala were about between 10 to 12. So at the lexical level, one may argue that it's the same language. And when in, you go into the science of the language, the grammatical aspects, right from the phonological, morphological, and syntactical level, most of the rules are the same. There are very, very, very few variations. Yes, one may argue that based on the literature which we have, for example, uh, the survey which was conducted by Lafayette in 1971 and 72, it categorized Luluri and Dunyara as two independent languages. But Lord Forget worked with only 100 words. And here we are working with over 12,000 words. And we can now reliably say that uh, Luluri and Dunyara are ideally one language. However, from the social and political point of view, one may argue that there are two languages. Why? The constitution of Uganda um, text Dabaluli and Banyala as two ethnic groups, each speaking an independent language. And uh, may I inter uh, interrupt a bit? So yes. Are you in support of clustering languages? Because, for instance, Runyango Ruchiga, uh, Runyon Rutolo, uh, yet there are some variations that uh, they are in these languages. So, should we cluster them and study them as, as they are currently? Yes and no. <laughs> Again, that's a, a very interesting answer. Uh, yes, because um, given the degree of mutual intelligibility, it will not make a lot of sense, for example, to study Lunyala independently and then Lululi uh, Lulu independently. However, we are also aware of both the micro and micro, uh, macro and micro variations, which are very important to us as linguists. So mm -hmm. in as much as we can look at them as clusters, we should also be mindful of those variations that might label these two varieties either similar or different. So yes, I'm in support. And to another degree, I'm not in support of the same. And this takes us to why I chose uh, to work on Ruri Runyara and not any other language um, which is um, severely endangered. For example, so is more endangered uh, compared to Ruri Runyara. Um, there are one, one or two reasons. One, I received a small grant uh, which allowed me um, to collect folk tales among the Runyara. And this gave me an insight into what was happening in the language. One, Lulu Runyara by then existed as an oral language. And what do I mean by oral language? There was no literature, just spoken, no single document in the language. And two, there was a continuous shift from people speaking the language to other area or dominant languages. So we are seeing many Waluri Banyara speaking Luganda, Lunyankole speaking Lunyoro, and Irsoga. So because of the dominance of these bigger languages, this language was becoming more and more endangered. And of course, you might be aware of the historical um, culture and political factors that affected the language and this created a very negative attitude. So the younger generation were distancing themselves from the language. So I thought maybe it's time we intervened and documented this language. 
And of course, being a Bantu specialist, I mean, it came in handy. If you asked me to document so, or say Lutagwenda, I would choose the, the <laughs> Lutagwenda because it's a Bantu language, and it, it becomes easier to document a language in which you are specializing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, you answered my next question. I wanted to know whether there are um, written materials that existed before uh, your project. You have answered that already, that there was nothing. Uh, that there was, was uh, some uh, pamphlets written by elderly people. Like, for example, there was one uh, written by uh, uh, Bintu Visible in, I think, 1996 where he was talking about the different clans um, in, 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 in the language. But apart from that, we didn't have what we call, one may call a uh, standard uh, literature. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what does it take to write a dictionary of an endangered language? Thank you very much, Alain. Um, that's a very beautiful question, but quite loaded. Uh, let me start by making uh, a, a general observation. Quite often, people think that writing a dictionary is a mere compilation of words. I remember at one time, um, I was at Cambridge with um, a professor from political science whose name I will not mention, and said, you people, what do you do? Anyone can compile a dictionary, just compiling a list of words. And I chose not to go, you know, to, to go into you know, that kind of debate and said, well, uh, I think there is a lot much more than compiling. But I never you know, um, chose to pursue the debate uh, uh, basing on the, the angle he was taking. And that takes me to the question uh, you have posed. What does it mean to write a diction of an endangered language? This is a language which is not written. So there is no literature at all. And if a language is not written, it means it doesn't have an orthography or writing convention. It means there is no grammar which you are going to refer to but there you are, you have to write a dictionary. What it means to write a dictionary? One, you need a corpus. I'm happy that uh, Dale uh, talked about describing Uganda's indigenous languages uh, using corpus. So the first stage was collecting what my, I might call a spoken corpus. So we had to record about 700 hours of spoken narratives from different uh, groups of people. Of course, um, putting into consideration different variables, age, locality, level of uh, education, um, it is seen. And it was those uh, 700 hours plus that we transcribed. Transcription means uh, getting the audios and videos into the written form. And, but remember, we never had an orthography. We are trying to transcribe, you know, to put this spoken corpus into written form, but there is no standard writing convention. That was a very big challenge. And you cannot come up with an orthography without first understanding the grammar. Because it's the grammar which informs the orthography. So what we did was to somehow use the orthographies of Bantu languages. And in this case, we used the orthograph of Luganda to try and capture Luluri Runyara. And I would say after like three or four months, we had some kind of a data corpus. Data in the sense that people were writing differently. Whatever they had, they would write it in, you know, in the way they wanted. But that gave us an opportunity now to have some kind of written corpus to start working with. And once we had it, we translated it, and after translating it, then now the group started 
what I was asking Deo yesterday, uh, we started doing uh, part of speech, tagging and doing morpheme by morpheme uh, annotation. And now this started giving us the sense of grammar, what is happening. And our understanding of the grammar helped us to come up with um, an orthography. So we kept improving the orthography as our knowledge of the grammar improved. And after that, I wouldn't even say at this time that we have fully understood the grammar, but we continue as we interact with the data, as we interact with the speakers, we continue understanding and making adjustments here and there. But nevertheless, there we are, we had the grammar, and that's why you are calling it a grammatical sketch, because the full grammar, a comprehensive grammar is on the way. We are still writing it. And using the same corpus, we had to study the grammar, wrote the orthography, or improved on the orthography, and at the same time, use the same corpus partly to get the lexical entries. It is uh, very annoying, and I think Deo knows because he's working with corpus, that we had over a corpus of over 200,000 words. And to an indigenous language, that is a lot. And actually, we have the largest corpus of an indigenous language worldwide. Wow, thank you. But out of that corpus we are all proud of as researchers, we only managed to get 2,300 lexical entries to process in two dictionary entries. And this was very disappointing. Uh, it's unfortunate that it, uh, my PhD students who were on, on the project are not here. And I remember telling them we are in the field that I need a break. So I took off one week to think what next. We have all these huge corpus, but in terms of lexical entries, we only have about 2,000. And yet our target was 10,000. So I said, let me go and take some rest and think of the way forward. So later on, uh, of course, as you might be aware, there are disadvantages and advantages of working with corpus. Uh, so we had to think of other methods and merging both corpus, uh, elicitation, uh, interviews, uh, translations, using questionnaires. There is a very huge questionnaire that has been developed by SEAL. Um, we managed to get over three, uh, 13,000 entries. Okay. Um, I think uh, those who are into corpus linguistics are taking note of the, the shortcomings of relying only on corpus. For me, my primary uh, method is elicitation because maybe I'm not yet familiar with how to use corpus, but uh, I get disappointed or maybe, well, I haven't used any software to query uh, this or the corpora, but I always go for illustration before I can think of, of corpus. It, it depends on what you are working on. In, in, in our situation, there is no way a modern lexicographer can write a dictionary without corpus. Whether spoken, some people call it oral, or written corpus. That is the starting point, because you need to get the grammar. Uh, you know, addiction is not simply a compilation of words. Mm. If it was that, then we would go on the street and ask, the way I do for my real study. Mm. Say, how do you call this? I use the elicitation method. But if you're going to get a clear sense of the grammar, then you need that corpus, uh, although it has disadvantages, like I've mentioned. Okay, thank you. Well, if Dr. Riches was here, he would share with us how he managed to compile the Nyankuru Chiga monolingual dictionary without a corpus because a corpus has just been developed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, talking of grammar, um, I don't see you mention a tone anywhere in the book, yet we know that tone is part of grammar of most Bantu languages. So I 
I, can, I use tone to differentiate the meanings of certain words, for instance, in my language. So how come there's no tone, no tone marks in the dictionary and no, nothing like anything, there's nothing uh, written on tone in the grammar sketch. So how did it come about? I think there is, there is a brief, there's a very brief o o o on the tone structure of Ulu Yunyara, although it's not elaborate enough. Why we didn't go into the, uh, the, the tone, or we did not use tone marks for, for our lexical entries, is because we don't have a clear understanding of the tone system of these two language varieties. One of the major difference between Lululi and Runyara is at the pronunciation level. And that's where you can tell, oh, this is Lululi and not Runyara. And I think what, partly what informs that, it is the tone system. So we never wanted to commit ourselves and go ahead and try and start doing the tone marking before a comprehensive study of the entire tone system. What is happening right now, one of uh, my PhD students who happen also to be a colleague is particularly working on the tone system of Lunyala, not even of both varieties, because again, that will be too much for him. Fortunately, we've had an extension, Volkswagen. This project was sponsored by Volkswagen, and based on our performance in the first three years, uh, they gave us more money to do two more years. If it had not been COVID, we would now have a, a very uh, clear understanding of the tone system. Nevertheless, what we have done is to come up with what we are calling a talking Lululi Runyara dictionary. And what I mean by a talking Lululi Runyara dictionary, we have audio recorded all the lexical entries in the dictionary, and we are appending audio to each lexical entry. So if I have a verb, kuyaba, kuyaba means to go in Nururi, then there is an audio adjacent to it. And this is going to be online. And we are further, uh, we are going also to do both phonemic and, uh, phonemic and phonetic transcription. And with those more detailed linguistic features, we are targeting the linguistic community. Of course, those will not be so useful to, to, to the communities. And for the communities, we are going to have a printed edition. We actually just received the money yesterday. So we are going to have 1,000 copies printed for free and given to the speakers. OK, thank you. And you have partly answered my question I wanted to pose last before we can uh, let the audience join the conversation. So I wanted to know, why did you choose an online publisher? Um, and uh, well, because I want to imagine that your primary target is the community, the Baruri Banyara. So now you have answered it now because yeah, copies are maybe coming. Maybe the question would be why this particular publisher? Okay. If you look at this publisher, they specialize in the publication of grammars and dictionaries of Bantu languages. And this gave us, actually at first we thought I could publish it with the uh, Makere University oh, Press, okay. but on the second thought, I uh, said maybe we will not get that feedback from the Bantu, the wider Bantu community. So we went in for a publisher who is specializing in that area, and indeed we received a lot of feedback mm -hmm. uh, from this, and it helped us to, to improve on our publication. But indeed, we had the native speakers or the communities at the back of our mind, and we are going to make uh, prints for them. Thank you for the great work. Uh, we can now uh, we can join the conversation if you have any question, beginning with Dr. Kawadia. And next is uh, Dr. Masengo. Uh, make them short so that we can uh, finish on time. We have five minutes. Dr. Kawadia. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Namiaro, for that wonderful presentation and uh, uh, conversation, and for the um, dictionary. It's a commendable job. I know what uh, it takes to write a dictionary, especially for an, uh, an, an endangered language. Um, my uh, comment or question is one. I well, I'm wondering whether you actually did a proper needs analysis for uh, the community, uh, Baruri Banyara people, before writing the dictionary. Because for a language that doesn't have an orthography, a grammar, why did you go into writing a dictionary first? How is that going to be? I, I would assume or, or, or think that actually the, the, the other one would, would be, could, should be the first thing, would have been the first thing to do. I mean, developing an orthography for the language so that everything written will be written in that orthography. How is, how is even the community going to read this dictionary? I mean, that's my question. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dale. Indeed, um, like I mentioned, there is no way you can meaningfully come up with an orthography without a good understanding of the grammar of the language. And there was nothing for us to start from. Like if today I'm to write another dictionary on Luganda, there are reference grammars which I can use. But for Lulu Nyala, there was nothing. And yet I needed the grammar for me to be able to write, a, to come up with a good proposal for their orthography. And what we are doing or what we did was to concurrently write both the grammar and the orthography. And as we speak now, we have the orthography in place. And it's the one they are using now to translate the Bible into Luluri Runyara. Actually, there are two projects which are going on. One is sponsored by SEAL, and another one is sponsored by uh, Weekly Foundation, and both translating uh, the Bible into their uh, mother tongue. At the same time, using the uh, orthography that we, we developed, they've uh, received the sponsorship from USAID, and they're writing primers, which uh, they can use uh, in um, lower primary in case they start teaching uh, Ruduri Nyala in, 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 in using Ruduri Nyala as a medium of instruction under the mother tongue-based education. And did we do a needs assessment? Yes, we did. And in any endangered language, the most important tool or resource is the dictionary. You can write your beautiful grammar, but my judge in Nakasongola will not understand your phonology. You will not understand your grammar or syntax or whatever. They will not appreciate it. But as long as they have a collection of their words, they are happy with that. So actually, after publishing the ruling, I don't know how many calls I've received from different communities. And who are saying we also want the same in, in our language. And uh, a month ago, uh, we, have, we started on writing the uh, dictionary of the Kinubi, or the Nubian language. And uh, it's being sponsored by Moses Ali. So, who knows? Soon we shall be starting on Rukeni. I don't know whether you've heard the Rukeni. There's already a proposal, and we are trying to put the funds together. And they are all saying we want a dictionary, not the grammar. Dr. Yes, Doctor Masengo. Thank you. A short one. Yeah, thank you, Doctor Namiaro. I think I skipped to mention that Doctor Namiaro is my mentor on my project. Yes. So my question is about tone. Um, so, uh, you mentioned that you are non-committal uh, about tone in absence. By, by then. Yes. But in, now we are. Oh, now you are. Yes. So, now that you are, uh, will you then be, how will it then integrate it uh, in, the, in the publication? Do you plan to have uh, a second edition or it's, it, it doesn't matter? Thank you. Uh, 
definitely we shall have uh, more editions between um, the time when our draft went into press to, to start being reviewed and now we've collected more 1,000 dictionary entries. The native speakers keep calling us, oh, there is this word that we missed. So we are hoping that maybe uh, we agreed as the research team that we give it about five years. And now, after the five years, we shall have more words uh, added onto the dictionary, but also it will have uh, tone marks. Uh, so far, we have about three publications which are going to come out on tone. And we hope that as we complete uh, the extension, uh, we would have a full understanding of the tone system of Lulu Lunyala. And like I told you, we have a PhD student who has, Anatoly Chirigwajo, has already submitted. And even his thesis is giving us you know, more uh, uh, in-depth understanding of the tone system. Okay, we will have only two brief questions before we can conclude this session. Dr. Kayana. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Namielo, I have a question uh, about how you negotiated your power as a, a doctor, as a, the funds bringer, and so on. How did you negotiate your power as you worked with this endangered language? Thank you. I hope I've understood the question. <laughs> so, um, I'm the land. You, 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 quotes. Yeah, you have a PhD. I have a PhD, and um, I'm the one you, who brought you have in big the monies, funding. <laughs> big money is from Germany. Uh, and, uh, no, um, in the field of um, language documentation and description, the native speaker is considered to be the consultant. And actually, I remember I had the trouble when I was documenting the art and the art of uh, making the back cloth in, 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 in among the Baganda. And I put in my claim through the college. And I said, I want to pay the language consultants this much. And then they said, no, ask these consultants to bring their back accounts. And, and then I had to go back to explain to them that it, how we conceive language consultants within the domain of language description and documentation is that native speaker. He might not have gone to school, but he's the custodian of the language. He has all the knowledge. So with my PhD and not being a native speaker of Ululuri Runyara, I had to depend on those native speakers. So they were my boss. Last one from Dr. Taylor. Uh, thank you I'll, uh, for all of this. I, I didn't want to let the last session pass, and now, and now this opportunity to ask a, a question about the relationship between, in general, a general question about the relationship between uh, preservation of language, knowledge, and the university. So I am a foreigner in Uganda. I'm speaking my first language. I assume that many of my colleagues are speaking, the language we're speaking is a second, third, fourth language. Uh, there are universities in South Africa that are experimenting with, students are writing engineering PhDs in uh, Zulu uh, and other, their own languages. And part of it, it's a conceptual, it's not just a facility that it's easier to speak one's first language, it's a conceptual, uh, uh, question about are the concepts that come from a language like Wuruli or any other language, uh, can they extend the knowledge that we produce about other subjects from agriculture to engineering? Uh, and so it's a general question about is there, what, what do you make of the, the possibility for producing academic knowledge in uh, a language like Wuruli or any other? Uh, how do you how do you interpret this uh, this trend in um, decolonizing of of language? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know whether I really understood the first question, but uh, um, w 
what I make sense of what you said is how we can use the different concepts within the language and apply it to other disciplines, say um, engineering, say in agriculture, etc. I think with an endangered language, we're yet to get there. But we're already doing the, something similar to that in other relatively developed languages like Luganda, where, for example, we have a, a, a legal dictionary, we, there's a, a dictionary of agriculture, there's a, um, a medical dictionary, which I'm yet to publish. I wrote it myself together with Dr. Katusheme, <laughs> sorry I, 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 about mispronouncing your name, I know I'm now conscious about, I should call you Frida. We together uh, uh, wrote um, a grocery, I will call it a grocery of food and nutrition uh, terms in Uganda and Lunyankole um, Ruchiga, uh, and we hope to publish a book as well as a dictionary. So in languages that are relatively developed with some bit of literature, uh, yes, we can extend it. And uh, for example, together with the engineers from here, we are going to write um, a text recognizer. Is that the right thing they call it? Like you can have a, a text, but by clicking, then you can have a sound. So I'm working on that project as a, a language expert. So when a language is relatively developed, a lot can be done. Frida has already developed a spell checker for Lunyankori Ruchiga and is writing one for Luganda. But for a small language like Luluri Lunyara, we still have you know, a long way to go. Have we thought of uh, doing more academic work in the language? Yes. As we speak now, we have 16 articles that are coming out of the corpus that we have at hand. And uh, these 16 articles have been written uh, by myself and my uh, other colleagues who are working on the project. Uh, I'm working with Professor Alena Vizlak, who is now at the U Hebrews University of Jerusalem but initially was in German at Kiel University. I'm working with Professor Margaret Zellers, who is at the um, University of Kiel. I'm working with uh, Professor Scott Myers from Texas University in America. I'm working with uh, my two PhD students, one graduated, another one is yet to graduate, and actually using this corpus, 11 MA, have been written, okay? Not in a say that they were, they were part of the project, but this corpus is free, anyone can use it. So already we have 11 MA uh, thesis that have been published, one PhD and three other PhDs uh, which are yet to be completed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Namiaro. Uh, there is something in the chat here from Elizabeth Katsime. I must say thank you. was in Bale sub County, Kayunga District, collecting data on mainstreaming ethnic minorities issues in the development process. The Banyara, we are happy. The one writing is not a Banyara, but the Banyara, we are happy uh, that the dictionary of Lunyara is being developed by Makerere, not Sauda Namiara. And uh, the person is saying, May you bring on board other scholars, for example, to use the Runyara dictionary and translate the Uganda constitution into Runyara. This will help respond to issues of recognition, integration, integration, representation of ethnic minorities that the country is grappling with. May, may you. What I know that Dabaluri and Banyara are already uh, recognized in the constitution of Uganda. So they are recognized as independent ethnic groups. Remember, initially, it was assumed that the Banyara and the Baluri are part of the Baganda. And actually, even the earlier literature uh, would say that uh, Luluri and Runyara are dialects of uh, Luganda. I remember when I first made my first presentation, 
someone from my kingdom said, it looks that like this woman is not a pure Muganda. It could be either Munyara or Mururi. Forgetting uh, Sauda, who is a Mukungu in the Uganda kingdom, and Sauda, who is a linguist. So, yes, the Banyara and the Baruri are, despite the historical and political, you know, environment that happened between the Banyuri, Baluri, Banyara, and the Baganda, they are now fully recognized in the constitution of Uganda. Um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Allen Asimwe and uh, Dr. Sauda Namial, the Dean for School of Literature, Language, and Communication. They deserve a very big, loud applause. And uh, as the Banyara, we might accept the sub imperialism of the Baganda, so you can continue to write for us. is assimilation now. Um, in the house, we are very welcome our dear Mama Chius, Professor Josephina Hichire, um, and uh, you found us on the conversation between uh, a Muchiga, oh, in Ruchiga, and a Mururi, uh, in Rururi and Runyara. Uh, yesterday we had a conversation of uh, a person who died and what he actually saw, reminding us of what we used to be told, that the, sometimes the dead are not dead. And uh, today we are going to have yet another interesting conversation on, uh, 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 on uh, moving back into the future. If it is issues of symbolism, I don't know whether this is moving back into the future. Uh, so we are going to move back into the future by having a conversation between Isaac Tivasima and his mentor, Professor Dominica DiPio. Isaac, are you welcome? Thank you, Zayed. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Zayed, and for the introduction. Sister, I'm glad to have this conversation with you and uh, for interesting reasons because those of you who don't know, I met sister in 2003. I don't know if she remembers this, but she came in class and asked for a one Tivasima Isaac and I still remember her telling me this should not be recorded, that uh, you were the best in literary theory and I'm encouraging you to keep on this journey. I don't know if you remember that. I don't. Thank you. <laughs> but it's one of the things that I, I've always kept in mind as a student. And I must say, sister is my doctoral advisor, along with Susan Chiguli, who is not here. And it's been an amazing experience working with you. Um, we're going to talk a lot about this book. It's moving, into the, moving back into the future critical recovering of Africa's cultural heritage. And we will start with a little bit of, um, of um, knowledge, a little bit of introduction about your trajectory in research and in writing, especially about oral literatures and popular cultures in, in East Africa and Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac. I'm very delighted to have this conversation with you, um, to see your own children come of age gives you so much pleasure and I have one who is even moderating the entire process. Um, so I think I'll just give a very brief um, introduction as Isaac says of my academic trajectory and I think the interesting moments for me to begin counting although my MA supervision um, by Dr. Katebaliria Moti, 
who was a known Marxist then uh, in the Department of Literature and groomed me, uh, encouraged me to take a Marxist literary theory approach. Placed me right from that point on a path that is usually fresh. And from that time on, I tend to, you know, um, go into fresh grounds and excavate and open new paths. And the opportunity came for me when I went to the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, which is itself a most unlikely place for someone groomed in the English tradition to go to study in Rome. But that was another opportunity. I went to Rome uh, at the Pontifical Gregorian University run by Jesuits um, on a literature proposal. But what I, when I got there, my professors thought it was a very good thing for me to diversify from African literature to cinema and communication studies. And so this background is important for me because it tells of my interdisciplinary approach to research. And so when I came back to Makerere, after studying in the Center for Interdisciplinary Communication Studies, which was then um, in the Faculty of Social Sciences, I went with my literary background, with my um, humanistic, purely humanistic style, to, ex to be exposed to, you know, also the, you know, um, social science approach. Although, for me, really, the social, appro social science approach was a pain, and I was selective, <laughs> and they allowed me to be so I came all the way from there. When I came back, I started a new journey. And this is the moment for me, Isaac, to give credit to people I found along the way in my path to the academic career. And when you just return from a PhD, you usually come with a lot of energy and with fresh ideas that also open new grounds. And for me, the facilitator at that time was uh, the dean of the Faculty of Arts, uh, Dr. Sengendo. He brought a call for um, proposals and put it in my pigeon pole, knowing that this is a fresh returnee. She must have something interesting to contribute. And that was the first time uh, the NUFU project that was ongoing here was also shifting slightly from purely um, science-oriented disciplines to the humanities. And so when I launched in that Maya, I should say, because it was an area that was not excavated before by the humanities, and I had no partners in Norway, I just went on the internet and searched for possible partners who would be interested in the proposal I was sharing. And I was delighted to find an Englishman in Bergen. <laughs> and I think the people in the Department of Literature know him well, because we have had a long journey through that project to delve into African folklore. And that was when our first project on, um, you know, Africa, Ugandan folklore, traditional wisdom was written. And it had several outputs. Among them uh, is my own mentee here, and Cindy Magara, and several others who came on board. Uh, we identified the best to be in this project to showcase and research in our African culture. So that is the long journey to you know, moving back into the future. You can see I really move back with you when we started researching our folklore, and I found there really a um, gold mine of things to research into and to bring to the table today to answer contemporary problems. That research was very significant because it continued to scale. It was just a nerve we touched that gave birth to several other projects which are some of which are still going on. So uh, moving back into the future, 
comes in a way on the shoulder of that long journey into the past, which I went with some of you. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. And uh, especially because that is the thing that has also made me love African folklore and um, African folk literatures, which is quite an interesting field. I have been reading this, and one of the most interesting articles in here is about what we call night dancing, that uh, the writer calls night running. And uh, it was quite interesting because it, it kind of made me think carefully about how we think about our traditions. And as a humanities scholar, how do you uh, view the notion of African tradition as uncivilized, but also how can we, as people in the academy, help to show the world out there that there is nothing about us that is, that is uncivilized and we need to place our cultures at the center of the debates on Africa. Thank you very much for that. But before I go into answering that question, I want to again recognize the fact that this book is an edited book and it has several articles um, coming from diverse disciplines that contribute to that. And what unites all the uh, chapters is this return to the, past, to the past in the context of the present in order to launch into the future. And in this regard, there is one person who is one of the authors and is present in the audience, and I want to recognize her, and that is Pamela. Uh, I think Pamela is here. If Pamela, oh, thank you so much. Um, I tried to select my authors very carefully when the call for paper came. And as you can see from the book, these people come from different parts of the continent. We have scholars from Ghana. Uh, we have people from Dar es Salaam. And we have people from uh, Kenya. And most of these people are also found in places like this, where I went for conferences, for symposia, and in other words, listening to their presentations, you see something that coheres with what you want to do. And so um, I want to give credit to them for buying into this vision, a vision that really did not have any sponsorship apart from the passion of the people who are involved in it, and I don't take that for granted. Uh, I want to say that when you are passionate about it, you can do something like this without necessarily having sponsorship. That's really it. So now coming to the question of the importance of our past in the context of our present and in the vision of the future, I want to, um, again, refer to a recent conference I had online. It was a conference that was very important and it spanned about three weeks. And in these three weeks, we will meet once a week, uh, once, a day, once, once in a week for three weeks to discuss the classics from the European perspective, and that's the past. Um, this was the Pontifical Council for, for Culture uh, at the Vatican. They were, the theme of that conference was um, necessary humanism. And as we discussed about what necessary humanism in the context of the present is, they took us to the past. They took us to their classics. And we went to the classics. The journey was from Greece, Rome, and Jerusalem through the Bible, of course. And we were, in that context, constrained, those of us who come from other parts other than Europe, we were constrained to look at our own situations in the lens of the West. And that was very important, a realization for me, because it is exactly what we have tried to do in this book. We are trying to call attention to the importance of our past. When it is necessary for us to look to our past, to gain wisdom in order to move forward, it's often because we are faced with a particular challenge in the present. If you look at the various papers in that, um, 
in this book, some of them deal with issues of the ecosystem and the environment. Some deal with our identity, our religious sensibility, and gender relations, all drawing from the past. We realize that perhaps, for example, in gender discourses, when we talk of today, you know, African women being liberated, perhaps looking back at the past, will give us another information about how gender was practiced then. And I these days tend to think over and over that, yes, I, I dare say, really, there was a great level of parity compared to what is now. So there is indeed something to learn from the past. So for me, that is the journey. We are faced with challenges today, and there are significant symbols uh, Isaac, as you have read this book, that uh, you realize I use as significant for me to reflect on the past, especially in collecting these uh, chapters and even in, in the introductory uh, paragraph. And, um, and that symbol, which I discovered way back when I was uh, a PhD student in Rome, came to me through the lens of film. And this is a famous film by um, an Ethiopian... Uh, living in diaspora in the U.S., Haile Garima, whose the title of his film is Sankofa. I think my, my students know I love that film, and through it we have navigated the past to say what can we get from there to address our contemporary issues. So I use that symbol as the way for us to look for the past, to bring what we can pick critically to reinvigorate our journey into the future. So that's how important history is. Everybody else is looking to their classics. Do we have our classics? And have we cared to document them? For us, this is our humble effort at trying to open the door to, to go and research and find out really what are our classics if we say, this continue to inspire us, just as you know, uh, you know um, the, the Greek classics and the Roman classics, like you know um, Dante. All of those continue to inspire us. There must be something that we need to do of our own, of our past, in the direction of decolonization. That's the context. Okay, <clears throat> and now that you speak of decolonization. Um, the idea of the African Revolution showed, even in the way these papers are written, um, mm -hmm. thinking about ourselves, about our identities, about our past, but also, like you said, looking into the future and using the past to help us to think mm -hmm. about the future. I wonder then how we, because you see, one of the troubles we have right now, even in this country, is as humanities scholars, how we can help people understand that while there is this thing that you'd like to assume is so much contemporary, our past can work with it. But in having to think about that, to think about disciplines that we have in the humanities, and to ask ourselves about this African revolution and our African scholarship, um, like you said, um, say, this is where we've come from. How do we in the humanities help place even these very African experiences at the center of contemporary debates. Because you see, while you write about your people in here, and that's one of the things I, I really must applaud you for, because I think most of your papers I've read are about the Madi. Um, no, uh, in oral literatures, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> not all, but most of your papers in oral literature and popular cultures are about your people. And one of the things I admire about it is that you, you, you make us realize that some of the things we think are, like my teacher Sauda says, rocket science, are actually things our cultures have always had. So how can we use even our own disciplines as humanities scholars to make the world know that we have a part to play in the revolution of, African, of the African academy, but also in our thinking about ourselves as Ugandans? Thank you very much, Isaac, and I'm glad that, uh, uh, yeah, if, if that shows. And I think um, I, I was myself moved to begin 
uh, to start with, collecting folk tales. By the way, among the many things I've done was also to collect folk tales from around Uganda. It, and, and the motivation there was also my, my niece then, little niece who was staying with me and was in primary school then. And uh, she asked me a question, you know, that, but don't we have our own stories, you know? The folk tales, that is. And it got me, I did not have ready folk tales to tell her. And it was one of the motivations for me to realize how important stories are and your own stories. So from that time onwards, when we started the folklore project, you are so right. I did a lot of work also on the Madi, including using the, the video, because that's another asset you have that perhaps has um, demystified my researches as highly academic and highly intellectual because I've always tended also to use the more popular medium for documenting knowledge that you can so easily share with the ordinary people and engage them in conversation. And so I've been going back to my people because when I did my first uh, documents, documentary in their own voices. They themselves talking about their culture. Just as my colleague here, uh, the dean said, the excitement we give people when we go to them to consult them about knowledge that they know better than us and we can sit at their feet and they tell us they really appreciate the first time I went, I was told, oh, now Makerere has come down to us. So it's a very important thing. It is rewarding to them. And I remember when we took the documentary film to engage the community in conversation, one of the women said, now I can die because I will leave my voice behind. So the, the whole thing of people having voice and expressing them and us listening to them, and together with them, we create knowledge, has become a very important mode of, of research for me. And so I want to say that um, my humble contribution uses my cultural lens as a starting point to theorize broader issues. Uh, for example, just in my recent um, gender, ter not gender terrains, but uh, uh, in, in, in um, um, what is my recent documentary film? <laughs> um, um, African something? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, there are quite many, so you forget your children's names. Sometimes parents do that. Yeah. So, so that, that gave me the opportunity to realize that what is pertaining to my own community is also pertaining to other communities, because in that documentary, um, uh, I, I consulted several ethnic groups around Uganda, and the things they are saying are similar to what, is, what I'd observed and, and initiated me in the process. And so that, for me, is how theory is also developed from those um, information I've got from the community. I know I'm interested in theorizing uh, motherhood concept in Africa. It's, I think, Mother-Centered Africa is the name of the documentary I'm talking about. So for me, it's very important that we go to our own communities. It is my little contribution towards, uh, you know, decolonizing, that there is a lot of knowledge in our backyard that we here are all engaged in doing it because from yesterday to today, the researches and presentations I've had are just all in this direction. But it takes administration to get these things in the curriculum. And we should not tire. I think we should not tire. Isaac, you and I know that currently we are also working like uh, Frida to reach to NCDC about our content all in that it's not going to come easy. It will take, you know, passion and effort to go and open the doors. But I remember one time we did a documentary on abuse innocence, child abuse in Uganda. And when we had a conversation with the minister then, 
he said, you know, we, you know, your job is to actually let us know about these things. We didn't know that these terrible things are happening. So I think let us break the excuses people give by actually taking it to them and say, this is what we have, what are you going to consider? That's my take. Thank you. And one final question, because yeah. this book is really a lot interdisciplinary in nature. We, we live in a world where humanities and social sciences are under, and so we are struggling to survive. I don't know if we are struggling. I think we will survive. Uh, my principal always talked about uh, times of, uh, of uh, ah, I'm forgetting the word now. There's a word she likes, disruptions. And, uh, and all these things, of course, that are happening to us. Do you have any suggestions? I mean, you do this for people within our disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. Do you have any suggestions where we could actually also show our relevance and collaborate with people in, say, the STEM disciplines? Yeah. And if we are going to do that, how do you or how do you suggest that? Thank you very much for that. And I think this is already happening. Uh, from what I've had people talk about from yesterday to today and also to my own practice, it's already happening. What we need is to be bolder. I think it is for lack of presence, which is beginning to show. It is for lack of presence radical presence, I should say, that people tell us we're not relevant, really. Because the reality is it's undeniable that we are relevant. So uh, what I would like to say is let's press, you know, the gear for higher acceleration better than we are doing right now. Because really it's undeniable. And, and this will also affect curriculum. I think people see our enthusiasm and they respond to us the way we have that enthusiasm or we don't. So my appeal really is uh, to be bolder than we are. And uh, yesterday I followed online and the conversations that we have created for us to have this opportunity to have a conversation is really showing that we are going in the right direction. And I, I would like, especially, I repeat it here because for me, instead of clustering in those minute, insignificant units, let's find a way of a lot working together. The synergy will give us your more leverage to deliver and to be visible. And uh, I want to draw back to what it was in the 1960s and, and, and thereabout. Uh, particularly in respect to our own school now, discipline. Um, we know how performances were happening because people were more cohesive. So let's find those paths to cohesion and those paths will lead to having more uh, performances in the national theater. The national theater is a space for all of us. I remember Cindy when we went to the national theater, Isaac twice and took films there. People were full of praises for us. And for the first time, my career is being flagged for the right things. So let us occupy these places. And honestly, our own president, who is known to be and who is often cited as really uh, looking down upon us, will, will really join us, I believe. Because this is somebody who actually takes pride to show that he was a Shakespearean actor that he acted Julius Caesar and, and is happy to show it. So please, we Julius Caesar actors and writers, let us up our game. That is it. And we will be respected, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like some questions from the audience. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Yes, Dr. Tabajuka. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Professor DiPio, and uh, thank you, uh, Tibasima, for the wonderful moderation. Uh, I have um, um, a question about, uh, well, I haven't read the book, I must confess, but uh, um, 
Yeah, yeah. Now I, 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 I'll have to look for it and uh, I'll have to read it. Um, because uh, it speaks to my discipline, and I'm glad to hear that uh, one of the contributors uh, to the book is uh, our own uh, Dr. Kanapa. And uh, so my question is, um, uh, as a student of uh, literature from uh, Makerere University, from um, undergraduate uh, through the masters, I'm sure you were introduced to African writers series. I wonder how much uh, inspiration you you see coming from uh, writers like Chinua Chebe, and uh, I I wonder why uh, in uh, at, at at the university in Italy whether uh, African writers had a presence at all, and. Uh, uh, ask why you needed to discover the presence of this knowledge at that point in the time. Why you needed it to be um, really, really. Um. So, what what was the trigger? Because you are aware of all of this knowledge and uh, the folklore was all over the place. What what was the real trigger? Uh, having read all this literature and probably taken it for granted. So, what was the trigger then? Thank you so much for that question. It was one of the things I wanted to talk about, my inspirations over the time, and I'm glad you asked for it. Um, yes, like I told you, when I went to Rome, there was no African literature in, in the school of um, interdisciplinary school of social communication, but it was media studies. And so I was advised to take the film component of that study because film and literature were so interrelated. And so that's how I went into cinema. And I'm so glad it did happen because in African cinema, I found a whole world of folklore. And the folklore that I came with, that influenced also my ability to write on that folklore project I referred to really came to me through cinema. Because most of, most of the films we were watching then were francophony. And I think we are aware that francophone cinema was heavily anthropological and, uh, and, and, and it had a lot of African rooted content, narratives, legends in it. And so um, that's one. And there are two key people who have been great influence to me. One of them, of course, is Osman Semben, who, like me, was a literary person before he turned to cinema. And he turned to cinema in his 40s mainly for the reason that through cinema he could speak to his people. And again, that points to the relevance of the scholar or the intellectual to the community. And so he made these films, which were mostly drawn also from oral tales. They were not from the history's official history, because he was very suspicious of the official history. And he looked for his narratives from the oral forms. And two, the other key person who has influenced me very significantly was um, Manthea Diawara. He even came here once. Uh, uh, to, he was making a film on Gugi Wationgo and he, he gave a public lecture in Makere here. That was another uh, very important person, a professor in New York University, uh, a distinguished professor of comparative literature and film. And again, these iconic people gave me the confidence of how literature and film sit very well together. Manthea Diawara is a, a renowned scholar of film and literature. He does both cinema and film. And I am very happy also that I am grooming, I have groomed my own here, Cindy, to follow that path, that cinema and film work together. So these are some of the people that have been so significant in my influence. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Um, talking about critical recovering of Africa's cultural heritage. My interest, Prof, lies in the intersectionality of indigenous culture and the African identity. But there are conversations around whether African culture should be selectively or awesomely um, selected, if you like. So I would like to ask you, Ma, what your thoughts are on this? Thank you. Thank you very much. As the next person gets ready, I, I will respond very fast. Definitely, we should be selectively, yes. And I remember, even when we look to the classics, we have to look to it selectively. And I will again give you an example of uh, one PhD student we are supervising who is uh, uh, you know, using the classics to look at a Ghanaian uh, plays or something like that. She started with putting the, classic, the classics on the pedestal as the mirror for the African plays. And we have guided this scholar to see, but why? Why should you think the Africans should bow? Isn't there nothing from the Ghanaian concept which comes from our ancient culture and civilization that could actually also stand for the classics in so, so that it can speak with, so that you are more critical. I am not for rubbishing everything that is Western. I am not for that, because we have to be in conversation. When there are civilizations, we should realize, for us, for me, the issue is we, we should realize that we also come from a real grand civilization that should converse. At the moment, we have bowed down to the other civilization, as if we didn't have. So for us, the recovery is to go back, to go back and recover this, our civilization that we have not paid attention to enough. Thank you. I will take one more question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sister DiPio. My name is Linda Nakalawa. I am a PhD student from the School of Psychology. And something that has really triggered me with this conversation is to ask, how do you contend with the tendency towards maintaining disciplinary silos? To give a bit of background, I'm a psychology student, and I paid so much attention to Bakhtin to, um, to help tease out the concept of voice and how voices shape um, youth mindsets. And a question that I keep getting many times when I present my work is, are you in psychology or languages? So how do you push back against these disciplinary silos and, and walk that fine line? Thank you very much for that question. And I'm glad also our principal is here. I think people, we really, um, uh, I think, I, I don't know, I recommend to you also this recent book of Sylvia Tamale. She has a chapter there on uh, the education system huh? and, and decolonizing the education system. I really think we should be bold to take that, those directions of, um, rethinking silosization because um, I don't know, I can tell you that I have become, I am better off. I'm sorry to say this, I rarely say, but I'm better off as a scholar for having diversified than I would have been if I'd been so pigeonholed in the literature, uh, in the classics of the, I mean, in that sense, because um, this also came to me from the interdisciplinary school there where I went. Initially, I was complaining so much that we are doing so much that is not quite what my business is about. We are reading a lot of stuff which was outside the narrow path of the discipline. And later on, I realized how those have enriched my scholarship. And indeed, even when you write, you write in the discipline of literature, but you have these flares, you know, 
that enrich what you say in that discipline, which was not the way I used to do things, and it became recognizable. So I think um, when we are, I know for, for all of us younger ones and, and all that, when you are thinking of your upward journey, um, you're, you're just thinking, but people are going to say, how, how very psychology is this thing? And yet we know that knowledge is not compartmentalized. And if we go back to our African classics again, you will find it is exactly like that. You will find a person who is able to, to give medicine here, can also distill something there and do something there. I like to give the example of the griot for us, those who come from the literary. He was a historian, he was a performer, he was a teacher, he was all of those many things, but he was that one name. So I think, principle, we have to really push the boundaries on, on how, how we see um, interdisciplinarity as enriching, and I'm glad that's the path you tend to take already, and I hope it will continue. Thank you. Okay, I um, would like to thank you, sister, for this time, for the conversation, and to the audience for the questions. Thank you for your engagement with us, and to the online audience, we are truly grateful that you took time to be part of this. Thank you very much, and have a good rest of the afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dominica DiPio, and your son for that interesting uh, conversation. In Africa, we have a saying, maybe um, it is Dr. Eddie Gataira who may not be knowing this, that you do not need to drum a lot to call people for food. On the other side, one of the communities they simply say, Enduru Yokuria, but Erenche. It is time for lunch, ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome for lunch. We have 40 minutes, and uh, I'll ask Cindy to come and lead the principal to be first on the on, on uh, uh, serving line, followed by Dr. Sauda Namiaro and the rest. Thank you.
conversation for the Truth Conversation 2021, Truth on the Move. Uh, we are going to start our afternoon uh, part uh, by one, watching some of the videos that uh, one of the panelists will be mostly talking about, uh, about the work that uh, he and the team that he works with have done in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Uganda. And uh, we'll be waiting for uh, the final panelist to arrive. He's not very far from here, so we are using that time for you to view the videos so that when they begin the conversation, you kind of understand where they're coming from. So I'm going to request the technical team to play for us the videos. And in the next about uh, 10, 12 minutes, we'll formally begin the conversation on COVID. Thank you. Ah, okay, I'm scared. How are you? Okay, why don't you put on the mask? Eh? Why is your mask? I mean, I don't like mask. Then I put on the mask. I, I mean, I could zero when I put on the mask. I don't, don't like that. Yes. You are joking, Opio. I'm not joking. Opio, I said don't put on the mask. No. I don't like it. No one knows we got a mask. Corona Ebo Maka. Sala Keba.
hadn't introduced myself because I thought uh, the other panelists would be here so everybody knows who they are talking to. I'm Lillian Babazi and I teach drama in the Department of Performing Arts and Film. And uh, we are very pleased to have you this afternoon to continue the conversations, specifically with our magnificent panel. And uh, we are pleased that uh, three of the panelists are already in the house. And the chair for the panel is also in the house. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite the chair for the session that we are going to go into, Dr. William Taewa, Head Department of Journalism and Communication to take the seat. And uh, next I will invite Madam Mebo Twegumye Zake to also take her seat. <laughs> Followed by Mr. Bujingo Huntington, please take the seat. And Madam Patience Nitumwesiga. You're most welcome. Uh, our fourth panelist, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Anatoly Moletera, is joining us uh, shortly. We receive him when he comes. Please take your seats and feel at home. You are back home. Makere will always be your home, so we are very pleased to have you. I will quickly introduce uh, two of the panelists that are here with us. And uh, I will invite Dr. Zaidi to introduce another panelist. And then the fourth panelist will be introduced by the chair. We have decided to distribute. That is how we do it in truth. Um, we have uh, Patience Nitumwesiga, the lady in blue, beautiful lady in blue, you're most welcome. Patience is an outstanding theater and film writer, director, and producer. She's the founder of Shajika Tales, a company that is dedicated to telling decolonized African stories while confronting current political realities as well as cultural challenges in Uganda. Uh, she is an alumnus of the Department of Performing Arts and Film, Makerere University. <laughs> She's an international award-winning film producer and director who has won five awards at the Durban Film Mart in August 2021 with her feature documentary titled The Woman Who Poked the Leopard. And uh, that uh, is about Stella Nyanzi who employs uh, traditional resistance to tackle oppression in Uganda. And I think for patients to be doing this, we need to applaud her. Uh, that feature film, So Patience, work closely with somebody that I know most of us might know uh, called Rosie Motene, a South African, Pan-Africanist feminist writer and producer. Patience has worked with her closely. And um, uh, the woman who poked the leopard also featured at uh, a film festival in Germany, uh, Doc Lipzig in uh, October 2021 and won the Diverse Voices Award from European Women's Audiovisual Network. <laughs> Patience has made short films, web series, mixed media art. She's done an embroidery project for justice to mourn the femicides that happened in Wakiso and Entebbe from 2018. She's had different exhibitions uh, of a photo gallery that she called Unsung Heroes, uh, in which she documents Uganda's rural feminists. Patience is 
a vocal feminist. Uh, she runs Mbaganire podcast, which uh, expresses African folk tales, again with a view of decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production, just as we had yesterday in Professor Julius Kiza's uh, presentation here on the panel. Uh, currently, Patience is working on her feature debate um, fiction. Uh, it's titled No Country for Little Girls Tantrums. And it has already gone through the talents, Durban, which happened in 2019, and it is still under development. She is a distinguished poet, a researcher that has traversed the globe, I would say. She's presented her work at international festivals and conferences in Norway, in Sweden, in the UK, in Kenya. I think I can't mention it all. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the lady before you today. <laughs> Second, I will introduce the gentleman, and as you can see, we did it deliberately, ladies first. Uh, we have Bujingo Huntington, and uh, Bujingo Huntington is a Ugandan celebrated comedian, actor, film producer and advertising strategist. He is the managing director of arguably the leading comedy outfit in Uganda, Fun Factory Uganda. And he is also the president of the Uganda Comedians Association. He is a board member of the Uganda National Culture Forum which represents artists ranging from performing artists, visual artists, those who are in literature, audiovisual production, those in publishing, those in film, among others. Bujingo has acted alongside renowned world actors. He has acted in The Last King of Scotland that starred American actor Forrest Whitaker. He has also acted in a short film called Roho alongside Lupita Nyong'o. Bujingo won a bronze, a bronze medal with Metropolitan Republic at the Lori Awards for the MTN SIM card registration campaign. Uh, Bujingo and the team that he works with at Fun Factory Uganda have done magnificent work to sensitize Ugandans to fight COVID-19, and I'm sure we have seen some of the work that they have done. Uh, currently, he's acting as Sam. I was teasing him that uh, he picked Sam, which is the name of my husband. <laughs> uh, so he's, he's acting as Sam on Mizigo Express that uh, shows on Pearl Magic, so you can catch him every week. And that is the gentleman that has come to share his experiences with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I will now invite Dr. Zaid Sechito to come and introduce the next panelist. Thank you very much. Enjoy the afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lillian. Finally, the fourth panelist has arrived, Anatoly Muletera. Sir, you're welcome to first have the seat this side. Uh, briefly, who is Anatoly Muletera? Anatoly Muletera is a teacher, an administrator, and a counselor by practice. He, can't, he currently heads community policing department in the Uganda Police Force. He holds a Bachelor of Arts with Social Sciences and a Master of Arts in Public Administration and Management, both from Makere University. Anatoly Muleterwa <laughs> is currently working on a doctoral project titled Terrorism and Community Policing also from the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. 
So Anatoly Muleterwa is our very own. Besides working with the police, he's here as a, a, a member of the humanities. He has been known for extending community outreach programs to refugee camps such as the BDBD, with a view of building a sense of hope among refugees. He has continually advised refugees to follow the legal systems of Uganda, and on several occasions has been quoted advising them as follows. Taking interest in knowing the cultural norms of society where you are, cooperating with the security agencies, giving us information them, enforcement of the law, and the desire to live together is the best way to have a united uh, people. Learn to solve problems affecting you other than being lawlessness and share information for quick intervention. Anatoly Muleterwa, you are welcome to share with us this afternoon. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> not yet. Not yet, not yet. I think I can also remove my mask. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am here to introduce the, not to chairs yet, but to introduce our fourth panelist. So, Miss Mebo Twegumie, and uh, in one of the pieces, uh, when they Google you, they will read one of the pieces where people keep uh, teasing you about the name Zake. Um, but uh, Miss Mebo Twegumie Zake, I think, um, is very familiar to most of us if you watch NBS television. Uh, she is a seasoned media personality with a wealth of experience in various disciplines. I will um, not go through all of them. We are running really behind schedule as chair. I'm quite concerned. Uh, but she has a show host. She's a show host. NBS at nine. I think uh, those of you who don't watch, I encourage you to make sure that you watch NBS. She's a news anchor and a producer as well. So me who teaches journalism and communication, to get someone who can anchor and uh, host, but also produce, those are really a set of very special skills. So we have a very talented uh, lady with us. Uh, she's a renowned um, show host as well of a popular program people and power uh, that brings forward prominent personalities and states persons. I see here statesmen, but uh, my principal is here. Uh, I wouldn't want to be gender in insensitive. So states persons. Uh, <laughs> she, while at, at Makere University as an undergraduate student, um, I missed teaching at undergraduate. I was doing my PhD at the time. But she was a very active student, including producing a show magazine at that time. And this is very important for the students who are with us. Pandon Magazine. And uh, I think it, you were still at Makerere when you conceptualized the People and Power program that you went ahead to implement and which has become a very, very important um, show in the land. They are very interesting things. She, she's an optimist. She, there is something I found in her CV that I want to read for us. So uh, Mabel says, merit is earned from the number of layers added onto others. My conviction begs those values. So I don't want to water down those powerful words. And I'm glad to say, Mabel is our proud alumni of the Department of Journalism and Communication. In her cohort, she surprised us, she's very busy, but really surprised us by being the first to submit her master's dissertation. That is Mebo Tuegumia. You are most welcome. Okay, I think we get into the business. First of all, I want really to thank our dear principal, Professor Ashire, who is with us, Josephine Ashire. Yes, yes, yes. To bring us into these conversations, she has a, an amazing team of people she works with, 
who are in the room here, Dr. Edgar Nabutanyi, Dr. Davis Mugumia, and then the wonderful ladies we have in front here, there is one miss, oh, the gentleman, the gentleman uh, who was here, Dr. Zaid Sechito, my young brother, the wonderful ladies, Cindy Magara, Dr. Cindy Magara, right there, Lillian Mbabazi, right there, these are doing amazing work, including many others, because this being the, the last session, I really have to do this. This session, being the last, on an incredible two days, I was watching yesterday from Barara, I was out, out of town, but I was on, on YouTube watching what was happening. And the afternoon session was, uh, was fire. So we are not going to, to get there. This is not fire. This is a session where we have amazing people. They were amazing also, the ones of yesterday. But these are people, our alumni, doing, doing amazing work in the communities on very important topics of our time. So I want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to say, we as the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Makerere, we are very proud it, for, very proud of you and for the amazing work that you are doing out there. Um, we have a very simple task. Our task really is for you to accentuate your work, the work that you are doing. Because the work that you do and your CVs that we read here, your profiles, speak for themselves. We played your pieces, uh, Mr. Bujingo, not because we just, uh, the music is good, we enjoy, all right? But they are very heavy with very good messages. So it was part of this conversation as well. So to each one of you, we are going to start, of course I, I should start with um, my neighbor, all right? We, Lydian, read your profile to us, the amazing work that you are doing. What we want you to tell us now is look at the work that you're doing, and the first question is, just take us to the nucleus of the themes you explore and why you explore those themes. As you do that, and this applies to all of you, so all of you are going to, that, that is going to be our first question, okay? Uh, we want you to take us to the nucleus of the work that you do and the themes that you explore and why. As you do that, I urge you to focus on what we gave you when we circulated our invitation. The theme of our afternoon session is on the humanities in the new decade, in the new decade, withering the tide of insecurities and pandemics. Withering the tide of insecurities and pandemics. And all of you have done amazing work in this. So if you could start on that first question, and then I will come up with a, a follow-up question. And this is a conversation. It's not an academic presentation, and therefore we are going to be in conversation together here with each other as well, with the amazing audience that is online, and with the ama amazing um, audience that is, is before us. So, over to you, uh, dear patients. Thank you. Um, I think I'll start with the why I do the work that I do. Um, I used to think that I would be an academic, and then I made the mistake of going into communities and actually working with people. And when I reached there, I'm, I've been told that the program that used to take us to communities has been, um, the funding has been cut for that at the department, which is very sad. Because for me, I think that's where I discovered myself. I was very influenced by um, scholars like Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal, who believed in going into communities and finding out what their urgent issues are, instead of us as educated people sort of taking our own agenda into communities. So I reached into um, those communities and I didn't want to leave. I was supposed to go for my master's one year after my BA. And I was so involved, I couldn't leave. And so even now, like the work that I do, 
in, in decolonizing some of the content of, of film and television or finding out what our people need, what stories they need to be told, it's because I have been in communities for a long time. I have visited every district in this country. I, I don't just go to countries outside of here. I, I like engaging with people and knowing what do they want. And, and that's why for me, you know, um, for instance, when I started the, the project of the embroidery for justice, we were sad. I live in Wakiso. We were scared as women in Wakiso. People, m women were being um, dumped on the roadside. Someone was dumped next to where I live, and I was like, what am I supposed to do? And, you know, for a long time, though I had wanted to be an academic, I always wondered, will my books just be on the shelves of universities and not be read? I wanted to be relevant. I wanted work that people could understand, ordinary people. A lot of people in Uganda do not read. And so I wanted, although I'm a very, very ardent reader, I love books, I wanted to still communicate to people who don't love books the way that I do. So um, I think for me that's the why. And so um, even going into documentaries, it was more of the people who watch documentaries or watch TV don't necessarily read. And so I wanted to do work that um, communicates to those kinds of people and work that um, is important to them. And so for instance, when we did the embroidery project, I, it wasn't hard because everybody was looking for a way to contribute. And even the people we invited, um, f I'm, I'm talking about this project because it's, it relates to the work, that the, the themes we're talking about today about insecurities. And I'm very um, interested to know, because I'm seated right next to the police um, guy, because at that time we felt like police was not listening. They were labeling these women as sex workers, and they were telling them you shouldn't be out at night. And we were thinking, but we love walking at night. Sometimes we can't avoid it. There's this person who's, I don't know, a mobile money vendor. She can't just leave. She has to work. And, and so Kampala needs to be safe. That's all we need. And there were statistics, and they were not making sense. So we were looking for something that made sense. So we organized a few people, and they came together, and we made handkerchiefs at first. One handkerchief for each woman that had been murdered. And what we were aiming to do was to communicate that you know we care about them as individuals. We're not just looking at the numbers. 30 women in Wakiso have been killed. That's easy to say. It's a headline in the news. But for us, it was about the individual person. Every one of the handkerchiefs that I did was a, a, a young, very young girl called uh, Proskovia Nansuga, 19 years old. I thought about being 19. I was so clueless at 19. I had not lived my life at all. And I thought about being murdered at that age and knowing that your killer will not be got. And the only comfort that we could find was in each other, sitting together and sort of mourning together and making these handkerchiefs that later became a quilt that reminded us that in, irrespective of what the facts are, we all care about these women as individuals. Now, thank you, thank you very much, patience. Thank you, thank you. Now, don't, don't, don't put off the microphone, because I want you now to turn to Assistant Commissioner of Police, Anatoly Mureterwa. So you said um, he's next, seated right next to you. I want you to ask him actually that particular question. And Anatoly, I want you to answer that question. What happened? And then we shall start from there. It's a conversation, by the way. It's a conversation. So we are conversing. She had issues, these many women. What happened? When you are standing, can you put on your microphone, please? Yes, you can stand, of course. You are welcome. If you could have your microphone, please. Oh, it's, it's not on. Come here, sir. Stand away from us. So, did you, did you get her question and her concern? Because you are, you are in charge of uh, community policing, 
And we've looked at uh, some of the amazing work that you do in that department. But there are, there are quite some serious issues that relate, one, to what she has mentioned, but two, to a very uh, serious issue of uh, the rising domestic violence, especially during COVID-19. And uh, my principal is right here, Professor Ashire. Uh, they did a study which was released last year, and uh, there were very interesting uh, findings within that. Uh, looking at the violence within families, how it increased during COVID-19. So if you could relate that to what she has raised, we start with that and then we continue, sir. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, the moderator, the principal college of, I mean, college of Humanities. Dr. Z was connected me to you because uh, little did I know you, but through him. Thank you very much for endearing me to them. And uh, he has said it all, but he has also forgotten something very, very pertinent. That I am a married man with a ring calf. Therefore, meaning I'm also a father. Uh, fellow participants, the issue at hand for which I've been invited to make submissions on or make a contribution to relates to the subject sir that I've been dealing with although you have, you have just hinted on one of the challenges in which the pandemic of COVID has unveiled but there is yet another that I'm going to share with you prior to that I happen not to have loved joining police by the way because of the way the community demonizes us. And sometimes the way we also perceive ourselves. Why do you think the community demonizes I, you, I, Afandi? I will come to that. Okay. Then, then it too, my urge was to become a reverend priest. And then I started at a level where I, where I was a seminarian because I felt that in religion you so much connect to the community. So I pursued up to some level, but you know, men are called, but few are chosen. And here I am. I am now in the uniform of the police, serving the very community that I yearn to serve. I'm 14 years old in the force. Prior to that, I was a teacher. I had my own school. And I was, doing my, I was making my own money. Mr. Moderator, there is always a perception, but people who join the police want to make money. I did not join the police because I wanted to make money, because I had one of the most successful schools where I was making. I was the director, the proprietor, cut us of the knowledge I got from here, and there I am. But when time came, I switched off from being a teacher in the mainstream to police. That's where I am now, serving you both in the form of connecting you to the police, but at the same time ensuring that we all understand each other. What motivated the switching? Now, you have asked so many things. It's a conversation. It's a conversation. <laughs> You have asked so many things, and part of it is uh, the issue of domestic violence or gender-based violence during this pandemic. It is true, and according to our police annual report, but before that, I wish to connect it to our issue. Because at that time, by the way, I was still a commissioner because it happened 19, I mean 2017. So I was still even, I was the deputy commissioner in charge of community policy when the murders were happening. And the million dollar question was, what is the cause of this? Part of that is the insecurity we are discussing right now. The insecurity, the food security, precipitated by poverty, unemployment, as a result leading to some of these young women and men into some of these acts. And we found that he, some of the victims were victims 
of circumstances who were trying to fend for survival. Uh, the police came with an intervention of seeing how they can be able to mobilize these young women. And the, I want to credit my former Inspector General of Police who partnered up, who partnered up with the Operation Wealth Creation to kind of set programs that would enable or that would empower these young women, some of which were artisan industries. Uh, partly some of them are still there and they are, they, are, they, are, they are still fending on that. But at the same time, this has been very much precipitated by the pandemic. Why? Because in our annual crime statistics, especially of 2020, Domestic violence is one of the vices that has really hit humanity. Especially with the view that maybe people, man and woman, use not to, use not to connect each other. Some could go to workplaces and come back when maybe come back in the, at midnight. Others don't come back at all. So there was no time for which both the man and woman could interactively work, I mean, be together. But as a result of this confinement, there's been so much reports of domestic violence. And leave alone domestic violence that has touched the souls and, and, and bodies of women and children, including the men. By the way, my brother, you should know that we, are also become, we have also become victims of domestic violence. My, 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 in the study by Professor Hichire, uh, yeah, that, find, uh, that finding came out very strongly. Yes. Uh, it is reported that in our, 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 our annual crime report, over 30,000 cases of domestic violence were reported. And close to 3,000 people have lost their lives in, as a result of that. Now, the worst is now revealed as a result of the breakdown of family ties, that this year alone, we have had 57 children being battered and killed by their parents, the majority being girl children. This is quite appalling, and this shows the magnitude at which you can see that the pandemic has really uh, impacted on us. Now, the other pandemic that I was talking about, that I've been talking, I mean, that I've been discussing, is the issue of human trafficking. Human trafficking, per se, is always swept in the carpet. But today, I was able to interact with some of the victims of human trafficking, and indeed, I got the chill of it young girls coming to reveal, you know, most of who are even educated, with the degrees, but that because they are trying to look for survival, they, go to, they get people who would wink them, that they are taking them outside there for cheyo, they end up into uh, an open market, little did I know, moderator, that there is an open market for human beings in some of these Arabic countries. That what happens is that when these young girls leave to say they are going to look for cheyo, some of these fraudsters in Uganda here handpick them, take them, and once they take them, you know, man in the United Emirates, they put them in an open market. And now the, 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 the so-called rich men come and look at uh, the individuals that they would feel would suit their interests. So these are some of the issues that really, besides talking about the pandemic of COVID-19 and the in relation to uh, the issue of poverty, the issue of uh, domestic violence and gender-based violence, mm -hmm. it has also manifested into increase in cases which are reported to police and even those that are not reported to police uh, of human trafficking. Uh, the information that I also got was that uh, there are over 15 cases of unaccounted for girls. Over unaccounted for girls because the circumstances under which they left Uganda and went outside is not clear. And therefore, to me as a, a security personnel, it gives me a challenge. But besides it being a challenge, this is good for thought. During such a moment of pandemic, many scholars, many academicians, students, sit aloof and leave it to the players of the politicians, the security personnel, maybe some of the lead agencies, and yet it should be a collective responsibility on how do we tackle some of these insecurities? How do we tackle, how do we find solutions to some of these challenges
that are mm. boggling humanity. Because when I look at this, this doesn't have any level of segregation, whether you have ever mm. been to school or not, whether you, are a, uh, whether you are a person who is well off or not, but as long as you have a human heart, you must have that care, that empathy, to see that we must have a collective responsibility in tackling some of these issues. Mm. Now, besides this, uh, there are two categories of insecurity mm -hmm. that we need really to envisage when we are discussing. Uh, and and when, as you do that, tell us what you have done about all these issues that you've mentioned. Yes. And then uh, we continue the conversation with the rest, and then we shall come back to you. Thank you. Mm. Now, there are two categories of insecurity, and both of which are facing humanity. Mm -hmm. One of them is the food, food security. As you, you may all be aware, or not, not, not be aware, you realize that the, in the recent report uh, produced by the Organization of by the, by the Meteorological Organization, the World Meteorological Organization, revealed that 1.2 million people east and north of, I mean the Horn of Africa, are faced with the level of starvation. 500,000 have been displaced. This is as a result of human beings impacting on the environment and are therefore affecting the climatic conditions. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our gathering here should mm -hmm. inform us on what mm -hmm. must be the, the, the next course of action. Mm -hmm. Then, the other one is the general insecurity. Besides the threat to life, the threat to peace and security, we are again faced with the mind-boggling issue of terrorism, which has no segregation, which has no color, and which has no tribe, no religion. It therefore becomes our desire as uh, a community to come up with issues on how we can be able to tackle that. Getting to your question, through my position as a commissioner for community policy, uh, my strategic objective of the department is aligning to align community policing activity in the daily performance of my police personnel. And what does this community policing entail? It entails the desire to generate, I mean to mobilize partners who are our partners, you inclusive, the community outside there, the media, and many more others, so that we can be able to look at these issues in a whole sir, and see how, how best we can be able to uh, solve them. The other one is to identify the problems that can be able to affect this kind of partnership. Problem identification and problem solving. So, part of those are what I've already mentioned, mm -hmm. to say the least, like what my sister has mentioned, it's a, big, it's a very big problem. And don't look at it as an isolated issue that affects you. You are a representative of the community there. So therefore, don't look at me as a policeman in the community policing department who can be able to generate answers to all of this. We need to look at where do these people come from in the family center, okay. in the schools, the universities, and many more other influential organizations that can be. Then eventually, mm. we, having identified partners, identified the problem, then we can then be able to seek for means of crime prevention. So, as a result of that, I have used my position to mobilize various communities, part of which is what Dr. Zed say, mentioned. But I want to inform and share with you that I've moved throughout this country, especially reaching out to the districts that host refugees. There are 12 of them, and I've at least visited 99% of both the refugee settlement areas and the host community. There we are, part of those committees, even when I have been there, uh, I mean in, in, in the previous, in the half part of the morning where I was, I found some of them and they were reminding me of what I've done. But Thank most you. important is to ensure that we empower the community so that the community can be able to be very decisive and very vigilant in ensuring that we prevent together all of these acts mm -hmm. and ensure that any information that we get 
is mm. vital for our security. I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, SP Mure Terwa, uh, for a very detailed um, submission. As you sit down, you, I want you to reflect that's in the next round of, uh, of questions, if we have time. Uh, the November 16th um, incident in this country, uh, which uh, two bomb blasts, which you attributed to domestic or urban terrorism, and then the crackdown on uh, a group of, uh, of people in our society. Uh, so, so reflect about that, and we wa want to hear some of the initiatives you have in place as a head of community policing to deal with this issue. But now let me move to, to Mebo. So Mebo to Egumie, we've, uh, uh, we know the work you've been doing. But looking at the theme of today, which focuses on uh, withering the tide of insecurities and pandemics, you are a journalist. And um, COVID-19 made our work very difficult as journalists. I'm a journalist myself. Made our work very difficult. This was when the issue of fake news became very prominent in the three manifestations of fake news. Disinformation, misinformation, including malinformation. In the, your work, day-to-day -day work, uh, covering the pandemic, the, 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 the people you invite on your show. Can you kindly share with us uh, how your role as a journalist has played uh, in framing the story about the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, but also, maybe you might want to reflect also on tell us, not just how, 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 how the, the framing of the story has been, uh, but some of the criticisms that uh, you have um, you have uh, interfaced with from the public about the way we covered COVID-19. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tayewa. For I think for the first time, I feel like I'm not in your class. <laughs> 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 so thank you so much also uh, for the opportunity. This uh, time I'm in, I'm in your class. <laughs> fellow panelists and uh, all present uh, protocol observed. To Professor Achihire, I think I'll give you a third call after I leave this place about hosting you and people in power. And it's good to report you to your fellow people that she actually turned me down. <laughs> and yet, uh, when I look at my uh, career, for the reasons as to why I joined uh, media, I love people's stories. Positive thinking, I personally believe that it yields positive results and it's why I host the people that I host. And if you've watched People and Power in particular, I'm usually very selective on the people that I bring and of course the stories behind their success. At times some of these people actually have never seen the blackboard, but yet they are successful. So meaning out there in the society that we live, there are people that are struggling either with education for this particular faculty, I remember I've hosted Professor Ruth Mukama. And if you know Professor Ruth Mukama's story, having been actually the first woman uh, professor in this country, those are stories that inspire people. So I'm usually very strategic. When you host a person like Dr. Sam Lutalo, who is the first African, first deaf African to actually have a PhD in linguistics, you wonder how does a deaf person acquire uh, a, a, a PhD in linguistics if they actually can't talk and they can't hear. But then you also think of the deaf community out there that is actually trying to strive to get, uh, you know, to be successful in society. So I'll be coming to you again and I pray you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the pandemic, uh, if I start with that, Dr. Taiwan, to all of us, I think it tested uh, the media in terms of its social contract and social uh, responsibility. Yet at the same time, it was giving media an opportunity to either redefine the landscape or even reconstruct the narratives 
and probably maybe at the end of it all, uh, revamp its image. Did it do this? <laughs> were there challenges? Of course, there were very big challenges. And if we all go back to the onset of COVID-19 and the subsequent uh, lockdowns, I would say media, not speaking uh, specifically for next media services or NBS television or the Nile Post, which I work for, but generally across the media circles, it played a pivotal role as the conveyors of information. But what we need to remember is that at the onset of the uh, COVID-19 and lockdown, this information was government tailored. These were messages that were actually coming in from government. And if you remember, depending on which media platform you were actually watching this information, if it were NBS television, there were disruptions of normal programming for COVID-19 messages, whether they were within the country, across the continent, or even beyond borders on infections, on deaths, on hospitalizations. For example, at NBS TV, I think you're very popular with the happening now. Not that it started during COVID-19, but it's usually a bumper that comes in to interrupt normal programming if there's actually uh, something that is happening within the communities. And then, of course, we had the COVID-19 updates that were specifically informing on uh, the number of deaths or the hospitalizations, and that was usually uh, either between 4.30 in the afternoon or 8.30 uh, p.m. That is before our live at 9. And if you remember still on the onset, all the news was specifically about COVID-19, but from the red flags of what is happening. And Dr. Tewa, you asked about the challenges, and I think with that at the beginning, the media I can say we were guilty because we were carrying the government message, I'm sorry to say, but it was message of doom. Mm -hmm. If you don't do this, this is going to happen. If you don't follow the SOPs, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So the message was packaged around stay at home. So then one wonders what else was happening aside from the red flags mm. following the COVID-19. And we started seeing stories of recovery, stories of hope, or media bring out these stories of hope, actually after there were uh, victims that were being discharged uh, from hospitals. So I say the challenge was for us to go within the communities and actually get those people stories of how they were being affected mm. by COVID-19, or actually what the prophet of doom, which was government message, was actually doing to the people. There was a lack of, for example, stories on how people were actually dealing with COVID-19. For example, there was lots of uh, using concoctions, and people were actually healing and curing. But yet, the messages that were packaged by, by media, mostly from government, were not flagging or championing concoctions independently from media. So maybe later as we look at the limitations as to why, then it will explain why media today is losing uh, its, uh, its dependency. Mm. Uh, thanks very much, Mebo. Um, if, yeah, yes, please. Uh, if you could, um, if you could uh, relate what you've said to the current topic that we are dealing with in the media. That is terrorism, yeah. the, the recent attacks uh, in your coverage and how basically as a media scholar, mm -hmm. your observations on how the terrorism story has been, um, has been covered. W what are your takeaways? How, 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 do you, how do you think we've fared as media? Okay. My takeaways mainly, I think, uh, could also result from the knowledge gap. Because mm -hmm. terrorism itself mm. wears different faces mm. in terms of the features that it does wear. For instance, can the population know uh, from your profiling of terrorism as police that actually this is a terror suspect? Because personally, I feel that as media, we also carry the government message of who they tag as a terror a terrorist. So in this case, if uh, probably all that is coming up in the news 
is tagged on Muslims as suspects? Does it fit the profiling? And that profiling, how has the police actually given it to the community? For them to be able to identify, she was talking about the, the killings of women, that for example, the police is dealing with the LC community and uh, there's a particular profile of how the communities can actually identify, even if it's new people that have come into the community, that maybe they carry those features of a violent past and I think even as government, that is where, or even the police, that is where the big gap is on the knowledge. But also the media, in terms of our library mm -hmm. and archiving of information, or even how we package mm -hmm. uh, certain news stories, does it only stop within the news bulletins? Mm -hmm. Do we have special reports on actually some of uh, these stories when it comes to the, ter uh, the, the terror suspects that have actually been arrested? Do we go back to hear the stories of the aggrieved people or does it actually stop at a press conference where police says that this is a terror suspect or actually they were killed in action? Do we go back to follow up these stories so that we balance, and this also happened even during uh, the, the pandemic, because the stories were actually not balanced. And I feel even when it comes to media, that is where the biggest gap is in balancing up these stories. Mm. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Mebo. Thank you. Um, now, you, of course, um, I had wanted you to, to turn the mic, mic to him, but I think he, he spoke for a very long time. Uh, because I wanted this conversation to go on, but you've noted what he, she has said. Uh, so maybe if we have time, then you'll be able to respond to that. Now let's um, go to Mr. Huntington Bujingo. As um, we started this session, we played several clips produced by Mr. Bujingo and his amazing um, company, Fan Factory. Um, the message is very obvious, Mr. Ojingo, right? To, to most of us, the message that you are, you are putting there is very obvious. Uh, I would have wanted to ask you a question from the media effects um, perspective. For instance, uh, how has been the, the reception by the public of these messages? If you know, if you, you keep your ear to the ground. But uh, I think let, let's you keep that at the back of your mind and you can respond to that. But maybe let's uh, just go to the lessons picked in your work and the role of um, performing arts, uh, specifically on the theme of today, which is um, uh, withering the tide of insecurities and pandemics. In your case, you work a lot with pandemics. Maybe that's what you could speak to. So, so why, don't we, why don't we just uh, move with that one, Mr. Bujingo? Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, all protocol observed. I want to thank you for giving me the honor to be here. And I'm very privileged because uh, I'm uh, a son of this uh, great university. I was at the same uh, school with uh, Lillian. She was a year ahead of me doing the bachelor's degree in drama, which I successfully did with the second uh, class upper degree. Um, I'll start my submission with a statement from Shakespeare that he said that the world is all a stage and all of us are players and we have different roles. We have entries and exits. And that's exactly why we are here. We have a police a commissioner, we have a journalist, we have a poet, we have a comedian, a dramatist. But Uganda in particular, all African countries in particular, don't have refused to understand that statement. That the world is a stage and everyone, whether a kid, because even in that poem, there are seven stages of a human being, when you are a, a, a toddler, when you grow up, and even, so there are different other stages, and everyone contributes to it. So in particular elements of pandemics or uh, uh, terrorism like we have, it's very hard for a police person to stand there and uh, say a message either on TV to convince people. And that has been our dilemma as a nation. The police will insist, there will be the Inanka will talk, but he will get all the time, the president will come and talk on all TVs and tell people, oh, I will speak at eight, but no one is listening. And they have refused to accept that they only can play their roles. They, uh, they want to play every role, which they can't do. And that is why we, we, uh, we did what we did. What we did was funded by MasterCard Foundation. MasterCard Foundation is an international organization. 
but the government here didn't see us as potential powerful people who can disseminate this information. They went and ran away, went to Bad Black, then they had issues with her, she was complaining, then they went everywhere, uh, went everywhere. The message was not being nailed. People were dying, COVID was still being spread and everything. So we went and did the first video, which is called Yambala Mask. It was commissioned by uh, Tuaweza, I saw an NGO. It was also, they didn't pay us actually a lot of money, they just paid us for production. So it was a proactive project that we did because we knew no one in this country can communicate anything about terrorism, about AIDS, and HIV more than us. We went to Makere that down in those trees we started from. We know no one can beat us at that, but they never listen. So we decided to do our things. We partnered with uh, Tuaweza and they funded the thing, and we did. That video went viral on the internet. The Massacre Foundation in the, at Atlanta saw it. So they were seated, you know, they always have like a, thousands of people on Zoom because that time they are not meeting. So when they played that video, everyone was touched internationally in Zoom and they asked who are those people? And are they signed? And they told them the fan factory, the Ugandan outfit commander and said they're not. So they contacted me and Richard. I said, no, we're available to work. We negotiated money, they paid us handsomely well. And we did that song. It was not only played in Uganda, it was played in Africa and it trended in Africa. Because we used to sit in meetings with the uh, people in Zambia, Tanzania, where Zoom to evaluate, and we evaluated weekly. Even right now, the project is still running. And it has changed the way things are done about communication. And we pray that also the people who are here, or the government people who are here, should take it upon themselves. Because Uganda has a lot of talent across all divides, not only acting football, but because our systems don't understand the things we do. They think we're jokers. They think some, even some of them get shocked when I tell them I have a bachelor's degree in drama. So, what did they, so I, I shocked them. But we also did this deliberately because it was hard by the time I started at the university with Lydian 15 years ago. Even my parent, when I told her I was doing a bachelor's degree in drama, my, my mom cried because I was on government. She, she couldn't envision. Even my girlfriend left me. Uh, Lydia knows the girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, Lydia knows, knows her. Because we were in the same class, she didn't see a dream that we would be who we are. We used to dream, like with Bobby Wine, I, I was in the same year, but he was doing a diploma. We were there. We used to dream. We used to say we would be who we are right now. Does she now want to come back? Uh, yeah, she wanted, but she didn't have a chance. I, I married another one long 12 years ago. <laughs> so we, we, we knew, because us creatives are the most clever people in any nation. That's why you see in developed countries, yeah, Th that is proven because what I do, I keep changing. I act ev new stuff every Thursday. I go to Ms. Gospel, I, I don't repeat. But the professors here studied the same things and teach the same things all their careers. <laughs> no, in, in due respect, no, no, not, not in a bad way. So, <laughs> but <laughs> that is a joke. <laughs> so don't take offense. <laughs> no message received. <laughs> so, what I'm trying to drive at home is we should take the world as a stage and we should respectfully know that everyone has a lot to contribute and respect them in their contributions. That's where we're here. And I will, Madam Principal, uh, Professor, I offered myself to the Department of Performing Arts and I told them we didn't have a chance 15 years ago to be talked to in lecture rooms by the creatives who were there then. And I offered myself, and I can even mobilize other people. Because the world has changed. We have power out there that you people don't have. Uh, 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 we have power. I, I could have more power than the chancellor of this university because of social media. The world changed when social media came. That's why you see Bobby Wine is the way, who he is. It's mainly because of social media. So we need to come together, especially the university and the creatives and uh, the humanities who come and see. Now you see that's why Bad Black is influencing <laughs> for other universities. Bad Black who didn't even go bad because she has the power online. So how can we tap and harness that power online with the academicians, with the academics here to make sure that we change things because whatever you're teaching people, they are not relevant in where we are. Whatever you're teaching right now is outdated because that is what I was taught 15 years ago. So what you're teaching now, and, uh, and I was taught, even people who were taught 40 years ago, are the same things that change, and yet the markets have all changed. That is why we, 
did the, the, the things we did and we're still doing. Because we look at things in a different way and exits because everything we see, whether it's terrorism, whether it's uh, um, COVID, we can get a funny way of telling those stories and people will laugh at themselves and eventually they will do what we are telling them to do. But if you tell them, oh, put on your mask, way, corona is going to get you, defiantly a human being will rebel. Because if the message is too traumatic and every time he's hearing like the president is there, that we used to get to those eight o'clock summons, there are times we even didn't want to watch TVs. And we removed and said, what is he going to say? Ah, I don't want to hear. But for them, they were insisting that always, say, all national TVs or radios are broadcasting the same person uh, the other Saturday, eight hours. No one is going to listen, even a kid will run. But if you come and speak with you because of the experience and tell me, you know what? Because that is why you see every, the first one is called Yambala Mask because that was the, 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 the target they wanted us to tell people. Yambala, 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 and we are telling them, doing comedy and everything. Then the other thing was now, the mask there, the mask cannot help you if you don't look after yourself. The second song is called Weku Maweka. So even if you're not there, then now we went on because we are doing phases. Then the others, the trend started coming of people now going, doing house parties at homes, calling their friends and they drink at home. And then COVID started now hitting them from their homes because they are doing parties indirect because everything was closed. So we did, Corona will catch you. And that's why you see we act in a house party, you know, we are home, people are partying and everything, but we're having fun, but cautiously, yeah? Then the fourth video or song is called Mask Etered. It's what we just launched, I think, uh, a month ago. It's called Etered because we are getting ready for the omni uh, virus that will come in because uh, it, we are emphasizing vaccination, masks, uh, uh, putting on masks still, and quite a lot of things. So in a nutshell, what I'm saying is the creatives which many times these nations uh, dismiss or demarginalize or anything, are the focal points of every generation or nation that move cultures. That's why you see America is taking over the world or took over the world. It's because of Hollywood. Nothing else. It's not, it's not, it's not about the atomic bombs. It's not about anything. No. It's Hollywood that has made America the superpower that it is. The, the superstars, the John Rambos you grew up seeing, the Schwarzeneggers and everything. So technically, you grow up seeing America as everything. So that Schwarzenegger, you can, can take over everything. And of course, they have the other protections. But what I'm saying is we have to embrace our cultures, especially the creatives across the divide, the poets, the film people, the comedians, the dramatists, the painters, and all the things. Because we have different talents that the normal cities never have. We see things at different angles and we interpret things in a different way that a normal society can't know. I'm, uh, I'm on a very, very big battle with Pastor Bujingo online. I've been everywhere. People are calling me to share my views because I'm the only one who is standing up to talk to him about what he's doing. And yet he thinks he's right because he has a media house and he has everything. He will go and flip around everything because now Ugandans, he has protection from the government. Then they will not tell him anything. But we look at things differently. We say, if you said this, because he was preaching against polygamy when uh, when a, a, a pastor, uh, um, the one of Kingdom Radio was getting mar uh, uh, divorced and married, the second Chiganda, he's the one who was attacking him the most. Eh, but now he has flipped and he's burning the Bible. No one is talking to him and he's, he's just fine. So everyone, even police is protecting him, the military is protecting him. But we can't let that go as a society. So these are the things that we have to be, including especially with the academicia and, mm. academ and academics. Involve us. We are normally mm. creative and intelligent people. We can dis. Information and do it. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you very much, sir. Um, the, the issue of Pastor Bujingo is it because uh, your name is at stake? <laughs> <laughs> that is partly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Bujingo. Now uh, I'm going to open up the, the floor very shortly so that we can have everyone into this conversation, this amazing conversation. But um, patience, you talked for a very short time. Eh? Uh, you never had uh, as much time as uh, the, your colleagues, so I want to give you your five minutes. Eh? And in those five minutes, uh, if you could kindly... Wanji? If you could kindly speak to Mbaganiri. Um, Mbaganiri. Mebo, the thing is Mbaganiri, not Mbaganiri. Hmm? Uh, which is a, a podcast for African folk tales, but you could also say a little bit more about some of these projects that you have in store. You have so many projects going on. It's amazing what you are doing. Uh, if you could speak a little bit more to those projects and what you want to achieve, 
um, with those projects, and then uh, we open uh, we open the the conversation uh, to everyone else. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, Mbagana started at the beginning of the pandemic when we could not gather, and I'm a person who grew up in a big family. I come from a very big extended family, and I loved growing up with my aunties and my uncles and having stories. I know so many folk tales from my uncles and my aunties, and I realized we were, the pandemic provided an opportunity for us to reflect on people who don't speak their mother tongue. I have friends, I'm sure there are people in this room whose children do not speak their mother tongue. I had cousins who would go home and they're like, how are you, Nya and I'm like, what, what are you saying? You know, you're going to the village and you're greeting your grandparents, and even if they speak English, I find it's not proper. And also talking about decolonization, I feel like we love English so much that we speak it so well, we write it so well, and we know nothing about our local languages. We wore bones in school for speaking our local languages. Exactly. So, you know, I was trying to sort of like recreate that fireplace tradition of sitting with your aunties and your uncles and your grandparents, which we, we didn't have in the pandemic, but we don't have most of the time. Even when the country opens up now, we don't really have time to sit together with, you know, our whole extended family. So Mbagani was a, an effort to recreate that tradition that I love so much of telling stories in our local languages. It's open to all African languages, but we also translate the folk tales into English. So some of the first stories that we told, they were told to me by my mother, my aunties, um, my uncles. And so the, the purpose of that podcast, which we, we were lucky to get a little funding from Africalia to just launch it, and then you know just visit communities um, and especially in the pandemic because we didn't have uh, a chance to visit then you could just log in online you can just go to the website and listen with your kids and listen with your family um, and so yeah it was sort of like that effort to present the stories and preserve them also for the future because i think one of the things that's happening to us recently uganda was named as the most English-speaking country on the continent, and people were celebrating, the, like, and people were, some of them were fighting, no, it can't be Uganda, it has to be Kenya or South Africa or something. And Ugandans were like defending it so much, but for me it seemed like we were celebrating how colonized we are, because we, we speak English so much that we, we, we've forgotten what, who we are as a people. And, and then we come to defend culture in places where it's harmful, and yet in places where it should be celebrated, like our languages, we don't. So um, I'm very passionate about that, and so um, Bagana is sort of like that effort that's um, there to sort of r r celebrate our cultures, our languages, but also preserve some of that storytelling structure. Because, you know, like Bujingo was saying, a lot of our stories are very influenced by Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, if you watch our TV stations, the stories that are there are all, you know, Hollywood stories or, you know, s uh, Spanish uh, operas and stuff, mm -hmm. um, soaps. So um, I wanted to remind us that storytelling is not mm -hmm. just Western. Mm -hmm. It's in our, our DNA. Our, our grandparents told stories, mm -hmm. very outlandish stories, very, very beautiful stories. And right now, if you tell people, let's write a story, the, the thing they go to is, oh, what, what's Hollywood doing? How's Hollywood doing it? Um, and yet we have, I feel like as Africans, we have so much to teach the world, but we're so, I think because of colonization, we're so timid about our knowledge. Mm -hmm. We're so, um, we're shy about the things we offer the world. We don't want to say them out loud. We want to be like, okay, let's listen to what the West is saying, you know? Even when like, for instance, in this COVID era, you know, we're looking for solutions. We're only looking to the West and those are the only solutions we're celebrating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm interested to know like, what did our ancestors have to offer? And right now the interesting thing is, if you say the word ancestors, people are like, ah, oh, that's demonic, that's, you know, <laughs> They, they want to believe the colonial religion so much mm -hmm. that, you know, everything that stands for who our people were is, is barbaric, is evil, is, is 
demonized. And so for me, it's important that as a, a, a people that are embracing education and embracing Western science and Western knowledge, mm -hmm. we also recognize that we had sometimes better knowledge that we left behind for Western knowledge. And, and, and so we ought to, in our studies as well, also like study backwards sometimes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. look for that ancient knowledge that we don't get to see a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, powerful, <laughs> powerful, powerful. Okay, thank you very much, uh, patience. Um, let's now turn the conversation to <coughs> including Alhaji Alazewa. Uh, there might be people online, uh, if they, they want to engage in the conversation, please monitor that for us. But let's start with um, the ones, yes. I almost wanted to pick you, by the way, um, uh, Dr. Cindy Magara. When, when she was speaking, I thought about Professor DiPio and what she was telling us in the previous session. Did you hear, you know? And then I thought, about uh, Dr. Sinde Magara, so please, uh, I saw your hand. It was Dr. Sinde Magara here, and then the gentleman at the back. And then, is that Dr. Spire Sentongo? My eyes uh, are following my gray hair, but I think that's Dr. Spire Sentongo. Yes, very good. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and thank you so very much to our panelists. We are so impressed. Um, I'll just speak from what um, patient said. We were chatting with Lillian. It's as if she was here in the morning to listen to Professor DPO speaking. And that's really the way to go. Um, in, um, they, they call it the Sankofa approach. And Sankofa, Sister DPO didn't talk about it. It's a, a, a bird. It's a symbol in the can culture of a bird um, standing like the way a hen can be. And the head is twisted backwards. So that is the Sankofa approach, a return to source approach. They've theorized it as such in, in film, and we really do need to go back to the basics, return to source, see what we can pick from our traditional knowledge. I just completed my PhD in, um, in film, in film studies. I looked at East African cinema, now talking to as a filmmaker and all of you as creative and people communicating using media, and film is just that one media we choose. And after doing a lot of uh, interrogating all the theories, I said, well, look, I'm looking at African stories. Why would I use a, a foreign theory? I mean, I'm looking at African films. Why would I look at a foreign theory to interpret them? I'm going to create, to develop my own theory. After all, at a PhD level, you create theories. I developed a theory I called the griot aesthetic. And Dip Dominic DiPio, professor, talked about the griot. That is a storyteller to just look at how how did these traditional storytellers, um, okay, how did they develop the stories? What was the structure of this story? How about I use that structure, analyze the drama, analyze the kids coming out, uh, analyze the movies. Um, is that a compliment or, uh, <laughs> or even a question? So anyway, it was just burning. The issue here was uh, picking up from Bujingo, the industry meets the academy. When we were thinking, about that title that um, um, Dr. Sekito, Lilian, and myself came up with, we had a whole lot of titles. Um, our principal and the team, they just threw this to us. We're like, think about this. At this point in time, where it's as if the humanities have been put on the defensive, we are defending ourselves to show how relevant we are. We are trying to tell this guy, who is a humanities person, a self-proclaimed historian, that we are extremely important. And if you thought maybe the arts are not important, you would have given the presidency to BCG a scientist. He's not even thinking about it. So anyway, <laughs> that, that is an outside. Um, we really thought, had so many uh, titles to deal with. And one of them was, OK, let's bring the, let's take the academy to the people, or let the people come to the academy. I happen to have taught at the University of Sydney where I was studying from. Um, of course, at that level, you're just tutoring. But you would realize for every course, be it introduction to film studies, they'll bring the practitioners to class. Uh, yeah, they'll bring the practitioners to class. They'll bring various um, um, uh, academicians from, from different schools. If you're going to do film, they'll bring someone from music to talk to you about 
music. Uh, they'll bring someone from literature or really the, the, the narrative bit of it. And that is the approach we really do need to take. And we have a lot of our students who, are, who can come and do that, as he said. So uh, our dear deans, yeah, I'm, I'm just, um, I think. And, I and for free even. <laughs> you know. Um, even if it was for something small, but they are really willing. They all believe this is something that we all should develop. So thank you so much, Bujingo, for bringing it out, and I'm sure all these guys have, <laughs> have had, and that is the approach we should take. Um, then the other day, this is just and I said, forgive me for talking too much. I've not been talking. <laughs> the other day I was, um, I met one of my mentors, Dr. Susan Chuglio, and the way she's like, ah, Cindy, you're very smart. I told her, do you know what, SK? Um, we call her SK because in my department we don't want these titles, the formalities of doctor, CG professor, we are all initials, I'm ECM. <laughs> SK, um, when you go to the corporate world, these, the Mebo to are smart, my friend. And us in academia, it's as if the job we are doing is so stressful that we all look so unkempt and all sorts of things. And how are we going to inspire these students to know that what we are doing is cool? So for me, I do the teaching and I do the inspiration. Let these kids I'm teaching know teaching is cool. You can be a hottest lecturer, you know? Um, so anyway, we really do need to rethink our approaches to doing so many things. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you so very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Magara. You uh, totally agree with you. Uh, yeah, you can give it to Dr. Spire, he's nearer there than uh, the gentleman at the back. Thank you, thank you, Cindy. Uh, powerful words. Yeah, thanks so much, Chair, and um, the entire panel. That's been quite interesting. I can relate with much of what you have been saying, especially in terms of as a beneficiary. Uh, when Mebo talks about people and power, I'm one of the people who have benefited from that. I remember after featuring on our program, I got so many people getting to, to me asking about my publications, my work, and um, this relates to the entire theme. Much of what we do is unknown because we stick to traditional methods of dissemination, which do not reach out to the people, which do not put into consideration the context where we are publishing, where we are disseminating knowledge. Uh, there, there is a colleague I once tried to interest to be interviewed on a certain TV station. They asked me, uh, do you know of anyone who can be interviewed about this particular theme? I thought it was in his area. And he told me, no, me and media? Mm -mm, I'm not a media person. And inside I was asking myself, then what are you producing knowledge for if you're media shy? So this should be an invitation to us to think more, to reflect more on how we generate knowledge and our interest in making that knowledge reach out there. Uh, when I published that book, Quarantined, and uh, my friend Huntington Bujingo featured, he took a picture. Uh, I don't know whether he was just acting as if he was reading the book or he was really <laughs> reading. <laughs> and within a short time, given that he has huge following on social media, I had so many people sending me messages asking about the book. So as he says, indeed it's true uh, that some of them have a lot of following that we can take advantage of. It should be more of complementarity. What they don't have, they can get from us, but we should also be able to appreciate uh, what they have on their side. We still have so many academics that despise social media. So many who will even see you on Facebook and they say, what are you doing on Facebook? Yet this is someone who has so many publications who are only known to them, uh, which are only known to them and a few colleagues. So I don't think it still makes sense in this era to despise social media or those who are there. Sometimes the ones who are there are people we despise, maybe for certain reasons which could be legitimate, but that does not make the forum in itself bad or that does not make it wrong to go through those people. But having said that, having passed the compliments, my small question, uh, I would have asked everyone, but just to, uh, to let others ask too. Huntington said uh, that all what we are teaching is not relevant. Uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to test how grounded that statement is. 
Huntington, what am I teaching? Huntington. Uh, so, okay, so, so, yes, the gentleman at the back, uh, Huntington, Dr. Sentong wants to know. Uh huh. Yes, uh, the gentleman at the back, let's take that. I'm called Asimwe Zitoni John Bosco. I want to ask some few questions to Afande SP, Anatori. You are heading community policing, and we have so many issues within the community. And one of which, which I want to bring forward before you, our brothers, the border border cyclists, they are part of our community within Kampala. They are many and a problem to motorists, sometimes even as you are driving. They have turned to be an insecurity to the country in one way or another. And I know border border cyclists, they pay tax. And they are entitled also to use these roads in Kampala. Recently, I was watching one of the countries near, near in Uganda, and one police traffic officer stopped them on a junction and was teaching them how to use those junctions and how to follow those big arrows within the road, teaching the motorcyclists what they are supposed to do. We in Uganda, we are having a crisis. As police, what initiative are you taking to be able to help to teach these, these border border cycles how to use the roads? Where to stop and not to stop? When do you enter a roundabout and when are you supposed to stop? I know they are young men. Many of them have not been taught. Okay. But police, you have a responsibility. Mm of which you can teach these young men how to use these roads. Mm. We have a big problem of unemployment within the country. And many of them, some of them have finished even their degrees, but because of lack of unemployment, they are using border, some of them in Kampala, mm. others up country in the districts. Okay. I think that point is made. So the you other, said you had another one? Yes. The last one, please. It is on the issue of lack of professionalism within the police. Okay. On several occasions, I've been working within the city of Kampala. I've seen police officers arresting those border border young men okay. unprofessionally. Okay, it is still on border border. Uh, Kale, thank you very much. Let me finish, oh, okay. uh, make up a sum, a okay. summer of my last point. Mm. One was at Constitution Square, one of the evening when I was going back. Mm -hmm. A policeman comes and he, he removes the key of a border border cyclist. And I was nearby there. I begged him, officer, just talk to him polit politely and please tell him what he has done wrong and tell him how to do the right thing. It is one thing, thing to be a professional in education. It is another thing to exercise your professionalism. I come in a fa from a family whereby I think 85% of my relatives are within the military, as military officers. And I've worked with them, I've interacted with them, highest being at the level of Major General. They have the ability to refrain themselves as military men. Okay. What Kale. is it happening? Why is it there is, is there a crisis within the curriculum of police training mm. in Masindi? That's mm -hmm. what I want to find out as time goes by. Okay. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I find that you've uh, got those questions. Uh, microphone here to Professor Shire. Oh, you have one, yeah. Have Professor, one. please. Let me stand before they ask me about the curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> um, so proud of you, our alumni. And I'm just thinking that as we now look at celebrating Makera at 100, we should have a choose day, and this panel should come back. And of course, when the big person talks, you, you, you accept. So, Cindy. <laughs> uh, I wanted to first respond to Mabel. <laughs> uh, Mabel made several attempts. And I told her, you know, Mabel, I am a person who 
I don't like sitting there and talking about myself. If you could give me a topic, any topic that you think I'm competent to talk about. We are going to work on that, maybe. I, <laughs> so I think, just as you said, we are wired differently. Yeah. And we have different competencies which can, you know, uh, which we can harmonize and bring together. I think that's something we can work on um, as long as, you know, it is not about, oh, you see, now I went to a good school, da, 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 da. I, I know that you have good stories and I've followed them. Uh, but maybe I've been a disappointment. Uh, but I'll give you other women to talk to that are very there on top. Uh, she hasn't lost hope. Anyway, we, but I'm, I'm we are so going to proud. work on that, Mabel. We are, we are mm. very proud as. as if Jews. I respond to that just briefly, and I think it's something Mr. Jimmy Spire talked about. Most of the time, uh, audiences complain as to why there's gender imbalance when it comes to media content mm -hmm. across, whether it's television or radio. And I've experienced this. Women do not want to give interviews. And that is a fact. And actually, one of you people here can actually do research because it's really affecting empowerment. Yeah. They do not want to give interviews. Each and every one of us here has a story, but it Ooh. hasn't been told. And amazing research, too. Thank Professor you has so amazing much. research. Exactly. Women, have you had? Uh, <laughs> we, have, we have her. <laughs> And I think, because anyway, probably I'll add on later, and people need to hear these stories, whether they're about COVID-19 or whether they're about personal stories, because it's the same stories that bring out the social causes that have brought us here today. If it's a story of a deaf, a, a deaf PhD holder, it's through his story yeah. that we'll hear about the pl a plight of the deaf community. It's, uh, I, can, I cannot even add on that. So I'll still need to host you when people want to ask. <laughs> so just, just actually, program her which day. Actually, and then we'll work I'm, on I'm, that. I've just tweeted that we are in class and that our alumni have taken us back to class. <laughs> <laughs> and we are learning. Uh, and I think you are making very powerful um, submissions that we need to take seriously. Uh, Sam, Huntington, I told uh, people somewhere that I'm going to meet Sam. They said, really? <laughs> the one of Mzigo Express. And somehow, the, the roles that he acts there are so, you know, this very low, low person the ones whom everybody laughs at, the ones who, the one who makes very unserious submissions, the one who, so the role that he plays there, I wanted to map it on Huntington Bujingo. And I think you've awakened us, uh, maybe um, what you are really saying is that we need to be real in our curriculum, in our interventions, in our teaching as a college, because our field of humanities must be connected to society. And I think you have made a very passionate uh, kind of appeal that we shall need to take seriously as, as a college. Uh, and then, um, if patients had been here in the morning, would have grabbed you and put you on the earlier panel. Because the issues about us as Africans, the way we've treated our history, the way we've treated our culture and our language, we have a responsibility. It's not going to be anybody else, it is us. And I think those are really powerful uh, statements that all of you are making here today. Uh, I think uh, I feel sorry about how we treat police because they are part of an establishment and somehow maybe it's the ugly face 
that comes through police. But actually, when you have a problem, the first institution that you interface with, again, that you, you know, feel that can help, is the same police. And I've always wondered, how can police, how can individuals and collectives in police redeem their name and be able to also put their story back to stories? Their story on the board to say that actually, you know, you are saying all this about police, but actually, maybe it is the only institution that could be effective. And our voices, uh, you people that are out there, would like you to continue um, making demands on us as a college in terms of what we teach and how it should serve society. So for me, I didn't have uh, a question directed to anybody, but I thought maybe Huntington, you had gone a little bit, you, you wanted to elaborate on uh, what you said, uh, and I think we'll take that really in uh, good faith as we build for the future. We are starting another century of Makara University, so we need these conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hichire. Uh, I think you've... Uh, you, you, you wanted to respond to yes, Dr. Spire. Yes, yes, but before that, okay. let's get uh, Lillian and Chris. Chris to Hairirwe. Those two only. Uh, the one at the back, I can't see who that is. I see a hand, but I can't. Oh, you Zaidi? Is that Zaidi? Where is, where is Dr. Z uh, Zaidi? What do you want to wait there? Okay, so, so Dr. Zaidi Sechito is here in many ways, a fundy. He's in many, in many capacities. Sorry, Lillian, I'm coming to you, dear. Uh, uh, so, so Dr. Sechito, you will follow up the question I asked a fundy, but from the perspective of you as a researcher, as a scholar, who has done your research on the topic of terrorism. That was your PhD. You should be, this is, we have people here. Yeah? You invite this man to really do, give you very good lectures about these issues. So, so uh, Dr. Sekito, I will want you to ask uh, in your capacity as a scholar, a question that I had posed, but you put it in better words uh, for a fund, and then we end there. Because uh, we have, um, how many, 10, 15 minutes? Uh, 10 minutes to go. Lillian. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, mine is to first uh, appreciate the panelists for accepting to come home. Uh, not many times do parents uh, raise children and uh, the children remember their parents. So we don't take that for granted. <laughs> Uh, we know that it is African culture that children will always go back home, but of late, things are different. You're very busy people, you have a lot to do, but when we reached out to you, you really accepted and you have generously shared your experiences with us. And I'm particularly uh, very fascinated about uh, Mr. Bujingo Huntington's um, information that he's willing to come in to contribute and I think as Makere, this is a call to all of us. Let us really make these spaces accessible to the industry experts. And they know what is happening. Instant changes, they know them. We know what we know, but I think the synergies are very important. And like uh, our principal has ably demonstrated, you can't afford to be in the humanities and you stay away from people. That means you're in the wrong place. Humanities are for people, and we have that call. So thank you very much. Now, um, I have a question that uh, goes to Assistant Commission of Police, Anatoly, and uh, it's good that you are in uh, community policing. Uh, I come from a background of applied theatre, using theatre in communities to benefit people in the communities, 
to benefit people who don't have the advantage to access commercial theater mm -hmm. or to come to the theater spaces that are, main, uh, that are mainstream. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at police today, I think this doesn't need a lot of telling that police has a lot of work to do to change the attitudes of the people, of the citizenry, about them. We've seen so many running battles between people and police, and sometimes they're very scary. I was uh, in uh, 2020 caught up in the November riots, and that shook me. I was caught in Maya, who are coming from a burial in uh, Barara, mm -hmm. and police literally abandoned us because the people overpowered them. They were throwing stones, and they took off. And the question to me was, why do we see this? I think we know why we see that. And my question to you is, since you're in community policing, mm -hmm. to what extent has police tried to engage people from other areas of expertise, for example, the journalists, in a positive way to dialogue on how best we can actually improve our society because the role of police is to keep law and order so to what extent has police engaged journalists? To what extent has police engaged film? To what extent has police engaged people in publishing to change for a better society and to finish all these issues that we see and the big divide that is increasingly growing? And sometimes we worry to what extent this will grow and what the outcome will be. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Lillian uh, Sekito, where are you? Chris? Chris at the back, uh, and then Dr. Sekito, yes. The, and then we end there. <coughs> and and uh, the responses will be quite short as well. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I think let me also direct my question to the SCP, uh, the police officer. Uh, you see, there, is, there seems to be a challenge with the, how, the way how the community perceives the police today. Uh, there is really a very bad image that the police is carrying today. And I've been wondering how best can the police perform its roles today? Today, the community looks at the police as brutal, the police as militarized. You are really no longer friends of the community as you used to be. Uh, today, if uh, a member of the community was to find uh, a murder taking place or an accident having taken place, most likely this person may actually run away from the scene, though he would be the best witness to explain what has happened. Not because he has not seen or she has not seen what has happened, but because he fears the torturous questions that the police is going to subject to him or to her. I'm really wondering, uh, SCP, uh, you are as well the Commissioner for Community po poli Policing, how best do you think you can redeem as leaders in the police? How can you redeem the image of the police? This militarized police, this brutal police, how can you become friends of the community so that you can serve it better? Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Sekito, uh, yeah, by default, your question goes to SCP. Um, it's okay. Thank you very much, Chair. I think I'll ask two questions. One will go to my daughter, Mabel. Hey, Oweda. Zake. Mm. You are now okay. Uh, Mabel, as a media personnel, to what extent has the media stigmatization of uh, terrorism circumvented the real issues surrounding this notion or this thing that has been labeled terrorism? Mm. I think ties in with uh, the earlier question I asked. Mm. Now the second question goes to Afandi. I want you, you may answer as a student because uh, that is your area. Are you the um, co-supervisor? Gojingo talked of uh, 
the world as a stage. Noam Chomsky, I quote, on terrorism he says, everyone is worried how to end terrorism. And then he says, really there is only one way, stop participating in it. War is terrorism. I don't know whether you agree with me or not. To what extent has the police anti-terrorism practices, mechanisms, and the processes resulted in to terrorism itself? And I'll add you another question. Drawing on uh. both the orthodox terrorism theory and the critical terrorism theory, terrorists are not like rebels, not gorillas, and therefore they don't have bases. Not, you are not a police spokesperson. You are not an army spokesperson. Drawing on our presence in the DRC now, are we there to wipe out terrorists who do not have bases? Or we want to create terror cells for them because that is what I understand they do possess. Thank you. Okay, Kali. Um, oh, there is one more. Ah, Dr. Maiga, of course, I can't refuse. Uh, so, uh, yes, Dr. Baiga. Um, uh, Florence Baiga is my name. I want to ask um, the police officer. Um, I would like to know the role or perceived role of the security agencies in uh, this struggle against COVID-19. I've seen your presence in, in, in this uh, situation. I need to understand what the role of the security agencies is in this fight against COVID-19, at least in Uganda. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, there are many questions for you, uh, Afande, but uh, I'm sure you'll find a way of uh, wrapping up in a, a few minutes because I would want, as you do that, you make your final, you know, kind of uh, takeaway. What should be our takeaway from your presence here today? And I will ask everyone to do that. So if you could uh, be brief, that would be appreciated, sir. I thank so much the organizers of this uh, uh, interaction and I'd like to thank you so so much for your imposition in what we as your police do. There is no criminality that you have committed but rather you are causing an accountability to the organization as Ugandans and more so uh, giving it uh, a more, uh, I, I can say, an academia face, because really we need the police to, to interface with academia. You know, uh, I've now learned to fly because you, you know when you learn, when you fly with the doctors, you, you eventually become doctor. Maybe that's what I, I want. So I want to thank you for for this. There were so many issues that were raised against the, I mean, uh, towards by organ, the organization. One is, uh, you know, Doctor, you had previously alluded to the issue of uh, urban terrorism. These are very many issues which really the time that I'm seeing around may not be able to uh, support me. But uh, the issue of urban terrorism are issues that deal with uh, causing fear in uh, people around urban areas or urban centers or in the cities by way of causing such acts that are violent in manner and therefore can lead 
to massive destruction of both property and life, and also leading to loss of uh, uh, revenue in that regard. In this regard, you have seen that in the recent past, these acts have been on the increase in various places. For example, in this period alone, we started having this incident from Pader. For some of you who know Pader, Pader is a, is a, is a, is a, is a town. And the, the first terrorist who was grabbed from there was in a lodge. Then eventually it spread to near my place, when I stay on Salama Road and the other consequent places where we have gotten this. Now, why? You know, there is always a thinking that, you know, the, the magnitude or the effect of a terror act can be felt where there is a, 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 where, where there is a big mass. Two, there is always a lot of attention in urban areas because of uh, the behavior activities that take place here. So we are seeing that uh, some of these people are being attracted because of the number of people, number of activities, and maybe even publicity because they are always in desire for that. So that's why we are seeing this taking place. And uh, because of the vigilance and information that we get from the community, together with the alertness of security agencies, we are seeing some of these issues at least scaling down. Now, the border border cyclists, are they, uh, uh, do we view them as insecurity? We are all elements of insecurity, my brothers and sisters. But it depends on how you can desire to interpret who, you, who, 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 you, who, who is causing insecurity. One, there is nothing to say we are demonizing border borders. But you see, the mode of transportation that are used by these terrorists is majorly uh, border border. And of recent, we have seen that some of these border, border border cyclists, instead of putting their number plate in the right position, desire to bend it. Therefore, that this makes our, our automated system, which can be able to read the number plate, fail. Even our own policemen fail to recognize them because the border border number plates are always bent. So this has been a method that was copied by uh, some of these terrorists, some even of them removing their number plates and as such taking that advantage to. So we have realized that the way to go is to ensure that some of these acts uh, that are practiced by our brothers in that industry are curtailed down. Nobody including me and the other police personnel there, have ever come to demonize the, uh, the, 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 the border border cycle. But it is those very individuals. By the way, I have been rescued five times by border border cycles, just because they know me. But I've been offended ten times and forgiven the border border cycles because I know them. We are all necessary evil in acting towards each other. So, what do we, is it the role of the, the police to teach these people? Now, it happens that in cities like Kampala City, City Authority, the role of causing trade order is meant to be done by the city. And therefore, we as police do the support role. It is the, role, the very city that is supposed to cause even the, the, the stage management in conjunction with the Ministry of Works and Transport. Therefore, we do not have a direct mandate in as far as uh, border, border cyclists and their management is concerned, except that of regulating traffic and the maintenance of law and order. Why do we grab them? You know, the Baganda have a saying, let me tell you. These are very, very good boys, by the way. In terms, of, in terms of behaving, whatever. But I have been personally been knocked down by a border, border cyclist. Why? He had knocked a woman and the woman was lying down. So I was trying to stop him, thinking maybe I was trying to stop a human being who would recognize that another life is about to die, not knowing 
that my own life was also going to be tragedy. Now, these are kind of people we are talking about. Not all of them are civilized. My brother would ask the argument would be good that really we treat them humanely. It is true, but not all of them are civilized. But that does not fail that we should stop there and we should therefore demonize them. We shall continue sustaining our campaign of causing law and order in the industry. Then, lack of professionalism. Yes, my brother, the English say, it takes two to entangle. The policemen we are talking about are not coming from the blue. They come from families. They come from, they come from us. I joined the police when I was uh, above 18 years. And many policemen join when they are above 18 years. There is a lot of social, I mean there is a lot of disharmony in families that where the, which child, the individuals that join the police. I want to tell you, for example, and this is what I've always been telling people. If you send a person who has been stealing chicken using stones and is now going to be armed with a rifle, do you think you are doing yourself a better work? These are the issues that we always face. That any person whom, they want, whom society wants to get rid of, they should push him to the police, to the other security agencies. A person who has been stealing chicken you get a, a, an LOC writing, he's a very faithful, very good, very what, and at the end of the day, the next day, this is the person who begins terrorizing you. Now, do you begin blaming the police? Our nurturing of some of the people whom we are recruiting is a problem. And uh, just like one of you has said, training. It's not all about training. It's all about how are we getting people who join the force. Why wouldn't you, as professionals, desire to join the force and you pick, you send us those whom you think have failed there? Those are the ones you say, uh, You even say, you even say, you, you even know that the, boy, the person is a failure, but you are sending him, again, again, the seke, uwa. <laughs> These are the very people who end up doing that and then. So. We thought you can discipline them. No, 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 no. <laughs> what happens? What happens? Uh, the police as an institution does the training. Mm. And I want to tell you, mm. there is maximum training being conducted against us, but the police does not nurture. Nurture is at school, is at home, is in religious organizations. Mm. So you cannot bring up somebody, a person who has failed to learn how to greet, and you are sending him to join the police. A person who has been breaking plates at home is the one you are sending. A person who has been beating up other people at home is the one you are sending. Now, <laughs> that is all about nature. You can do, you can handle. Now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Professor, thank you on how to redeem the police force. It is all, of, it is all an act of collective responsibility. And I wish to invite you. I wish to invite you. Uh -huh. I, as you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are police personnel, Mm. I want to invite you. It is all about our collective responsibility on seeing mm -hmm. a better image of the force. Because at the end of the day, this force is not named after me. It is not called Muletera Police. It is called the Uganda Police Force. So the force that you need to have, that, that you think is the one which causes more pride in you, is the one that we need to stand together with and ensure that we, 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 we bring up together. But as a department, what are we doing? There are a number of activities. Like I've told you, one of my line activities is that of causing accountability to the police personnel uh, for every action and inaction against the public. And the two, in ensuring that professionalism is held. But you see, these are people who are human beings. Before me, they look angels. And this is what I always tell them. When I talk to them, their faces look very innocent. But let me turn my back against them. The disaster happened. So what we need to do is, can we ensure that we cause accountability mm. on these individual police officers? Mm. Why do we need to do this? And how do we need to do this? We can do it when you know you are role. Role play is very important. Security is not all about me. It's all about us working together. So in order mm. for us to redeem this, one, training is there. We are doing mm. more inductions by, other, by the police force. But at the same time, we are also sensitizing the community to be more vigilant 
to be empowered to ensure that they are able to sort out some, some things, I mean certain problems. Because 90% of the civil cases that are brought to police are realized that can be handled by the, by the LOC, by even you. One time, there was a gentleman, a very rich man, very influential man. He had his son. His son had, he was, he was supposed to have graduated from a career here. But year in, year out, he was being given tuition. He was being given money for hostel, but he was eating it. And he was, I don't know, either sleeping with, sleeping with, I mean, using the money to sleep in lodges and the like. So at the end of the day, when the father wanted to, to look at, I mean, to see the graduation, the, is it called the graduation book? Mm -hmm. When he wanted to have that book for graduation, to see whether his son's name was there, the boy went to NASA to print one and took, and, and took that book to him. So the very morning, the father was very happy, thinking that they were coming together to see with that he, his son graduates. The boy disappeared. So after a while, the man came to police and said, how can I be helped? My son who was supposed to graduate has not graduated. I don't know why, but this is the book. Mm -hmm. I asked him, but honestly, this is the book. He said, yes. Have you ever ascertained that indeed this boy appears in that book as per the records he has presented to you? He said, yes. How did, he come and, how did he come to get the book? I asked him, don't you think the, your boy could have even manufactured this book? He said, how? No, the boy loves me so much. I said, okay. So where is he? I don't you know. I said, okay. <laughs> then I asked him, have you ever seen any single course unit of his where he has presented to you results? He said, by the way. By the way. Now you can imagine. He thinks that that was not part of his duty. So it is a by the way. On serious interrogation, the man even collapsed before me. Yes, that was not a security concern, but my role is to protect life and property. Yeah. So I ended up carrying the man to hospital and then going ahead to counsel him to accept that indeed he parented his son badly. So mm -hmm. these are the issues that we really need to look at if we indeed need to have a stable security, stable families, stable uh, communities where we were. Mm. Finally, there was an issue on terrorism, yes. if you could answer you know, that as we wind up. Very good that he, uh, the suggestion of taking police to into various dimensions, into mm. theatre in order to make, a, uh, make it a point. You see, ordinarily I tell my policemen that we come from the community, we serve the community, at a given time, that uniform will not be with you and it will go back to the community. You need to behave in a way that the community appreciates and loves you, other than the desire to demonize the organization. Because at the end of the day, the organization will deny you. So what you have suggested here is right, but it all goes ahead for you to come up with us to plan for the force and ensure that we move together. But also, one who has said the police is militaristic. Surely, I don't know. Why not the society where we are? The other day, the other day for those of you who read the news, we lost two policemen. In Busunju, two policemen. They were on duty. Somebody has sold, had sold his tomatoes. After selling, those who went to buy tomatoes refused to pay him the money. So he goes to the police to invite the police to come and support him in, a, in, 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 in intervening so that he's paid. Ordinarily, that would be a purely civil matter. But because of the nature of violence that was meted, he decided to engage the police. On going there, what do they do? They hack the police with a gun down. There and then, he goes to meet his creator. What do they do? They grab the gun from the, the dead and shoot the surviving policeman to death. So would you, would you think that that would be an act of militarism of the police or what? You see, what am I trying to bring to your attention? The society has changed and <coughs> so is the nature of crime. Mm. Crime is never usual. Mm. Crime has changed. Crime is very sophisticated. Crime has gone to the level where you can no longer desire to use soft means. 
Yes, soft means are there, especially in committee policy through engagement, but where it requires enforcement through the law and other mechanisms, then you accept minimum or reasonable force. It should be applied. Okay. After all, it is within the law. So I found a very brief ray, if you could touch on the issue of terrorism and we end Now, there. doctor was mm. giving me, Dr. Uh, Sekitu. Sekitu. Mm. Is he giving me your questions for mm. a dissertation? Yeah. <laughs> now, now, in just, in just uh, now, very briefly. Given the way you are harassing <laughs> me to leave the state, what answer can I give you? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. but it is good because I am, I'm, anyway, I'm joking. Because, you know, you know that I am his student. And you know that is the area I'm writing about. Uh, mm. I may not be able to divulge into what I'm discussing with him over this, but mm. I would like to say is that it is our commitment mm. to fight against terrorism because terrorists live within us, mm. are part and parcel of our brothers. One asked, surely how can a policeman be able to detect whether this one is a, a terrorist or not? It is quite difficult, but it depends on how you study the routine about that person. Once you study the routine, then you can be able to depict some queer behavior, and then you can be able to begin identifying those signals that are antisocial mm. that you can be able to uh, talk about. Our involvement in uh, the DRC, that one is a statement which requires strategic uh, directives, and therefore not for academia. Maybe mm. at a given time, we shall be able to engage ourselves. Lastly, mm. the question on security involvement or the role of security in, 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 in COVID. Mm, mm, you know, yes. uh, as the police organization, our work is to Im implement and enforce all laws, including directives from the executive. And therefore, part of the COVID directives are part of our role to enforce them. Say, for example, the directive on curfew is purely an act of causing law and order. So, whose mandate is it? The police. How about the enforcement of uh, 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 vehicles carrying three people? Or, more or less than that? What is it? The police. Because it is all about... So, our involvement, I want to tell you, is 90% acceptable and within the means of the law. Thank you. I want to thank you for this invitation. Thank you, thank you. And I want to call upon you that uh, as security, we are all security personnel. Whether in uniform or not, we all need mm. to be very vigilant. Mm. Security starts with you. Okay, that's a very powerful one. Thank you very much, Afande. Thank you now very much. Now that I have been sent away, mm. I wish you the best of the day for mm. God and my country. No, you are not sent away yet. Please have a seat. We shall send you away. Uh, very formally by my uh, my principal and deputy principal is here as well. But thank you very much uh, indeed, ASP Anatoli Maria Terwa, for um, your honest response. I think they were honest. Uh, they were those that you could not handle. Uh, we understand. Uh, so now, uh, our final, in just uh, three minutes, so we started very late. We lost 30 minutes in this session at the start, but that's okay. We are, we are within uh, almost time. I found where are you going? Uh, orders from above, sour, sour. Um, so let's start, um, where the, oh, maybe you have the Kazinda already. So uh, the last, it's for all of you. Mr. Bujingo, you had a question uh, to respond to, but maybe I think you also did. But you also heard what the principal said in her many remarks. Uh, each one of us can respond to that, and in, in doing that, you are parting short. What should be our takeaway from your visit here? And then we end, we end it there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'll start from where the Afande stopped in answering uh, Dr. Sejito's question that sounded like it was taking me back to class. Because for us in communication, we say, break it down. And Dr. Taiwa used to say, that uh, you find a word in the English language that you can't actually understand yourself, then don't use it in a story because then it will mean you're not communicating. So, I, remember the part? I attest to that I said that, yes. <laughs> so, the part where Dr. 
Afande mentioned that there he will need a directive from somewhere to be able to talk about certain information, especially if it's to do with terror. Most media houses shy away from covering terrorism stories because they fear reprisal from the invisible hand or from government in what uh, Dr. Tewa called call from above because they skillfully, uh, this uh, legal uh, policy legislation that will actually buy you from covering a certain terrorism stories and in media houses, such stories are considered controversial because if there's most of the time any critical reporting on such a subject, then you'll, you'll hear stories of either a journalist detained or either their cameras confiscated or either there's actually a call from above that will say uh, suspend these many or employees because of this and this and this. So when you look at such stories in the newsroom, you'll find that most journalists will rather stick to conventional reporting than actually reporting stories on terrorism. And you ask yourself, how many investigative stories have you actually seen either on television or radio, even in newspapers that are to do with terrorism? At times, it's even just insecurity. So that is how difficult it is. So when you ask to what extent, I think as media, it's been to a lesser extent that you see uh, deep feature stories on either terrorism or actually investigative stories on terrorism because the legal framework in the Anti-Terrorism Act, I think that's 2002, it has those restrictions on such coverage of stories. And uh, going back to even academics, and Dr. Sechito has, has, has done a PhD and written research in this particular uh, field, you'll ask yourself if you have probably about, uh, and if it's 10 or 15 copies, of your research uh, within the Macquarie University Library, if somebody is not actually reading that research to reference on a topic they are actually doing, then it's rare that you'll even find journalists speaking of research that academicians actually do on such yes. subjects. So Dr. Sechito, try and put one million shillings in mm -hmm. 15 copies of your academic research within the Macquarie University Library, and some of us will miss out on that money. Mm -hmm. Another candidate for the show. Mm. Which is really actually very sad. But then, uh, w what's the take home from this, anyway, at the end of the day? Why uh, journalists will stick to conventional reporting? It's at times they are actually not honed also in that particular field of reporting. So as universities or maybe back at our department, what are we trying to do to hone journalists within that particular field? Because it's actually very, very sensitive. So even within our College of Humanities, when we do hold these workshops, can we involve journalists uh, in reporting on security or on, on reporting on terror, just like at times the organizations in health actually do to try and hone journalists in, in particular uh, in the beat of health reporting. I think there's a laxity. And if you look at media today, you'll ask yourself how many journalists do we have that actually cover security. Most of the time it's through conventional reporting and it's the red flag. Or for example, if there are suspects that have been arrested, that is when you will see a story. Because journalists are actually bad from going to the scenes. Or for example, if uh, the suspects were killed in action, you will never see footage that comes from a journalist. It will come from a fund, from the police, and it's what will be aired on television. So it's actually very sad. I need to do. Uh, I know we need we need to do more as media, but that is how unfortunate it is actually. And then I'll pick from what Jimmy Spire said on the digital spaces and technological advancements. Traditional media versus the, the technological advancements. I remember I started out uh, my career as a journalist. Dr. Taiba, what happened to our Campus FM 107? Pastor Wujingo storied. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually sad, because I remember the audition that got me uh, a job at NBS Television, which is almost, uh, uh, I think, closing into 
14 years ago, it was from a 107 Campus FM. My name is Precious TM. That is where it happened. But now it is the era of digital transformation. Dr. Sechito, I'll challenge you. Do you have a YouTube channel? If your research is seated uh, inside the Makere University Library, do you have a YouTube channel? Do you have a Facebook page? Are you on Instagram? Uh, mm -hmm. Or even this college in particular, how many mm -hmm. followers do you have on Twitter? Buj Bujingo, Mr. Bujingo, how many followers do you have on Facebook and Twitter combined Instagram? A hundred thousand. Me too, across all the social media platforms. That but you're the College of Humanities. You have that authority in society. How many students do we have in this uh, faculty, Dr. Taib? Oh, uh, 88,000. 80, uh, okay, 8,000. Why aren't they following this college? Either they, on Facebook or Twitter or on Instagram. There are students. Mm -hmm. Because probably you don't have what to give in terms, I'm sorry, on social mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. Because Mr. Bujingo will tell you that on mm -hmm. social media, people follow you because you have content to give out there. But then you have the content. It's in the research. So and there's so many things that you actually do. You're setting fun. And, uh, so we are going to get you to say us uh, and the <laughs> fun. And OK, but I, I think I, I make the point. Because yeah, Jimmy Spire Sentongo will say that if uh, when it comes to angling, if his editor refuses a cartoon, that he's actually drawn because they are sensing it's too political. Like at times they say in the newsroom, because the editor will say that, he will post the cartoon on his social media. Yeah. He can actually vouch, he can tell you. And then it goes viral, yet it didn't feature in the Observer, which mm. is the traditional media. Yep. So what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. that, we that you can't online. actually depend on traditional media to have those stories out and probably mm -hmm. then you can't blame us that you mm -hmm. can't see these stories mm -hmm. because ask yourself who owns media today who are the media owners dr taewa ran away from the newsroom is now uh, you know who <laughs> he is you know our the, the people that inspired us are no longer in media and actually, we could have needed those people, but they don't last a lot in media because they say we're looking for money, which is usually the biggest problem in media because oh people will say mm. we don't earn that much. When will I get rich? I have responsibilities. That is where you hear cases of bribery and corruption and politicians buying stories and organizations buying airtime. And of course, then you will see their narratives of the stories you see on television not mm -hmm. the people's stories we need to see either on television or mm -hmm. radio, which is very sad. So what's the take home? Maybe we need mm -hmm. new players mm -hmm. to own media houses. Yeah. Because even today, media is segmented. Mm -hmm. uh, if, for example, next media is 70% politics, so the 30% of the people's stories we need also might actually uh, come from the organizations that will have mm. to pay money to show those stories. So then you won't blame NBS television for being the political command center because that is its niche. Maybe the owner, that is what he wants the face of NBS television to mm. actually be. And then you will also look at NTV and all the other stations, including Channel 44, that is segmented for specifically gospel or even Bujingo's uh, media houses. Mm. So it's sad, but the digital transformation, we need to embrace it from here. We start by asking our students to follow us as the College of Humanities. Because mm. if, if we have, exactly. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> because, and mm. I can attest to that. Yeah. I remember at one point I had two followers on Twitter and then the owner of Next Media, I remember in that meeting we were having, he said that every employee we're starting with us, every employee at NBS Television needs to follow NBS Television. How do you rise to one million followers today in NBS Television? Yes, it has that age because it's a media house and people will follow it, but it has to start with your people. How do you mm. not follow the place you work for or actually the place that, this is, this is home, like you said. Mm -hmm. 
But then at the end of the day, who also manages the, the social media platforms uh, of College of Humanities, you need to put money there and get a professional person so that you give them what to actually put on those social media platforms. You give them this information, they post the information, and at the end of the day, if your social media platforms make this information viral, traditional media will pick it up. After all, even us in traditional media are already struggling to live up to the digital transformation, and that is why the disinformation and misinformation Dr. Reba was talking about happened, because of the citizen journalism. So mm. at you a citizen, mm, you're are. the ones who were posting that President Yorim Seven is dead for <laughs> traditional media to pick it up and then carry it as a story, and then, you know? Am I lying? No, you are not. I think it was probably a wish of some people. You never because that is how it starts. Okay. So I think we need to embrace uh, digital transformation. Us as media, we need to transition because so many media houses actually struggled. NBS television didn't struggle that much because we had already started it, I think, with the 20, uh, I think, 16. Uh, general election and of course the live broadcasts the interviews through zoom uh, you know uh, through skype and all but we actually need to do better for traditional media not mm -hmm. to do it a hundred percent because if they do it a hundred percent then they'll be leaving out a particular audience that actually can't afford data which is majority of uganda but at the same time they also need to embrace it partly, not to segment it, like they segment it either on radio or uh, on television, but at least to embrace it and also put information out Thank there. I think you. that's a take home and Whoa, I really appreciate a, the mm. opportunity. I'm glad to be back home. And uh, probably for, for, for Dr. Taiwa Tai even to return and, and lecture, because I lecture at the Islamic University of Uganda, why should I mm. lecture the other side when I could yeah. actually lecture mm -hmm. at home? Yeah, so absolutely. Thank you so much. I'll get you to register for a PhD and then we talk. Uh, th thank you very much, Mebo. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we are really out of time. So, Mr. Bujingo and uh, patience, um, be our saviors. <laughs> Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I want to first uh, clarify what I'd said earlier. I think I was uh, picked in the wrong way. Uh, when I talked about creatives and uh, acad uh, acad academia, all academicians. You people are highly, very organized and patient. That's why you study five years, six years, I don't know how many years to get the titles that you get. And in a way, you get a system of how you operate. You know when you wake up in the morning, you'll do this, then I'll go to this lecture, I'll teach the same thing, which never happens in our worlds. Um, Huntington, it's not the same thing. We change. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've been, I was here in three years. I know what I'm talking about. Because I know what my professors used to do, uh, which year, uh, what they taught last year was what they taught next year, the other year, and the other. And I, had, I, I know lecturers would come in classes without books. Maybe there is not and much. The, and, and they'll dictate. No, much, not in a bad way, professor. Dance styles. Yeah, and no, not in a bad way. So I just want to drive a point home. We get the point. Yeah. Yeah. So, it was, uh, it, uh, um, and, and the beauty is God has blessed me to bring my very good friend, Dr. Spire, to be here. And I'm going to use him as a very perfect example. He has a PhD in philosophy. He was in Cambridge when COVID came and everything. I read that interesting book that was full of drama. Yeah? <laughs> and how he was incarcerated, how he was told to pay for everything. It was funny. That, so the beauty with him, he, he combines two things. He really stuck and studied the, acad the academics and got there. And in his head, he's also a creative. So I want to use him, because he did his PhD, I don't know how many years he spent, five or whichever, to achieve it. But I want to compare the Dr. Sentongo and Spire, the cartoonist, and see the impact, and you see what I'm talking about. Yeah? Because the impact he has as a cartoonist is abnormally huge compared to him as Dr. Sentongo. No one knows that version of Dr. Sentongo, irrespective of, of, of how good he may be in his philosophy classes to teach and everything. But in his cartoons, there's a lot of philosophy. Every cartoon he draws, you see philosophy. No one has that power in Uganda. All even the other cartoonists don't have the brain that he has. That's the beauty. So what am I saying? Is the beauty is, is one person in two. He's a creative and he's an academician. Just imagine if we all came, the creatives, and partnered with the entire university in different fields. We would have thousands of spires 
who are doing things that are going to transform society. His cartoons transform society, but it's because it's art. And I said even art is a science. That's what we're saying. Art is not, like I, I say, art is not art like people think, that it's simple, that no. For me to, to get a joke, to make people laugh, is not easy. When people are, someone has paid you, and he has problems, he has rent, he has uh, wife issues, the kids that don't have school fees and everything, and, and, and on top of that, they are paid. And then they'll sit there, they'll squeeze their face, and they'll sit in the theater like this. <laughs> Within one second, we have disarmed them, and they're laughing, they're forgotten their problems and everything. Two hours, they go back when they're relieved. A few academicians have that. Only doctors do that, yeah? Have that power. So if we connect them, yeah? The power of the books that you have, and the power of the creativity we have, like we're saying, Spire, we can change this nation. I will still bring back another example of what had happened and why I came out to fight. L Lillian can see. Nowadays, as the, 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 the academicians of art had refused to go to, to TVs, radios would call me, TVs would call me, and say, ah, I know what happened. The full figures went. They were always there. The, the bajos went, the balams went, and, and they took over the industry. <laughs> yeah? So you would be there, Bajo is talking about musicians, about comedians. Ah, well, uh, Bajo is uh, talking to the president about art. Uh, until I said, I said, how on earth can this happen? How can Bajo start thinking for us people who studied, who are like you? We are <laughs> academicians in that field, in the, in the field of art. But we had refused, we were like you. We had pulled back, we had refused to go on social media, we had refused to attend interview, which Mabel is saying. And then the, the other guys, the bad blacks came and took over. The, the, the nation, no, not only art, they are, in they, are, they, are, they are in charge of the nation, mm. but, the, 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 but the establishment doesn't know. Bad Black will get, bad black will get her, her phone and goes on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and will change what is going to be talked about in the nation. The whole week, and it will trend. You will talk about HIV AIDS, or oh, terrorism, oh, no one is going to hear. You'll be in your traditional media, but Bad Black will be holding the nation on social media. And everyone will say, and she'll be talking bad words, big baba, and you'll say, ah, we are here. They took over the nation. So we need to realign that I'm saying. You have the books, you have the PhDs, you are professors, everything, but there's a gap. And the nation has been hijacked by people who have not gone to school, by people who are just everything, but just because we love our comfort zones, we don't want to say, hey, me, I don't want, like you're saying, we now set trends. I, now I started the Bujingo train. Now I'm they're asking me a pastor. So everyone is getting over because I've been the one on social media who's trying up. So we are saying we are there, and the beauty is we have studied here. Mm -hmm. So let us work together mm -hmm. as uh, alumni from different other fields. Uh, journalism, she's willing, she's a poet, mm -hmm. I'm a comedian, and, and even musicians, even mm -hmm. some who didn't pass through this university, are willing to mm -hmm. come and share knowledge. How in developed countries they do PhDs on Be David Beckham how he bends a ball, a PhD, on how Beckham uh, strikes a ball and does it, and, and they'll give people uh, PhDs. So now here we have Camille, people about Chameleon, how they started Baby Cool. No one wants to know how they started their story. But now the fig farm makers have come, they're making millions. People are making 20 million on social media to influence. 30, I know. Kalsime makes a lot of money. She doesn't even leave her home on social media. But we, don't, we haven't embraced her, we haven't asked her how has she done it. Because there are very many people who are actually becoming consumers on social media. YouTube is feeding them. Uh, now TikTok has taken over, is feeding people money. They're getting money, I know. People don't leave their homes and 15 million, 10 million. This uh, response is going to give them 2 million, they than 2 million, to just post for them two times. Because that's where the traffic is. The, 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 the template has changed. So I request that <coughs> we come together because we are there in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, uh, what you're teaching is totally different from what people expect from there. So you're going to teach the people that you're going to teach, but they'll come, they'll never get any job anywhere yeah, mm -hmm. in Uganda. Mm -hmm. So please, please, and the mm -hmm. beauty is mm -hmm. the professor was here and really embraced what we're saying. Yep. Let's get together, work uh, with the spires, everyone here, please. Mm -hmm. And we just move the mm -hmm. nation in the right direction, in art, in history, oh. in everything, in science, and we just change the nation. Thank you very much. Wow. I'm telling you, we, we are going to get you back here. Um, yes, patience, your parting words.
Um, I think my last word is um, on a sad note. I find it very sad. Somebody mentioned how the president of this country mentioned that the humanities are useless and were forced to defend why we exist, why we went to school, why we do what we do. I find it very sad um, to be in that position because I think it shouldn't be like that. And I, I mostly refuse to be in conversations where I have to defend it because the sad thing is our country is a very story, art, culture-based country. This whole you know, idea of, and, and sometimes we're talking about like, even like a pandemic like uh, COVID-19, people down there don't care about the facts, people don't care about what the scientists are saying, even when it's important. So for me, I think why the takeaway is becoming collaboration is important it's because the work that scientists are doing is so important. The work that um, professors are doing in their classrooms is so important. But the people actually just need a story. And I think that story comes from our cultural and artistic and humanistic points of view. And if we don't provide that story, like Huntington said, somebody's going to provide a different story and that people are going to follow it, and that's going to be what leads the nation. And I think for me that's so sad that you know um, we have so much information, but we don't communicate that information um, through the right channels, through the right people, and so we end up with this divide between what is true and what the people um, are taking home. So I think for me that take home is is actually that collaboration. And, and, and the reason I started my company was to, to make it easy for people to digest information that is important, information from universities that can save lives, but will not do that if it's not communicated. Um, and so um, I think it's easy to do, and pandemics provide a time of, of change, of shifting things. And I think COVID has been an opportunity and the digital era is an opportunity. Um, it may be a challenging opportunity, but I think we can all embrace it and see how do we learn from um, what has been done and also tell a story to these people and use the people who know best how to tell this story to the public and to, and to get it out there and get the information that you struggle so much to, to acquire, you, you struggle so much to get this information right, mm -hmm. and then it ends up not going to the right people. So I think mm. that's my takeaway. Thank you. Round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, SP Anatoly Mureterwa. Thank you very much, Mr. Huntington Bujingo. Thank you very much, Ms. Mebo Tuegumiezake. Thank you very much, Ms. Patience Netumwesaga. And uh, I really want to thank, um, <coughs> again, our principal, Professor Josephine Achire. Those were very powerful words that you, um, you made and for embracing the, the counsel that is coming from our amazing alumni. Uh, we take that to, to heart. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cindy Magara, Do Dr. Lilian Mbabazi, Dr. Zaid Sekito, the conveners and for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation this afternoon. This is not the end of this conversation. Our dear alumni, as the principal said, 100 years is on, on the way. And we look forward to hosting you once again. It's my pleasure to have um, chaired this session. It's now back to Secretariat with Dr. Lilian Mbabazi to take us to the last session. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, Dr. Taewa William. Uh, 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 can we give our panelists a big round of applause for this afternoon? Thank you so much for everything. We really appreciate all your discussions and your willingness to come here again and to allow us there to work together. And I think that is the direction in the new decade. Um, I need to correct something. I'm not a doctor yet. Probably this is a prophecy. <laughs> I will get there. I take it. Yes, I would, I would like to thank uh, our principal, 
Professor Aishiro Josephine, uh, Deputy Principal here with us, Professor Julius Chikoma. Thank you for being with us. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, something that uh, our principal said uh, when she said that uh, we definitely are going to have this again. I think we need to clap for that. It is very reassuring, and uh, from yesterday's feedback, everyone online or physical was saying we really need to have more of these. And uh, to hear this coming from our principal, even before we conclude the conversations for the two days, is uh, very encouraging. And we want to thank you specifically and the entire college administration for having that heart to bridge the gap that has really persisted uh, in the academia where we seem to be moving on our own and the industry on their own. And I think we are beginning to take the right steps in the direction of uh, working together and changing uh, the, the terrain. Uh, and right about now, allow me to allow you to cross over to the other side uh, as I hand over to Dr. Zaid Sechito to take us into the closing ceremony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lily. Uh, really. uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, uh, both our physical and the online audience. It's been a, a tough day since morning, but with the will of God, it has come to an end. And we thank you for standing with us for all this time. Um, it's not me to give the closing remarks. Therefore, my duty as of now is to call the principal in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, there is division of labor. It was the deputy principal who opened, and now it is the principal to give the closing remarks. And uh, after the big person has said it all, we shall simply have uh, the anthems and bring it to an end. But we thank you so much for being there and for making this conversation a success. Madam Principal, you're welcome. Hey. The principal. going to be very brief because we've had two exciting days. I don't want to dampen them with a long speech. Did we? Okay. Our dear alumni, the panelists that have just been on the stage, you have performed and left. Now it's our turn as principal's office. The deputy principal, uh, Professor Julius Koma, our online audience, the deans and heads of departments, our trio Please stand up for recognition, the organizers of this, the core team uh, of this Choose Conversations 2021. Dr. Cindy Magara, Lydia Mbavazi, and Dr. Zaid Sechito. 
thank you very much. You've breathed life into these conversations. And uh, as they say, we'll want more of, the, of your time. Of course, they've been helped by the admin staff that are seated over there. They could stand up also if they are around for recognition. Thank you very much. Uh, and then the organizing project team uh, that leads most of these um, activities. Uh, you could also stand up for recognition. Uh, Dr. Edgar Navutani, Dr. Levis Mogumia, uh, Dr. Pamela Kanako has left maybe. Uh, and then the principles. That is the leadership of uh, these broad activities. I was told, Mebo, you're not following Makere University on Twitter. Neither are you following Choose. So I'm going to start from there, just as you started from where you started. So we are also saying that as we mark this celebration, as we, you know, talk about making connections, let's also make actual connections uh, by following our alma mater. And I think that is also a step that will help us to even get uh, more connections. So I would like to really thank all of you for a wonderful, uh, Tayebwa called it amazing, I think it's a better word, amazing two days of choose conversation. When we were looking for uh, what to call these things, you know, naming is very important. We have the power of the word. We have the power of language. And then we had things like conference, seminar, workshop. I said, but these things are sterile. So somebody, I don't know who, came up with conversations and they said, that is it. This is not a conference. Those are the things that the Huntingtons are talking about when they hear. Yeah, those people with their conferences also. There they go again. These are conversations. We are holding conversations with ourselves, with the nation, with society, with our broader aspirations. This is what CHUS actually stands for. And I would like to really thank all the participants, all the panelists, the chairpersons, and the um, uh, people who have been on these um, conversations, our writers, we had writers' conversations. These are things that are out of the ordinary, I would say. They breathe more life into what we do. And as of now, we are saying it, cannot, it can no longer be business as usual. We actually need to do things uh, differently and also be able to energize ourselves. I liked what patience ended with. I hate being in a, a defensive mode because when you're in a defensive mode, you're not productive. All you're doing is to ensure that you survive and sort of you know, push back and maybe a few things, um, achieve a few things. I think you're spot on in that aspect. Sister, uh, Professor Deep, you talked about there's no need to defend. Let's do what we do and do it in a bold manner that shows radical presence. For me, that was a very powerful statement that resonates with what you've just said. Defense is not productive. It's not going to help us. We just need to figure out what connections we are making with societal aspirations. Because that's what true stands for. Humanities is not just to say, this is what's supposed to be and so on. It is supposed to ensure that we connect 
with uh, societal aspirations? Answer some of those profound questions uh, 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 that face society. Not just about development in the way that we talk about it, the materialistic kind of neoliberal construction of development, but a much more holistic kind of societal development that talks to issues of identity, talks of, uh, uh, to issues of language, culture, and so on. I promised that I was not going to give a long speech. And my hope is that I will live to that promise. Uh, if you had played for me Yambala Mask, I would have ended with a dance. Because I thought that that was something that we needed in this as a conclusion of the Choose 2021 conversations. I would like to say that we are committed as a leadership, uh, the principal's office and the project uh, team, that we are committed to facilitating more of these uh, conversations. And please offer all those, keep those ideas coming. I like the way um, these young people were very open about what they feel what they feel that we need to do as a collective, as actors in the humanities field. Keep those ideas coming, and we are also going to commit to make more uh, connections as we build for the future. Thank you very much. I wanted to comment on what, on what, um, what's his name? SCP and Atori Muleteru talked about. You push these things to us. What do you want us to do with them? Profound question. You push the thieves. If the person, the, the child is uh, impossible, to mtuare mpolisi, to anarabile you. What do you expect police to do? With it? I think that's a very profound statement that you need to post on um, the Department of Religion and Peace because they have a whole curriculum about um, peace and security and they also deal with uh, police as an institution. Thank you very much. Um, some slight adjustments now. We are going to first have uh, a dance on Yambala Masik. Then thereafter we shall have the anthems. Then a photo after the anthems with the principles. The dance floor is open. Landlord. Okay, I'm scared. How are you? Okay. Why don't you put on the mask? Eh? Where's your mask? I, I mean, I don't like mask. Can you put on the mask? I, I mean, I could zero when I put on the mask. I don't like that. Yes. You are joking, Opio. I'm not joking. Opio, I said, can you put on the mask? No. You don't like it. You see? No going down to put the mask. Corona Ebola ka salakeba.